started, I'd like to say a special word of thanks to the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Sarah Scaife Foundation, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, the Honorable Don Ritter, Dr. Miles Yu, the Heritage Foundation, and the Uyghur Human Rights Project for their support of this important event. Without your support, this would not be possible. In thinking about uh, the agenda and topics today for our ninth China Forum, uh, as you'll see in the program, while we pulled on similar elements from previous years, I feel the program has taken on a distinct focus on accountability. As Dr. Spaulding mentioned in her video remarks, 30 years ago, we saw glo dramatic global changes as it relates to communism, the fall of the Soviet empire and the hope of liberalization in communist China. But hope is not a policy, hope is not a strategy. And hope does not deliver the outcomes that we hope for. And unfortunately, over the 30 years, we saw a lack of accountability. The hopeful approach that economic liberalization and global integration with the Chinese Communist Party would lead to political liberalization and human rights failed. Whether doomed from the start or just because poorly executed, it has failed. And it's important and incumbent upon us to learn the lessons of its failure and understand the challenges we face today. With no accountability after the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989, with no accountability after the admission of China to the WTO, the Chinese Communist Party learned a series of valuable lessons. The policies of the United States and the larger developed West, we don't actually care or believe in them. There won't be consequences for gross human rights violations or cheating in international and breaking of international agreements. So what do we see? All of us are intimately familiar with the horrible human rights abuses and aggressive actions taken by China over the last several years. But even just today, what is the state of affairs? An ongoing genocide in Xinjiang, an ongoing and worsening democracy crackdown against activists in Hong Kong, increased militarization and pressure against Taiwan at record numbers, the further militarization of the South China Sea, and the, the CCP's rejection of the ICJ ruling about their claim, territorial claims, intimidation at a highest level and harassment of suspected extra-legal repatriation of dissidents overseas that we have never seen before, a no-limits partnership with Russia as it launched its war against Ukraine, and an ongoing and strengthening relationship and support for Iran, even as it supports terrorist attacks in Israel. Of course, this list could go on and on, but I want to get to our program. So here at China Forum, um, we will not be distracted by different forces at play or the Chinese par Communist Party's attempt to distract us from these important abuses and challenges. And we have to come together to help our country and policymakers learn how to take action to hold the CCP accountable. But before getting to uh, today's program, I want to share that actually our program began last night. Uh, last night at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation's museum, just a couple blocks from here, two blocks north of the White House, we hosted uh, a panel uh, and an impact impactful video. While today's focus is on the human rights abuses and these policies and challenges with the CCP from a more policy and academic perspective, we wanted to start with the personal and real victims who've suffered under the CCP. We hosted a film screening of China, the Uyghur tragedy that exposed the atrocities like mass internment, forced labor, and cultural erasure. And we heard from renowned advocates like Roshan Abbas and El Fadar Itabir, who gave their incredible accounts of their family's disappearance into camps. And we heard from Anastasia Lin, who described her own experiences of struggling to survive and getting out and building a new life as more than a victim. But now it's up to us to continue this urgent call to action as we get into the substance of today's session. We will hear about the, the challenges of forced labor, the latest research and evidence of how forced labor exists in our global supply chains and the actions that we need to do to, to address those. The ongoing challenges that individual countries, international organizations, and businesses have 
in addressing forced labor and other human rights abuses done by the CCP. And as I mentioned, we're going to have a more focused discussion about accountability and actual mechanisms for how we in the world that care about human rights can take action to try to hold the CCP's um, worst perpetrators of the Xinjiang atrocities accountable. So obviously this is a very full day, so let's get to work. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Adrian Zenz, who is the Director and Senior Fellow of China Studies here at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Dr. Zenz. Dear guests, dear panelists, dear live stream audience, it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the China Forum, our annual signature event at the Victims of Communism. After many years, the world is gradually becoming more aware of the nature and goals of the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. Under Xi Jinping, the party state has increased its antagonism towards human rights and heightened its assertiveness on a global stage, promoting authoritarian values. After living, lifting, surprisingly lifting its draconian COVID restrictions late last year, Beijing has failed to jumpstart China's economy, which is suffering from a systemic and endemic loss of confidence, linked both to years of short-sighted economic policies and to the Chinese population's perception that they are captive to the whims of the state. So <clears throat> what we are seeing in 2023 compared to uh, previous years our ability to research and understand China through fieldwork or open source analysis has been further curtailed. Even seemingly benign investigations into China's economic development are now potentially framed as espionage. Western auditing firms have been raided. Foreign investors are increasingly cautious. Economically, politically, socially, and culturally, China is becoming a black box more and more isolated from the rest of the world. However, we are faced with the challenge that Western policymaking must be based on the foundation of knowledge and of understanding China. This is the purpose of the China Forum. While my institution combines activism and scholarship, the focus of today's event is on the dissemination of reliable empirical research, analytical scholarship, and rigorous expert assessment. Today's panels bring together scholars and experts from diverse fields to illuminate our understanding of China in several key aspects. Four panels we have today, they touch on forced labor in the so-called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, referred to by Uyghurs as East Turkestan, where the US government has determined that a genocide is taking place on the challenges posed by our financial and economic integration, interdependence, and dependence on China, on Beijing's global foreign policy ambitions and related power projection, including its attempts to undermine the inter international rules-based order, and finally, last but not least, on strategies for increased efforts to hold the perpetrators of the atrocities among the Uyghurs accountable. Very excited about today. I'm very excited. I think we have um, a lot of powerful expertise today um, in this room, and I really look forward to the events and also to come to know some of you better. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Dr. Zenz. And next we will have a video message from the uh, House Select Committee on China, uh, Representative Mike Gallagher, the Chairman, and Representative Raja Krishnamurti, the Ranking Member. I want Americans to know that the Chinese Communist Party presents a threat not just to uh, the Indo-Pacific region or a military threat to Taiwan, but a threat to American sovereignty here at home. And I also think that human rights are at the core of this competition, protecting 
our values. And I think we've seen that in a lot of what we've done on the committee, um, starting with events uh, surrounding transnational repression, illegal Chinese Communist Party police stations on American soil, the coercion and assault of uh, students on American uh, campuses. Um, all of these things should reinforce the fact that we need to defend our sovereignty and our values. And I think that's why uh, human rights are a core part of this competition. I think that the other aspect of it is this, the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping. Yeah. It's a different animal than what we've seen even in past incarnations of the CCP, because I feel like Xi Jinping, he is a Marxist-Leninist. He, his, I guess his idol is Mao Zedong. He's not a technocrat. He is somebody who is ideologically predisposed to think in terms of, you know, imperialists, namely us, or the United States, and then the oppressed, you know, which he thinks, you know, I think the PRC is. Um, he views the world in a dichotomy, black and white, more than gray, yeah. or more than in a nuanced way. And that's that could be dangerous, because, you know, when you view the world that way, you start to categorize and you, you start to put people in pigeonholes they don't belong in. And so, you know, the Uyghurs and the Tibetans and the Hong Kongers and any dissidents um, are like bad people, are threats to the, um, to the country. Our, our way of thinking is totally different than that. We, we value diversity of thought. We value diversity of origin, ethnic origin. And we welcome different voices at the table. Uh, I, we focused on the business community recently uh, in part because I think what makes this competition so complex is that we are economically entangled uh, with China. We've spent over two decades pursuing this hypothesis, which was that by integrating China into the global economy, by providing them a session to the WTO, it would moderate their political behavior. Uh, it was a logical bet that, quite frankly, both parties made. And it happened not to work. Mm -hmm. um, they became more aggressive externally and more repressive internally. And so now we're having to try to figure out this very difficult issue of how do we reduce our dependency on China in key, key areas? How do we make sure that we're not actively fueling our own destruction by allowing the flow of American capital to China? And I think the business community, I think there, there remains a divide, in, in some ways the divide between Members of Congress and, and Wall Street is greater than the divide between Republicans and Democrats on this issue. But we can't win the competition if we have an antagonistic relationship with the business community. We need to have an honest and forthright conversation so that we arrive at a better posture, so that we aren't fueling our own destruction, so that our supply chains are more resilient and we're diversifying those so that the CCP can't weaponize uh, access to advanced pharmaceutical ingredients in order to bring us to our knees or reduce our response if we found ourselves in a competition over Taiwan. So I think that's part of the reason why we focused on the business community. Oh, yeah. I think also the business community has a lot of insights about sure. China because they've done so much business there. They, they have been also the ones that have experienced the intellectual property theft, the industrial espionage, the forced technology transfer. So they can also give us insight into... Um, how do we reverse that? Um, but also, I think the business community um, has done surprisingly a lot to reduce its uh, exposure with regard to CCP policies because they've reduced their footprint in China. They are moving some of that manufacturing back to America, which is a very good thing. And we have to talk honestly about how can we attract it here what conditions do we need to create to get more of it to come to Schaumburg, Illinois, <laughs> and other places? But the point is that um, it's the dialogue with the business community is essential for us to learn more about the competition. It makes me think too that, like when we say business community, we're not just talking about big Wall Street, right. you know, asset manager. Right? We went to uh, Stoughton, Wisconsin, to visit a company called Stoughton Trailers, which makes trailers and chassis to hear about the way in which Chinese companies cheating 
completely undermine their business. And this is just a, a manufacturing business in, right. in Wisconsin. And so business community also means, you know, much more than just Wall Street. Uh, we put out two policy reports, uh, which were bipartisan. Um, we've been able for the one on um, sort of military competition, we've been able to uh, get a lot of our recommendations into the National Defense Authorization Act. We need to ensure that that passes, but we're hoping to put out a series of recommendations on the economic and technological aspect of our competition, as well as continue to do uh, aggressive oversight and investigation. So I'm proud of that. Yeah. I agree. I echo your sentiments. And I think that this is, I'm hearing a lot from people that this is one of those few places where they see, they see real bipartisanship, but it's not groupthink either. Like we have differences of opinion, not just between the parties, but even, you know, within the parties that's reflected on the committee. And I think that's a good thing. Um, we've been, you know, able to distill kind of the common denominators that unite all the different uh, opinions and, and come up with clear messaging. Uh, and I think that's really useful. I think that the CCP is paying attention to us. Yeah. Chairman Gallagher and Ranking Member Krishnamurti very much had wished to join us in person for this China Forum and unfortunately could not. So we're very grateful to them for uh, making that video specifically for our, our China Forum. Uh, we were honored very much when the Select Committee was first formed to have been selected by them to uh, host their very first public event at our Victims of Communism Museum uh, in February of this year, a conversation with dissidents in, in, our, in our museum. And Chairman Gallagher has been very, uh, very, very kind to note publicly uh, how much VOC's uh, China work has been used and read by policymakers and is uh, influencing uh, legislation on the Hill, something we're very, very honored and humbled uh, to hear. Um, next, I'm pleased to introduce um, Matthew Pottinger as our keynote, keynote speaker. Uh, Matt Pottinger is a distinguished fellow, visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution and the China Program Chairman at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Matt Pottinger served in the White House for four years in senior roles on the National Security Council staff and previously served as the Senior Director for Asia, where he led the administration's work on the Indo-Pacific region, specifically its shift on China policy. Before the White House service, uh, Matt was a reporter on China for Reuters and the Wall Street Journal, and then he fought in Iraq and Afghanistan as a U.S. Marine, uh, during three combat deployments and later founded and led an Asia-focused risk consultancy and Asia research at an investment fund in New York. I'm pleased to say that Matt Pottinger is in fact uh, uh, able to join us uh, in person right now for keynote remarks. Matt. Abraham, thanks for the, uh, for the kind intro, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks also to my friend uh, Andrew Bremberg for the fine service that you did when we were working together in the last administration. You were our ambassador to Geneva, covering a lot of the international organizations that you saw autocracies trying to co-opt and corrupt, and, uh, and you, you did a great job defending our interests and the, the founding principles that all those organizations were founded on. So uh, it's up to all of us to fight for the soul of those organizations, and you, you did that, so thanks for that. Um, I'd like to congratulate the foundation for the essential work that you've been doing, uh, and especially to recognize the work of Dr. Adrian Zenz uh, and, uh, and your colleagues who've done so much to document and expose Beijing's crimes against humanity, against Uyghur people, and other minority groups. Adrian, uh, thanks. Looking forward to hearing more from you, and, uh, and congrats on all the great work you've been doing. Um, I've really long admired the mission of your foundation, and that mission is to educate future generations about the suffering inflicted on people by communist regimes. Your mission to never let us forget 
the atrocities of the last century is now compounded by new work, the essential task of documenting atrocities attributable to communism in this, the 21st century. Back in the 20th century, communist regimes inflicted 100 million untimely deaths worldwide. The Chinese Communist Party accounted for the majority of those deaths. I'm sorry to report that so far in the 21st century, the Chinese Communist Party appears to be on pace to meet or beat its 20th century death toll. The difference is that the mass suffering isn't just kept within China's borders anymore. It is something that the Communist Party exports. For example, The Economist last week estimated that 27 million people have died worldwide as a direct or indirect result of COVID-19. The regime that rules China is at least partly responsible for those deaths, at least. Recall that in late 2019 and early 2020, communist officials detained and muzzled doctors who raised the alarm about a mysterious outbreak of severe pneumonia in Wuhan. Authorities covered up the cases. Then they blocked the sharing of samples with other countries. They provided false assurances about how contagious the virus was. And they channeled misleading data to the World Health Organization that downplayed the virus's unusual efficiency at spreading through the air from people exhibiting no symptoms. Countries around the world had little notion of what was about to hit them. If the pandemic resulted from a lab leak in China, Beijing's culpability is even greater. The FBI and the U.S. Department of Energy believe an accidental leak is more likely than not the way that this pandemic started. The Department of Energy, by the way, supervises our national labs and is arguably the most qualified U.S. agency to make a judgment about the origins of COVID. Beijing also bears some responsibility for the hundreds of thousands of Americans and Canadians who have died in recent years from illicit fentanyl, the synthetic opioids that are exported here by Chinese state-owned enterprises or produced by Mexican cartels using Chinese precursor chemicals. Reporting by journalists at ProPublica shows that Chinese organized crime groups, which can operate only with Beijing's forbearance, are now the primary launderers of illicit drug money, drug money in North America. Then there's the unknown death toll from Beijing's crimes against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities inside China. Several democracies, including our own, have formally determined that Beijing is committing genocide. Genocide. Millions of people have been stuffed into concentration camps, sent into forced labor programs, and deprived of the ability to have children. For children already born, many have been taken from their parents and shipped off to squalid, government-run orphanages where they're indoctrinated to forget their language, their faith, and their families. These and related truths are going to be the subject of other panels at this great forum today. You've got a pretty excellent lineup of speakers who are going to give us ideas for how we should respond to the harm that Beijing is inflicting. But allow me to make one recommendation to the list of things that we should do. I think we should have a good laugh. No, really. I I, I think that we should find the inspiration to laugh. And it's not that genocide and pandemics are funny. They're not. They're not any funnier than Hamas's terrorist assault and the intense suffering that that's brought to Israelis and Palestinians. It's not a laughing matter. But totalitarian systems, whether they are socialism with Chinese characteristics or Russia's blood-soaked reenactment of czarism or Iran's pseudo-religious terrorism franchise, all of these things are, let's face it, a little bit farcical. At the very least, these regimes and the humorless men that run them are worthy of our scorn, our satire, and yes, our laughter. So let me explain. The late Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Liu Xiaobo once wrote, quote, I see political humor as an important 
and widespread form of popular resistance in post-totalitarian society. It played a similar role in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe before the great changeover that occurred there. Political satire in Chinese popular culture has shown a creativity, he said, and an authenticity that the solemn face of officialdom lacks. He continued, quote, the more serious the face of the government, the more people can only laugh. So what does this kind of political humor look like in practice in China? It's actually a pretty rich tradition. From folk rhymes and hilarious jingles, shuang kou liu, and that skewer pretentious officials, things like e gao, which is very loosely translated the sport of creatively lampooning bureaucracy and other daily indignities online. And I'll just give you a small but telling example. Today in China, typing the name of China's supreme leader on social media can be almost impossible without getting censored. As a result, there's a cat and mouse game that requires ever more ingenious nicknames for Xi Jinping. Some refer to him as Baozi, or steamed bun, uh, after he made a choreographed visit to a food stall early in his tenure. But now steamed bun is an illicit term that can subtly vaporize like the steam from buns uh, when you write that word in sentences, even if you're not referring to Xi. Lately, Xi Jinping has been referred to as that person, and, quote, a guy in Beijing, Beijing Mo Nanzi, and also as you know who, Xi. He's even called simply, if somewhat ambiguously, him, Ta. <laughs> Some netizens tried to get around the censors by submitting, uh, substituting numbers for letters, calling Xi 11, because that's what his surname would spell if it were a Roman numeral. That worked until it didn't. And then people started to use 242, 242. And that's because it represents the Mandarin language tones that accompany the Chinese characters to Xi Jinping's name. So think about that. This would sort of be like the equivalent of writing, you know, Morse code to approximate the number of syllables for Joe Biden. So even so, the Chinese censors eventually caught on and banned those numbers too. So writing numbers online in China can be quite risky since so many combinations add up to dates when atrocities were committed by the Chinese Communist Party. Just a few weeks ago, China had to expunge from the internet a very nice photograph of two Chinese athletes at the Asian Games hugging each other to celebrate a victory. The problem was that one of them had the number six on her uniform, the other had the number four, so when they stood together, it read like 6-4, June 4th, the date of the Tiananmen Massacre back in 1989. Even writing 89 can get you into choppy waters in China. So when I think of Chinese censors, I'm reminded of the Syrian officials who early on in Assad's war against his own population had to scurry around picking up hundreds of ping pong balls that protesters would roll down hilly streets in Damascus. The balls had anti-regime slogans written on them. So there's a little bit of a comic symmetry here. In an Arab dictatorship, Officials run around hiding ping pong balls, while in China, censors run around hiding Arabic numerals. Satire is a form of resistance featured during China's draconian zero COVID lockdowns, particularly last year, 2022. And that satire appeared to have contributed in some way to Xi Jinping's ultimate decision to abandon that, that policy. In Shanghai, for example, there's a young cinematographer who was driven to the limits of his sanity by the incessant bedtime recorded announcements that echoed through his apartment and through his whole neighborhood, summoning people to report for daily COVID tests. So he decided to run an experiment. He typed out the text of dozens of these official announcements, and then he ran them through Google's random generator to scramble the words into entirely new and utterly nonsensical phrases. He then recorded and broadcast this gobbledygook, purely nonsensical phrases, throughout his neighborhood on loudspeakers. 
<clears throat> his neighbors were so conditioned to tune out the inane real world announcements that they didn't notice that the filmmakers' official sounding announcements were in fact total gibberish. That video he posted uh, uh, online and it quickly garnered cheers and, and approval across uh, the Chinese web, according to a New York Times account. Chinese netizens don't have a monopoly on political satire, of course. When the dour and bloodthirsty regime in Iran boasted that its cabinet members had more PhDs than their U.S. government counterparts, Iranian citizens responded that in Iran, PhD must stand for past high school with difficulty. <laughs> I'm optimistic that there is subversive satire occurring even in despotic outer planets like North Korea, although I have to confess that I had trouble finding any, any evidence of humor while I was preparing the speech. So if we can't laugh with the North Korean people, we should at least laugh on their behalf as their proxies. Chinese netizens do sometimes step up and serve as proxies for the gag masses of North Korea. In a phrase on the Chinese internet that skewers the regimes in Pyongyang and Beijing simultaneously, Chinese netizens refer to China as Xi Chaoxian, West Korea. So Liu Xiaobo, the Nobel laureate, cautions that we should be on guard against letting satire breed uh, cynicism, but he says the risks of, quote, parody, mockery, ridicule, and insolence towards the state are, on balance, worth the costs. They're a powerful form of resistance. He said, quote, satire of what is wrong implies that something else is right. Satire tears down for the sake of rebirth. So we should laugh at totalitarian regimes, <clears throat> laugh with those who are living under those regimes, and in places that lack even an ounce of freedom, we should laugh on behalf of those who can't laugh for themselves. There are corners of the world so dark where the concrete cell floors are so thick that even humor can't sprout, but rather it goes dormant like grass in winter. The Uyghur poet Tahir Hamut Izgil described in a recent interview his journey step by step into deeper and deeper persecution and repression in Xinjiang until finally he was locked up in a Chinese labor camp. Quote, after the mass internments began, Tahir said, we felt humor was lost. It was even hard to imagine beautiful things like writing poetry. In that nearly hopeless situation, he said, we chose silence. Now, Tahir eventually got out and immigrated to the United States. And he said his ability to experience humor gradually blossomed again. Humor, he said, quote, gives reality back to us. Reality is what an oppressive government is afraid of, close quote. Liu Xiaobo knew what those darkest corners of human existence were like. He was jailed repeatedly, and for more than a dozen years in all, as punishment for his clear and beautiful writing about human dignity and the need for a Chinese system of government that protects that dignity with rights. In 2017, Liu Xiaobo became the only Nobel Peace Prize winner ever to die while a political prisoner. The first was Karl von Osiecki, who the Nazis arrested for his journalism exposing Hitler's secret military buildup. Leo wrote that, quote, some people say that political humor tore the Iron Curtain down. This may be giving it a, too, a bit too much credit, he said, but there can be no doubt that truth-telling and joke-making have worked hand-in-hand -hand to dismantle post-totalitarian dictatorships. A recent example of truth-tellers and joke-makers working hand-in-hand -hand and making a difference occurred just last year. The truth-teller was Peng Li Fa. Peng Li Fa, a brave man who dressed like a construction worker one October day and hung a banner on a Beijing overpass that called for an end to zero COVID and the beginning of political change in China. Peng, who was nominated last week by the two congressmen that you just saw on the screen for a Nobel Peace Prize, was detained on the spot and hasn't been heard from since. 
Then there were the joke tellers of a sort. By last November, people were fed up with being confined to their homes like zoo animals under that zero COVID policy. Then after a deadly fire ripped through a lockdown apartment block in the city of Urumqi, street protesters erupted in numerous, street protests erupted in numerous cities with students and other citizens chanting slogans targeting the central government. The last time that happened was probably three decades earlier in 1989. The joke was the symbol they chose for their protests. They simply held up blank sheets of paper. This was a brilliant use of satire. The protesters didn't need to say anything in order to say everything. Jimmy Lai, another brave political prisoner sitting in solitary confinement right now in Hong Kong on preposterous charges, helped to expose something that Beijing hopes few other people inside and outside of China stop to ponder. The Chinese Communist Party claims to speak for all its citizens all the time on all matters. But Jimmy pointed out that people have a God-given will of their own. He's a living embodiment of that fact. And as he used to put it, quote, just because you make all the shoes doesn't mean you own all the feet. That's satire of the most dangerous kind. As the Renaissance philosopher and Catholic Saint Thomas More once put it, the devil, the devil, that proud spirit cannot endure to be mocked. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Oh, oh, thank you, Matt. You know, Matt, I'm not sure why you think everything's so bad in China. I ask my Chinese friends uh, how it is over there, and they say, I can't complain. <laughs> Every one of them. For next year's China Forum, we might have to try a, a stand-up session. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first panel, focused on power and responsibility how Beijing's human rights record is shaping diplomacy and foreign policy. If the panelists can please come forward and sit at the table. Um, this will, panel will be moderated by Ambassador Andrew Bremberg. I apologize for mis-announcing that. This is the Dr. Zenz's panel on forced labor. <coughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think it's all right because um, Ambassador Bramberg and I wear the same color suit, so it's about similar, isn't it? You, yeah. Well, it's my great pleasure to start off this event with our first panel here. We really have an impressive lineup of panelists to look at the topic of forced labor in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. It's been four years since the discovery of systematic evidence of several large-scale systems of forced labor in Xinjiang, which were discovered in the summer of 2019. In June 2022, a historic piece of legislation has come into force, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. This act bans the import of any product made in whole or in part with inputs originating in Xinjiang. In today's panel, it's our pleasure to have key experts on the topic who will shed a light on crucial practical aspects of the implementation of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And to introduce and contextualize this issue, I will double as a moderator and the first panelist to sort of contextualize the situation in Xinjiang itself for some of the latest research findings, and then we're going to go to the other panelists in order. But let me introduce our distinguished panelists first. We have um, to my right here Brian Hoxie. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Huxi. Huxi. Sorry. No worries. Well, I can play the German card. I'm not a native English speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Huxi, the director of the Forced Labor Division within the Trade Remedy Law Enforcement Directorate at the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, Office of Trade. Brian leads a team of, conduct of 
forced labor investigators to enforce the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Prior to his current position, Brian was the director of CPP's Enforce and Protect Act investigations of anti-dumping and countervailing duty evasion and managed its e-allegation program. Before joining the Office of Trade, Brian served in several roles providing planning and risk analysis, support for CBP's trade, global engagement, and border security missions. After Brian, we're going to have John Foote. John Foote is a partner at Kelly Dry and Warren LLP. John is an expert on international trade law and policy with deep experience helping companies navigate U.S. trade rules and agreements. I think there's a lot in that sentence, but he's going to unpack that. <laughs> John advises clients on tariff mitigation strategies and advocates for fair enforcement of trade laws. He represents companies in disputes before U.S. courts and agencies, including customs enforcement actions on issues like classification, valuation, and country of origin. He's an expert on addressing forced labor through trade tools, including import bans and U.S. MCA rapid response labor mechanism. And last but not least, we're going to hear from Luisa Greve, who is Director of Global Advocacy of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Previously, Luisa was Vice President for Programs and East Asia Director at the National Endowment for Democracy. She's an experienced nonprofit advisor and an expert on human rights in China, having traveled and worked in China since 1980. Her first visit to Xinjiang or East Turkestan was in 1988. She currently also serves as a Washington Fellow for CSW, an advocacy group promoting freedom of religion and belief for peoples of all faiths. She has served on the Amnesty International USA Board of Directors, the Virginia Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, the International Advisory Committee of the Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China, and the Liberties Promise Board of Directors. She's the author of several book chapters on ethnic issues and human rights in China, and has testified before Congress on democracy in Asia. Forced labor really is one of the most important topics because if you are looking at, okay, we have identified all, these, all this evidence. We have evidence of mass internment camps. We have evidence of birth prevention. We have evidence of parent-child separation in Xinjiang or East Turkestan in the Uyghur homeland. Forced labor is really one of the areas where there's some of the largest scope for practical action to actually do something about it because we have laws that make forced labor illegal. It's illegal to have products made with forced labor being used and consumed here so that North American consumers become complicit in the genocide, in the crimes against humanity in the region. So I'm going to start with a... Um, presentation, uh, looking at some of the latest research uh, on the area. Let's see, this only has three buttons, and they all look a bit funny to me. Ah, okay, very good. So Xinjiang has two systems of forced labor, which is one of the reasons why forced labor is such a big issue in the region. The one, and perhaps better known system is directly linked to the camps of mass internment where camp detainees are then placed into a range of labor placements, a comparatively limited range from what we understand from the policy evidence. In contrast, the second system of forced labor, poverty elevation through labor transfer, affects a much wider range of products and a much wider range of persons who were not in camps. It's very important to keep these two systems separate. Um, those, for example, major supply chains such as cotton, polysilicon, etc., are not currently linked to camp-linked labor. They are exclusively linked to labor transfer, policy, poverty elevation, so-called poverty elevation through labor transfer policies, targeting so-called rural surplus laborers. Rural surplus laborers are defined as labor that can be transferred out of the agricultural sector without a reduction in agricultural production. And it's, it's really something you have in all developing, emerging countries and economies. But in China, we have an artificially enlarged pool of surplus labor because of Mao Zedong's Stalinist development policies, 
where people were confined to their location. Peasants could not uh, freely seek work in, in cities. And so there's an artificially increased pool of this labor. And of course, many of these uh, sort of voluntarily migrated, but in, Cha in Xinjiang, we have a very different situation where besides uh, regular urban rural migration, at some point, particularly in 2014, it was decided by the national government in Beijing that Uyghur underemployment is actually a national security risk, meaning Uyghurs who are just kind of idle or semi-idle, at least part of the time in the countryside through underemployment, pose a risk to Chinese national security because they're allegedly considered to be easily influenceable by extremist thought, so the government says. And so the primary motivation to get Uyghurs into full employment is more political than economic, even though economic exploitation is taking place, but it's primarily a political goal, which means it's harder to tackle with sanctions because it's not just for profit making, although that does take place. And also, the other ramification, it is harder to measure. It's more difficult to measure labor, forced labor, where the primary motivation is political rather than economic, because a lot of the indicators developed by in, uh, organizations such as the ILO, the International Labor Organization, focus on economic exploitation, and that, of course, is the, the common sort of uh, thing. <clears throat> Going to skip a little over this in terms of time, some of the developments we see. I have just recently published an updated paper on the camp-linked forced labor, uh, with some very important new evidence to see its operation, uh, how it engineered a very gradual process of release and even constitutes an innovation over previous forms of re-education through labor in China, some of which were allegedly abolished in 2013. Um, it seems quite clear that the camp to labor system ended, and in my view, the camps functioned as filtration camps from which people were then shifted, the Uyghurs were sort of uh, spied on and sorted, many of them were shifted into arbitrary imprisonment. An unknown number remains in arbitrary detention of various kinds under an unknown policy that we don't know about. And so I'm talking about the end, the closure of the so-called vocational skill centers for which we knew what the policy was. Uh, so we now have ongoing arbitrary detention under un unknown policies that are not published we also know that many Uyghurs were shifted into forced labor where they remain victims of forced labor. The ramification of that is that the forced labor system that is now active and alive in Xinjiang is the labor transfer system. That's the one to really focus on. Not to minimize camp linked forced labor, which continues to have victims, but also labor transfers are the much larger system of forced labor. A conservative estimate of those shifted from camps to forced labor would be at least half a million, could well be more, but we also need to take into account that a very large and unknown number were shifted to prisons. So that should be considered a conservative estimate. Poverty elevation through labor transfer affects undetained agriculturalists and those at risk of forced labor could be up to, two, up to two million or potentially more because most recently under uh, the new party secretary, Marching Ray, we see an intensification of the system of forced labor. Generally, China signed up to the ILO agreements this year, ratified two ILO forced labor agreements, and I think one of the reasons they're doing that is because they have desecuritized a lot of the camps, at least the ones that are more visible, they have probably started to desecuritize some of the camp-linked workplaces, many of which were in industrial parks, because everything kind of has now gotten into a certain routine. And they are normalizing and institutionalizing the coercive forced labor system of labor transfers, meaning that forced labor in Xinjiang has become less visible. And this has all kinds of ramifications, should, for example, the ILO who interestingly sent a team to China this year, and they also went to Xinjiang, to uh, the ILO uh, from Geneva, visited Xinjiang on, a, on sort of an informal visit. 
And one of the problems that we are seeing is that state-imposed forced labor is not necessarily that visible. Because if you look here, state-imposed forced labor creates a, an overall coercive environment where from the grassroots, uh, you have a strong grassroots system of many, many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of officials, government employees, who mobilize people, who go from door to door, knocking on doors, who mobilize people into forced labor. So you have coercive recruitment, which is not that easy to observe. The workplace itself, you have the training and transfer, and then the worker management and retention. So you have a police state system where people cannot just leave their job. And the inability to leave work has intensified significantly with the most recent policies. So now the emphasis is not so much on recruitment, because weakers have been recruited, but it's more on retaining them and having like a monitoring system where weakers and others cannot just leave the jobs that they have been assigned. And the offshoot of all that is that the workplace itself may not actually be particularly secure doesn't have to be particularly securitized. So we just don't need to work in a workplace where you have a police guard standing next to them, uh, where you have, of course, you have the usual security measures. But this means for China it's become easier. They've had the time now to institutionalize the system, to normalize it, and to make it look very innocuous, meaning international observers can now come and visit factories and not necessarily see anything particular, which kind of makes this all the more devious. So the main risk indicator in terms of assessing it is the presence of the coercive policy and the presence of the state apparatus to enforce this policy. These are unfortunately indicators that the ILO measurement entirely ignores. And this is something I've been looking at and study uh, looking at how the ILO has been developing uh, indicators for measuring forced labor. And one of the problems is that they have not really focused on state-imposed forced labor because they've not seen it as a major issue. And admittedly, modern slavery and private sector forced labor has been sort of the main challenge, has been on the rise. And therefore, that's been the, the focus of the ILO. But it means because Private forced labor and companies and state-imposed forced labor, which operates in a whole society, are very, very different to try to measure, to evaluate, and so on. That has huge ramifications. So, in closing, the only tool that can address the forced labor situation is to, is to reverse the burden of proof uh, of forced labor, which is the rebuttable presumption uh, enshrined, for example, in the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which is such an important tool. And I think it's important to understand that the UFLPA will necessarily result in some degree of over-enforcement. Because if you place a rebuttable presumption of forced labor for an entire region, you are going to catch shipments that are not made with forced labor. However, because of the nature state-imposed forced labor works, if you don't reverse the rebuttable presumption, you end up with severe under-enforcement. If you try to chase up supply chain after supply chain, shipment after shipment, and you can't have a rebuttable presumption uh, that it's, it may be tainted with forced labor, the alternative to some over-enforcement is severe under-enforcement. Questions of enforcement, questions of business changing business behavior will now be addressed by our panelists, by our distinguished, I should add, panelists, we're very privileged to first hear from Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Let's see if I can. Can you hear me okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sens, for that and inviting me here to speak today uh, on U.S. Customs and Border Protection's enforcement of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Uh, as, as mentioned, I was Brian, I'm, my name is Brian Hoxie. I'm the director of the Enforced Labor Division within the Office of Trade at uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, or CBP. And there we lead uh, a team of investigators that uh, evaluate investigations uh, based on petitions that are, we receive worldwide and issue what we call withhold release orders or findings, and that is one area that we enforce. The other area that we're here to talk about today <clears throat> 
is that we manage the overall enforcement of the UFLPA for the agency. Uh, as you know, to help address this horrible situation in Xinjiang, the U.S. government passed the UFL, UFLPA to establish a rebuttable presumption, as we just discussed, that goods made wholly or in part in the Xinjiang region of China are made with forced labor and then prohibited from entry into U.S. commerce unless the importer can show that with clear and convincing evidence they were not produced with forced labor in that region or they do not contain materials uh, from the region. Additionally, the UFLPA gave us uh, additional authorities to the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, which was established in the USMCA um, bill. And it is the FLEDF, or the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, I'll try to stay away from the acronyms, um, is chaired by the Department of Homeland Security and includes six other departments and agencies in order to manage forced labor for the U.S. government. One of those things that they do is, is um, establish an entity list of entities that are involved in producing or exporting within the Xinjiang region, uh, participating in poverty alleviation programs, and uh, or otherwise engage in labor transfer programs. They can add entities to this list, and um, we uh, then are, our authorities um, require us to prohibit those goods from entry. CBP is a part of the FLEDF uh, in an in advisory capacity, but we continue to support our DHS partners and other government partners in this role. So how do we enforce UFLPA at CBP? When the law was signed we, uh, in the beginning of roughly two years ago, we established a task force quickly to stand up this capabilities and implement the law. Uh, we implemented in June 21 of 2022 and so that's roughly 15 months ago, uh, to put that into a little bit of context. The quick implementation of this bill did not result in any slowdowns or port uh, disruptions from overall implementation. And I, we view this as a significant success in, and illustrates that we can implement a strong enforcement uh, law such as the UFLPA without overall affecting trade. <clears throat> so we approach the enforcement of the UFLPA in two ways. First, when the goods are exported directly from Xinjiang or uh, from the entity on the entity list, we will apply the rebuttable presumption immediately and prevent those goods from entry. Importers then must request an exception to that ruling uh, for a shipment to prove with clear and convincing evidence that those goods are not made with forced labor before it is released into U.S. commerce. If we were to grant an exception, we would also have to notify Congress and that would be a publicly available uh, notification. To date, we have only received three exception requests. All three have been withdrawn, and the goods were re-exported outside of U.S. jurisdiction. <clears throat> Second, for goods that are not directly from Xinjiang, CBP evaluates the risk that a producer uses good, um, materials, either raw materials or parts, that in part part of the clause, uh, in the final product, and we will stop any shipments that we deem uh, with a significant risk of containing materials made with forced labor from Xinjiang. In this case, importers can either request to re-export their goods, which sometimes they do, uh, or they can request an evaluation of the applicability of the UFLPA to that particular shipment. They provide supply chain tracing documentation, and we require very rigorous supply chain tracing um, review to show that every single part of that supply chain from the tier, we call these tiers, tier one all the way down to the lowest tier, are free from inputs from Xinjiang. So for example, if you are importing um, cotton shirts, then we want to see the information of the source of that cotton all the way down to where it was farmed. If the importer cannot show evidence or uh, they do not have enough information, we will deny that from entry. The UFLPA is a major shift for the importers. It requires them to know their entire supply chains from the end product all the way to the raw materials like I mentioned. Through our enforcement, <clears throat> Uh, from June 21st of last year all the way to September 31st, we stopped over 5,000 shipments of goods valued over 1.9 billion because of risk of forced labor and conducted enforcement reviews. Of those, 4,600 uh, shipments made final entry decision, and of those, 53% were denied entry. Due to our enforcement, we are seeing some successes and some some areas of, that I want to say on a couple main trends. First, importers are increasingly improving their due diligence efforts. 
they're auditing their supply chains, and they're providing better information that shows that their goods are not made with forced labor through our reviews. We see this directly through the information that they give us, as well as our engagements that we continually have with, with the importing community. Secondly, we are seeing shifts generally from uh, away, their supply chains away from China region and uh, more broadly where the risk of the supply chains is too high. Finding information from China is getting more and more difficult on uh, internal uh, production and uh, we're finding that businesses are no longer finding this as an acceptable risk that they will, that they will um, use imports from, from that region. We do still have a lot of enforcement challenges. This is 15 months going on, so we are continually learning as we go. Uh, one of the areas that is, that is forefront for CBP is that we have a, uh, our trade mission requires that we balance between facilitating compliant importers and, full, and fully enforcing the laws against non-compliant trade. So finding the most effective way to uh, enforce the UFLPA without over-enforcement as well as not under-enforcing the law uh, and doing the right, and doing what we can is to ensure that importers that are trying to do the right thing to comply and make sure that their goods are not tainted with forced labor um, are able to continue to trade with the United States. And we continue to work on how to improve that every single day. Secondly, the supply chains are incredibly complex, as many of you know, and businesses typically do not have one particular supply chain. In addition to reviewing documentation for multiple uh, supply chains, Companies are now bifurcating their supply chains into areas where uh, they have, that are completely free of forced labor, but then they may have additional risk uh, involved with their activities, and we continually look at those companies and review those packages. Finally, the amount of data that we are sifting through is, is immense, and um, we're making sure that we have to enforce across all 97 chapters of the tariff schedule, so that includes every good that could be imported in the United States. Finding tools and capabilities that help us with that has been a, a challenge for us, but we have several projects underway and some, some areas that we are using uh, this new technology in order to address this issue. <clears throat> so where are we heading in the next year? We're continuing to increase our enforcement capabilities by assessing lessons learned in the first year of implementation, and we're expanding our capabilities and are utilizing the resources that we have received from Congress uh, every possible way that we can, and we're continuing that work every fis in this coming fiscal year. Regarding the challenges that I mentioned on data, uh, we're increasingly using analytic um, modeling and technology that will help us um, sift through and manage and segment the risk in an enormous amount of trade that we have to go through. We're also providing more streamlined flows of information uh, through our import improved forced labor case management and many of you may see uh, in the coming months a improvement to our portal for submitting allegations and as well as submitting information to CBP and communicating with us through a single source, uh, a portal that we can then use to communicate on all things forced labor. Our engagement with stakeholders in the first year of our forced labor enforcement was around, I think we had around 500 engagements, which is obviously more than one a day if you do the math on, on average probably. We think that those engagements are absolutely pivotal to incre increasing our enforcement and finding the most effective way to enforce uh, this law. So we, continue, we will continue looking at those engagements as we go forward and continue to be and thankful for being invited to engagements such as this one to share and learn from all of you uh, on how we can improve. And finally, we're going to continue to work with like-minded and partners, uh, enforcement partners within the U.S. government interagency but also internationally uh, where we can. We conduct outreach, provide technical uh, assistance where needed, and uh, assist governments as they explore their own forced labor enforcement uh, policies and laws. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that it is and continues to be a priority uh, to enforce the UFLPA and forced labor writ large for CBP. We're not only determined to prevent goods from being entered in the United States, but we want to make sure that they don't have uh, any market uh, opportunity within the United States. We realize we can't do this alone. We have to um, continue to work with like-minded enforcement partners, continue to work with the global community, the civil society, and all the stakeholders that um, are far too many to mention. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to all of you and all of the work that you've done, Dr. Sens, as well as others in the reports, the findings, the studies, the engagements, everything that you do is important to us. 
Um, sometimes I, I wonder if everybody reads every report in D.C. that's created on every issue. There are a lot of them, but I will tell you, um, honestly, we read them. I read them. My team reads them. We all read your reports because we are looking for every single bit of opportunity in order to, to effectively enforce this law more, more strongly. And so please keep doing what you're doing. Please continue to invite us in these engagements and continue to engage with us and uh, help us enforce this law. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian, for your availability, for your humility, and for sharing with us about this very important work. We're, we're very grateful for the hard work that um, CBP is doing here. Next, we will hear from John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zenz and uh, Ambassador Bremberg um, for extending the invitation. I love this dialogue. I really enjoy uh, this event. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Um, I'm going to offer you a different perspective. I agree with probably 95 percent of everything that Brian shared, uh, but I'll share a slightly different perspective. Um, as mentioned, I'm a partner in the international trade practice at Kelly Dry and Warren. Uh, my practice consists of advising corporations on how to ensure that they remain compliant with U.S. trade laws, particularly those governing the importation of goods. And sometimes folks have described my practice as being like in the weeds of international trade, and that used to bother me until I learned to embrace it because it's true. In my line of work, I spend all day every day curating my expertise from within the rules-based international system. And it's from this unique vantage that I'd like to describe for you the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Even if you think you understand what this law is or how it operates, I'd ask you to suspend your preconceived notions and just hear it from me anew. A few weeks ago in a newsletter that I published on forced labor trade enforcement, um, I described the UFLPA enforcement as unfolding, uh, a, quote, according to an extra legal process governed neither by statute nor regulation and so far without the benefit of input from the judiciary. Now this provoked some um, measured disagreement, some strong disagreement even, from folks who believe that the UFLPA is a good and important law, who felt maybe it sent a wrong or at least unfair message. And while I agree that the UFLPA is good and important. I want to be clear, that was not an expression of opinion. It was a statement of fact. The UFLPA is being enforced according to a process that is not contemplated in the text of the law itself. And while I believe, I firmly believe, that Customs is doing its level best to enforce the law vigorously and fairly, my audacious claim holds water. Before I unpack that, I'll just highlight two critical features of the UFLPA that I agree are good and important. I'll explain how the rebuttable presumption works, how CBP picks targets, and what happens after CBP detains merchandise. This is the process that I described as extra legal because it is not described in any law, including the UFLPA. And I'll conclude with a couple of thoughts on why this matters and should concern an audience of policymakers or even lawmakers especially those in favor of, quote, vigorous enforcement. When Congress enacted the UFLPA, it answered a question that only it could answer. Namely, so that as so far as the U.S. is concerned, the labor component of China's state-sponsored programs targeting, forced, targeting Uyghurs constitutes forced labor. The question might have proven difficult for customs to resolve on its own simply in the course of enforcing the forced labor import ban. If one major world power wants to spin the compelled labor dimensions of an ethnic elimination campaign with euphemisms like labor transfer and poverty alleviation, it is incumbent for other world powers, and especially those with commercial ties to such practices, to clarify what is actually happening. Ergo, the determination Congress of Congress that such, that such conduct constitutes forced labor for purposes of U.S. law was essential. And second, as a result of the state-sponsored nature of this forced labor, the pervasive quality of the ethnic elimination campaign throughout Xinjiang, it was necessary to define the scope of the law's coverage to include all of the affected geography, i.e. all of Xinjiang. And due to the labor transfer program, which moves forced Uyghur labor throughout the country, the adoption of the UFLPA entity list uh, was an, also an additional important achievement of the law. Now, there may be some commercial enterprises within Xinjiang that might not be active participants in forced Uyghur labor, but the Chinese Communist Party's commitment not only to perpetuate abuses, but to lie about it, 
cover it up, fiend shutting it down, and then declare the overall approach totally correct, all while running a surveillance state that makes free movement by outside actors and independent assessment of facts on the ground impossible, rendered the region-wide approach of the UFLPA a necessity. It's common for proponents of the UFLPA to talk about the law's important role in shifting the burden of proof to companies to prove their shipments aren't tainted with forced labor. Technically, that is a true statement, but it elides a distinction that is critical to understanding how the law works. The rebuttable presumption established by the UFLPA is a presumption about the condition of labor used to produce certain goods, namely those made wholly or in part in Xinjiang or by a listed entity. These are presumed to have been made with forced labor and so are inadmissible under the U.S. forced labor import ban. But there's a conceptually prior question. Which goods are made wholly or in part in Xinjiang or by a UFLPA listed entity? On this question, the UFLPA is silent. In some, answer, in some instances, the answer might seem fairly obvious. For example, goods might be shipped to the U.S. directly from Xinjiang, or CBP might open a container at the port and discover boxes of red dates, helpfully labeled Bing Tuan Red Dates, the transliterated name for the XPCC. But even in these instances, where it's relatively straightforward to spot the Xinjiang goods, CBP found it necessary to make modifications to its data collection from importers in order not to miss the low-hanging fruit. But more often than not, in fact, in almost all cases, Xinjiang content isn't being shipped directly to the United States. And if you open a container at the port, goods made with Xinjiang content look exactly the same as goods made with admissible content. Now, this presents a quandary for CBP because the UFLPA and the forced labor import ban on which it is built are enforced against specific imported goods. For better or for worse, this is the power and liability of forced labor trade laws as enforced in the United States. It is therefore incumbent on someone to identify goods that are made with Xinjiang content, goods to which the UFLPA applies. Now at present, the law doesn't even provide an importer uh, the opportunity to make a voluntary representation about the UFLPA compliance of its imported merchandise if it wished to do so. Therefore, CBP alone has to make the call. And because CBP does not know a priori which goods have been mined, produced, or manufactured in Xinjiang, wholly or in part, it has to make the best guess possible. Now, to say that CBP has to guess which imports to detain is not to say that CBP doesn't make an educated guess. It most certainly does. Customs has access to some information related to import activity, and where it lacks data, for example, on the depths of the global supply chain beyond the foreign producer, it has purchased additional data from external software providers and is stitching such information into enforcement algorithms. But data alone, even purchased data, only gets customs so far. As I wrote a few weeks ago, informal inferential reasoning is the only true precondition to enforcement. It all starts here. Customs has to infer which goods from which final manufacturers are most likely to contain Xinjiang content. And that is why academic research outfits, NGOs and the like, have taken on such outsized importance in the UFLPA universe. They serve up juicy, well-documented enforcement targets for breakfast. Now, when CBP picks targets that might contain Xinjiang content, importers respond by trying to disprove that geographic assertion they're not rebutting the forced labor presumption of the UFLPA, mind you. They're just trying to prove their goods aren't subject to the UFLPA in the first place. This process describes approximately 99.97% of all UFLPA enforcement to date. And according to CBP's own stats, importers have been successful in proving that they were, in fact, importing compliant merchandise somewhere between 55 and 70% of the time. In other words, almost all UFLPA detentions are being handled under the process not provided for by the statute. And a generous majority of all goods stopped by CBP have proven to be the wrong goods. Now, I'm going to circle back to my audacious claim in just a minute, but before I do, 
Let me just briefly describe what happens after CBP picks out what it believes to be a good target based on available data and informal inferential reasoning. Just a quick tour of the weeds, if you will. When CBP decides to bring the enforcement storm against a particular target, it does so with great intensity. Customs will stop every shipment of goods from a given target. And depending on the commodity or type of product Customs is targeting, cotton, polysilicon, PVC, renewable batteries, it will demand the production of traceability documentation. Traceability documentation is delivered to Customs by the importer but it's usually collected by the finished goods supplier, who in turn collects it from other parties throughout the supply chain. There might be three parties in a polysilicon supply chain, or there might be 30 parties in a cotton supply chain. All of them have to play ball. The documentation for traceability packages, as Brian noted, is extensive, and by, C by CBP's own recognition, defies somewhat easy class categorization. Customs will list exemplars but cannot define the full extent of a perfect traceability package. You'll need purchase orders, invoices, proofs of payment, but also shipment records, inventory records, production records that connect the not dots at each node in the supply chain. Everything has to tick and tie back together. It needs to be summarized, translated, indexed. And technologically enhanced traceability, if it exists, is always subordinate to the paper. In customs view, actual transaction documents are king. A traceability package might consist of dozens of individual documents and be between 600 or 1,000 pages long. And the question presented to, to CBP is deceptively simple. Does this traceability package depict an actual supply chain or does it not? This is one of the most difficult factual and conceptual questions I've encountered in any corner of international trade law. An importer might have to produce a traceability package for every type of product contained within a single entry. There might be 12 products in an entry or 50, and Customs might detain 50 entries from a single supplier, and in some instances has detained hundreds. No published standards indicate when Customs will move the storm on from one finished goods supplier to a subsequent target. And the further you get away from the high priority sectors in the law, the more untethered the traceability demands have become. Customs started targeting imports that contain PVC after an NGO report documented PVC production in Xinjiang. But Customs traceability demand included not just PVC, but every raw material in the finished merchandise, including many with no alleged link to Xinjiang whatsoever. And remember, all this is to decide whether or not the goods are subject to the law. CBP's traceability demand for renewable batteries contemplates traceability packages for 17 different components, many of which are not currently subject to an allegation of Xinjiang Nexus, and for 13 different machines used in the production process, among other demands. I believe the characterization of an extra-legal process governed neither by statute nor regulation without the benefit of guidance from the judiciary is charitable. From the selection of a detention target to the scope of a traceability demand to the rejection of an entry for lack of some obscure piece of paperwork from a company in India to the ultimate evaluation of a traceability package to the decision of when to move on to another detention target, none of these decisions are governed by law or any other individual statute or regulation in the customs law canon. The point is not that customs is getting everything wrong or even that it is abusing its discretion. It's just that the entire UFLPA apparatus, top to bottom, is agency discretion. And if you're not familiar with the weeds of international trade law, then you'll have to take my word for it. This is deeply weird. The great irony to all of this is that, in my experience, CBP is, to a person, filled with civil servants who are charged with enforcing this law. All of them, as far as I can do, tell, are doing their level best to be efficient and tenacious to the facts and to render consistent decisions as they work their way from one traceability package to another. It's good and important work if ever there was some. It just lacks the benefit of a governing law. I know that this audience is among the most optimistic in America regarding the goodness and importance of the UFLPA. And I address you all as one who shares your conviction that preventing the importation and sale of goods made by forced Uyghur labor is not just one of the most important objectives of US trade law, but it is actually doable. And yet I feel constrained to try and explain why interested observers in the policy space should care about these weeds. 
It's deeply unsatisfying to be told as a trade lawyer that this is the point, that the goal of this law is simply to decouple the U.S. and China economies come what may. If elected officials believe that is the right course of action, there are tools well suited to achieving it. The forced labor import ban isn't one of them. This law requires us to indulge a particular conceit, that it is possible to distinguish between goods tainted with forced labor and goods not so tainted, the former being inadmissible and the latter eligible to trade freely. So three quick thoughts on why this should matter. The rule of law should mean something to an American audience, perhaps most of all in this arena where the marquee U.S. human rights law is on display. There are jurisdictions that deliberately pass opaque laws for the purpose of using such laws as a political joystick, subject to the whims of the ruling, usually single party. The U.S. should relish its difference in this regard. And two, if appeals to American exceptionalism and or continuing to perfect the legacy of the U.S. role in constructing the international rules-based order leave you unmoved, there's also this. Enforcement is breathtakingly inefficient. It is possible to burn hundreds of millions of doll taxpayer dollars chasing unending document production demands on a tiny set of imports from an even smaller set of foreign producers. But that is not the only way to UFLPA. I wrote an essay a few months back called A Better Way to UFLPA, containing some thoughts on how to be a bit more strategic in enforcement. But my final appeal is this. The forced labor import ban is the ultimate condition on market access, but it has yet to be wielded with any intentionality. A certain type of company ought to loom larger in the policymaker imagination. The company that has zero ambition to import goods with any supply chain link to forced Uyghur labor, and that is prepared to invest substantially in mapping and documenting its compliance supply chain to prove as much. Such companies, many of them my clients, only want to manage their tr trade in a compliant posture, and yet find it impossible to do so against this enforcement landscape. The power to define the condition of market access and ensure that goods made with forced legal labor actually do not enter the U.S. market remains firmly in the grasp of the U.S. government, and it should be wielded wisely. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's always uh, very interesting to hear your perspective as one of the practitioners, uh, somebody who deeply believes in the value of the Weaker Forced Labor Prevention Act and in countering state-imposed forced labor in Xinjiang, while at the same time um, facing some of the practical challenges that this very unique and unprecedented sort of step entails. And I'm sure we'll have some time during Q&A to go further into this, but we're also first very much looking forward to hear from Luisa, about some of the uh, advocacy side of trying to change company behavior, spreading awareness worldwide. Luisa, please enlighten us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. My organization, uh, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, is a, founded by Uyghurs nearly 20 years ago and led by Uyghurs. So my job uh, and our mission is to ensure that Uyghur human rights uh, are documented and that there is a proper policy response to violations. And indeed, uh, what is the proper policy response to genocide and crimes against humanity? I'm quoting U.S. Uh, government determination of the level of international crimes. And certainly, as has been said, the fact that this country has a ban on forced labor inputs enables a very practical measure in addition to other sanctions and international mobilization. Uh, under the Genocide Convention, so it was focusing specifically on forced labor. Um, as a counterpoint to uh, what John has brought forward, um, I would say that a very efficient and simple way to enforce um, any uh, enforce a prohibition on U.S. commercial and consumer complicity uh, or profits from forced labor in violation of U.S. law since 1930. Um, could be something like a trade embargo, which was what was in place when Stalin uh, had the gulags uh, and when the Nazis uh, put people into forced labor. That is not the case now, and so how do we reconcile uh, some forms of trade with a regime that's committing a genocide and is um, targeting an entire ethnic group using forced labor as a major tool? So questions uh, I'd like to go into. Who is mobilizing, to answer Adrian's question? Um, clearly researchers, um, clearly uh, alliances of uh, people speaking for 
worker rights, trade unions and worker NGOs, uh, as well as governments, and then the question of mobilization in intergovernmental cooperation. So uh, certainly reports I, I've counted. We have um, the Coalition to End Forced Labor in the Uyghur region has a list of reports, uh, which is in, not fully complete. It has 25 NGO reports since the summer of 2019. Um, the very first one actually was in the summer of 2019, so more than four years ago, as Adrian said, uh, which UHRP helped launch um, first report on cotton in international supply chains by in Initiatives for China, a, a Chinese dissident group, and that was launched here with a, a Uyghur speaker um, mentioned already this morning uh, to hear Homut testified to his experience of forced labor in the cotton fields. Uh, so the researchers are providing um, information on supply chains, on the conditions, and of course Adrian's research uh, focusing on what can be found about what the policies are and how they're being implemented, and as you've said today, implementation without clear policy. The NGO mobilization um, brings together for the very first time uh, global experts on forced labor, human trafficking, and anti-slavery with Uyghur voices. And I will say that today in today's audience, and I'm sure watching, are many Uyghurs whose relatives are missing or they even have knowledge that they're in forced labor. And their question is, who will help with us? And I can say that absolutely the worker rights movements, uh, the trade unions, and the anti-slavery movement are standing in solidarity and providing expertise that uh, is necessary to navigate policy responses. At the governmental level, um, the U.S. has gone first and is so far the only jurisdiction to take decisive action. Um, even before there was a UFLPA, five cabinet-level departments jointly issued the Xinjiang Supply Chain Advisory. Um, and I would say let's pair that with uh, what all large corporations and many small ones declare. We have no tolerance for forced labor. Every American company uh, operating in California has to have a public statement of their compliance with the California anti-modern slavery, anti-human trafficking law. There is a declaration of no tolerance. And so the question is, yes, where is the burden of proof? If you have no tolerance, shouldn't you be able to prove to CBP that you're complying? That certainly uh, became implementable, uh, both with uh, um, legislative action um, to remove uh, the exception for lack, you know, consumptive demand, which made our own forced labor import law almost never brought to bear um, for the first, let's say, um, 60 or 70 years of its existence, and now with this new law, uh, which came into effect 15 months ago. Um, I will say, you know, some, some interesting things here that people may not be aware that are really truly new um, in being able to advocate for Uyghurs. CBP had a two-day expo on technical and uh, research-based tools to know your supply chain, to understand raw material sources, to, to trace your supply chain, um, but you know, both technical and uh, in terms of data. And I, I can't remember the exact number, but for the first time you have private sector providers coming forward, joining their voices with the advocates who say, if you have no tolerance, why don't you know your supply chain? How can you be, implement your lack of tolerance if you don't know who's supplying your lower tier products? And um, that was a, really a turning point, I would say, where you have, by participating in the CBP Expo, two-day expo in March, you have the, the private sector very clearly saying, in a group, not just on their own uh, business development materials, their own websites, you can trace your supply chain with their help. Um, I'll go on to say, um, where have we seen industry responses uh, changing? I will tell you also a story about when the coalition to form, to, to end forced labor in the Uyghur, Uyghur region began mobilizing. It was after this summer of 2019, Adrian's research, other research coming out and being briefed 
to NGOs, to the National Security Council, to the State Department. Um, the Cotton Campaign, which had worked for nine years to get a voluntary uh, business-wide agreement not to source Uzbek cotton because of the degree of state-imposed forced labor for the, cotton, for the cotton harvest there, helped us uh, form this coalition. And some of the people in our coalition who were already in touch with the ESG officers, the sustainability officials in some of the most largest corporations in the textile and clothing space, um, we learned that as of about January and February 2020, Right, so a few months after this research comes out, the very first hearing, which was held by Congressional Executive Commission on China, where Adrian uh, testified, as did UHRP, um, top of mind supply chain risk issue that the textile importers felt was coming down the pike. So C-suite level risk alert was Xinjiang cotton. And then the pandemic closed down trade. And so it was a tremendous scramble uh, to look at supply chains elsewhere. So we, a global crisis overtook a different global crisis, which was the crisis of genocidal targeting of Oidras. Um, and so then it dropped off. So it was a, a burden on the advocates for Uyghurs and against modern slavery to, again, bring it to the attention uh, of the companies. In the meantime, um, the chairs and Chair and co-chair uh, of CECC, um, there was a bipartisan introduction of the, of the UFLPA, uh, a version that was later um, modified in bicameral bipartisan negotiation, but that was March 2020, and then the coalition formally launched its call to action in July 2020, which was, we as a coalition of groups, we have uh, 180 endorsements from NGOs around the world, um, we must stop sourcing from Xinjiang because of the high prevalence of forced labor there. And unless you know your supply chain, you will not be able to comply with the law or comply with your commitments to have no tolerance, and you should completely cut out Xinjiang sourcing from your supply chains as a moral matter. Um, let me say this about, I'll just say something about where does UFLPA stand in the response to the crisis of, of forced labor, and then f tick off a few remaining undone issues, uh, unaddressed issues. Really, the UFLPA is too little and too late. That's what happens in a democratic society. It takes time to um, enact a law. Uh, I, you know, Elfadar Iltabil here with the Uyghur American Association, some of the survivors of the torture camps, they themselves were not in forced labor, but that prelude to the vocational training centers, stood in the cold in December 2021 with a big banner, and Uyghur forced labor passed the UFLPA. We need some kind of response other than a policy determination and a few WROs. That took, it was very disappointing actually for Uyghurs who felt such a crisis American commitment to democracy, other jurisdictions not making, taking any action between March 2020 and December 2021. However, once it passed, um, it's still uh, difficult to enforce. It takes time, it takes resources. The CBP had to stand up expertise. All the seven agencies in the forced labor, forced labor enforcement task force had to get up to speed and frankly are still not fully staffed. They don't all have fluent Chinese speakers. They don't have uh, enough staff by their own uh, presentation to truly do a good job of processing what they're asking of companies and to understand the priority sectors fully. So I would say on the agenda yet are how can we deal with de minimis imports under 800? This is a much higher threshold than in any other jurisdiction in the world. Um, many, many clothing products, of course, come in through the brand name um, direct to consumer shipments that you all know from Xi'an and Timu. Um, honestly, for Uyghurs to see Timu have a television ad during um, during the Super Bowl, it was really quite shocking um, to see, uh, you know, an appeal to a broad 
global audience without any recognition that so much cotton, right, it's still 20% of the global supply of cotton is grown in Xinjiang. Um, and to say all of these things should be coming into the U.S. without the CBP's ability to truly police the contents of these small shipments uh, coming in directly to consumers. Be happy to talk more about that. Um, we have not yet seen any penalties for importers um, who may have knowingly and willfully violated Section 307. It may be that none are doing that, but we would like to see a clear statement um, by CBP or DHS about the authorities that allow them to do that and what would constitute uh, cause for a penalty. Uh, our organization, the coalition, uh, strongly endorsed what Chairman Gallagher said about the need to ensure it's not just about imports. It's also about profits through investment and, frankly, asking investors who are perfectly happy to provide working capital to some of the companies that are engaged in supporting the forced uh, state-imposed forced labor, profiting from it, or supplying, for example, the surveillance technology that allows this overall pro atmosphere of and environment of coercion that Adrian has pointed out. And um, there are some investment bans, and the U.S. deserves credit. President Biden um, imposed investment bans starting more than a year ago. No other country has done that, but there needs to be more. And then finally, um, this question of re-exporting that Brian mentioned is truly troublesome because it means that um, any other market could be a dumping ground for products that are truly do not belong in international trade. And then finally, um, making sure that I want to give you, and I will end now with a little bit of good news. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen the news. On Monday, the European Union did finally move forward one more step in uh, European-wide legislation to address this problem. And not only that, but the between the initial uh, proposal and the, the vote uh, on Monday, which was unanimous, was to reverse the burden of proof as the only way to address uh, a state-owned, uh, state-imposed forced labor uh, of this scale and severity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Louisa. We are going to have a time of Q&A, and we're, this is going to be facilitated by persons going around um, with note cards and you can write your questions on note cards. Um, I hope that's being done. Um, I don't know if people need to raise their hands, yeah. but uh, yes, they do. So we're going to write down questions, and then I will have the authority to selectively – I'm the dictator, uh, and I will I – will, um, Do we have to laugh at you? <laughs> yes, you're, you're welcome to make fun of my dictatorship, by the way. <laughs> While that is being done, I just want to firstly emphasize how much the United States, of course, there's always shortcomings of some kind, but the United States really is a leader in terms of combating we of forced labor. If you look by comparison at other countries, if you look also at the process of the European Union, the time frame we're taking, Luisa mentioned some progress is being made, a vote uh, in the European Parliament on an import ban and finally, I've, I've had several conversations with um, members of the European Union and Commission and to try to convince them that there has to be the rebuttable presumption. Uh, it's such a difficult task. And in, in, in those terms, it's really commendable how quickly, well, quickly by comparison, too slow for the Uyghurs, of course, too slow for the Uyghurs, but by comparison, the U.S. was willing to go and take on something very unprecedented to, to reverse the presumption uh, of forced labor. And so by comparison with other countries, the United States really is to be commended on its action in that uh, respect. Uh, and I can tell you that conversations with other countries are not always very encouraging on this topic. One of the things that certainly has been achieved is greater sort of greater awareness among companies of the need for greater traceability. But then we're facing some real challenges. I mean, 90% of cotton in China is made in Xinjiang. So Western companies are claiming whoever – Western companies who draw on Chinese cotton in some way 
are effectively claiming that they are using cotton from the 10%. And that's with traceability within China, shipments within China traceability is close to zero. So we're facing in some sectors effectively a need to get out, to, to, to say cotton from China, and that's 90% from the Uyghur region, that that's really a poor option here. Um, I would like to use the opportunity to ask the first question as questions are being collected. And uh, Brian, you are, I think, one of the most important persons here on this panel, for better or for worse. And it's just really... Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, it's really... Thank you so much for coming and for being willing to, to be here because this is so important, I think, this dialogue. And it's a very constructive dialogue. And as you will have gathered... Everybody here is just very supportive of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And, of course, we all know that there are enforcement challenges, and it's not easy. But at the same time, uh, my, my question, again, comes from a slightly academic perspective. And I had argued before that to tackle state-imposed forced labor, you will end up with some over-enforcement of necessity, although one, of course, will end up having to release. So we hear, of course, there are some shipments detained that um, are then going to be released. But I also want to ask at the question, can you assess, do you have an estimate, do you have an idea, sort of an honest opinion, on the degree of under-enforcement that we might be facing? There is that dependence on, of course, NGO reports. There is the dependence on extremely complex and obfuscated global supply chains. Do you have an idea of what, where are areas of under-enforcement and what are possible, what are sort of your thoughts, where is CBP sort of, what is kind of CBP strategy with areas where you kind of know there might be or there probably is under-enforcement? So what are some of the strategies going sort of forward? So super easy question right out of the gate. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the... On the question of an estimate of under enforcement, I think it'd be, it, it is, that would be very difficult to do. I, I'll say that I'll um, focus in on our strategy uh, more on this for making sure that we do enforce. Um, we utilize a number of the tools that we utilize are um, able to, like I said, leverage all the different sources of data that we get and they're continually updated. Um, and so that's one of the areas that we start with, and Louisa mentioned the, the technical expo that we had. Um, the tools that we're using are the same tools that are available to the industry, and so that we, um, uh, that is for a specific reason because we want the industry to be able to comply and um, conduct due diligence uh, in a fair way. And so on enforcement pieces of that, uh, we continually look at all of the different supply chains that we can find. Um, I want to highlight one key distinction about, we talk a lot about goods, and CBP is not focused specifically on the goods that are, that are imported into the country. We're focused on the entities that are involved in forced labor. And so if the entity is a company that is a chemical producer, for instance, and they produce seven different products, all of those products are something that we're going to be looking at. It's not specifically, uh, we do have our priority sectors of polysilicon tomatoes and cotton that is in the strategy that we look at. So we're constantly looking at entities and information that we can provide on entities. Um, a strategy going forward to making sure that we're, con that we're the strongest, we're being the strongest we can in our enforcement is we've expended, like I said, the, the technology that we're using in trying to develop um, more robust models that, that boils down, I guess, the, the multitude of data points that we have in order to look at just the specific things we need to analyze. Additionally, one of the areas that we've begun to start already is leveraging our um, staffing resources more broadly across the country and working more with our field representatives. You may, uh, if you don't understand the, the kind of the inner workings of CBP, we have what are called centers of excellence and expertise that are industry-specific uh, to things like ba uh, base metals, uh, agriculture, textiles enforcement. Uh, and so those groups are focused on accounts and shipping accounts of importers that are specific to those particular commodities. 
And so we're working directly with them to find different areas that we can increase our enforcement and become more efficient um, in the, the data that we find and the, the information that we're looking at to target. So I think uh, over the next year, we're continually working on uh, additional opportunities to do enforcement. And I do want to bring up one thing that Louisa said, and, and I, you asked the question, and I will say that we will get you an answer on the penalty piece. We are um, uh, imposing penalties that are related to forced labor. We do not have a specific, uh, these are typical penalty statutes that we have available to us under traditional trade law. Um, and we will work on more um, transparency on that. I believe we begin to, we're beginning to update our website on penalty actions that we, at least from a, a, a notification standpoint, we can't go into super detail a lot of the times on the penalties that we take. But um, that's an area that is also an area that we're looking at in enforcement so that we can continue putting pressure uh, out there that, we're, that um, this is not allowable, that the UFLPA is a, a law that we're um, strictly enforcing. And um, when it comes to under enforcement, we're doing everything we can to strengthen our capabilities across the country and working with partners uh, and using the information that we have. Thank you, Brian. And it's well understood that that's not an easy question. It's just a very important one. So we did not expect, um, we are not expecting perfection by any means because it's a very complex task. And it's really admirable, I think, what uh, CBP has been able to do in just 15 months. I think it's really worth emphasizing that. It's very easy to overlook that fact. Uh, and it is a very unique law. And uh, as a, I just want to re-emphasize, other places like the European Union are much more hesitant and much less prepared to take a sort of such a drastic step. And it's just very unfortunate. I think that's really to do with the lack of awareness about how state-imposed forced labor works. There seems to be a huge lack of awareness of that. Um, we will start with a question for John Foote. The question is, how is the selection of targets being discretionary different from other law enforcement structures? What would you propose for changes to CBP's targeting mm -hmm. efforts? Yeah, great question. Um, I just, before I answer that one directly, I want to comment, I want to echo what you said, Adrian, which is that um, what Customs has done in 20 months it really is incredible. And I can sit up here and sort of take shots at what Customs isn't doing or how it isn't consistent or it isn't fair or isn't governed by rules or whatnot, but the real challenge is to stand up an entire enforcement apparatus that is fair, effective, tenacious, vigorous, etc., without the benefit of a governing law uh, that, that defines the, the contours within which these decisions have to be made and how these decisions should be made. And that is the defining feature of every area of international trade law, is that there is a rubric, there is a set of rules, right? I mean, customs doesn't just classify merchandise however it, however it wishes, it applies a set of rules. Um, and, and I think that's the point uh, that I would make in answer to this question, is that um, you know, informal inferential reasoning, trying as best you can to pick out a target based on um, some measure of evidence that might indicate there could be Xinjiang origin content coming into the U.S. from a particular source. Um, you know, there are, there are gradations of, of inferential reasoning. There's strong inferential reasoning. There's weak inferential reasoning. Um, and there's no, again, there's no standard sort of governing that initial decision-making process. Um, you know, there's also no ability, and I referenced this earlier, there's no ability even if an importer wants to say, look, we've done the work, we've mapped the supply chain, we've traced it, we've gone to ground, and we are confident that we have the documentation to prove what needs to be proven. There is no ability for an importer to make that sort of affirmative representation if they wanted to, um, and typically in just about every area of trade regulation, there is a dialogue that happens between the importer and between customs. The importer has to come forward and say, here's what I'm importing, right? Here's how it's classified. Here's how much I paid for it, the right value for it. This is the country of origin. There's some sort of representation, and there is no representation that an importer is um, even allowed to make with respect to what it has done. Um, and that's what I mean when I say the, you know, the potential of wielding the condition of market access really hasn't been leveraged. There is a significant 
segment of the business community that is prepared to uh, dig deeper in the supply chain, to trace more, uh, to have more documentation and more proof than is required under any other legal regime, and wants to have compliant merchandise and imported into the United States. And the fact that those companies cannot find a clear path to understanding and predicting how they can do that um, is a real um, missed opportunity for the law at present. Thank you. The next question is for Luisa, and it really, I mean, this could be a 10-minute reply, but I think we need to limit it a little bit. So let me word it this way. What are some of the key successes of the work of the Coalition to End Weaker Forced Labor in the struggle to tackle this challenge? Uh, thank you, Adrian. Um, the first uh, success is that Uyghurs are not alone. So, you know, the Uyghur nation is a proud nation with a long history, but I, I know that um, I would say even if you go back a decade, there are some people who uh, work deeply on China policy would not know how to pronounce uh, the name of this group. Um, so Uyghurs were alone in trying to send out alerts Warning signs, red flags, the policies are terrible and they don't look like they're getting better. So this is um, providing uh, hope and expertise uh, in, in being able to advocate for a policy response in the EU, at the ILO, um, at what we hope sometime, you know, the OECD. And so in multilateral bodies where small NGOs, a diaspora uh, community is not going to be able to have access and provide uh, the information and their views on the correct policy response. Uh, that's what the coalition provides. I would say in terms of outcomes, um, we've gone through g companies, particularly the cotton and textile, the, the clothing companies, uh, the, the brand names, realizing they couldn't get away with agnosticism. They were under pressure in the spring of 2020 after, you know, your <coughs> research came out and the other reports. Um, it's not enough to simply say we have no tolerance. And then they went into the maw of the Chinese government's response, which was to organize so-called consumer boycotts, retaliation against brands, H&M in particular will come to mind, if everyone recalls, um, and recognizing that, again, a state that's ready to retaliate capriciously, not under the color of law, um, you know, through deception, we know that when there's an online, uh, sustained online netizen response to something that is approved, um, it, it will be approved by the state, and therefore it represents a state wish to have this go forward, to retaliate against foreign brands um, that actually state, we have no tolerance for forced labor, we will not be sourcing um, products that are at high risk, because that's our company policy and our internal ethics, to have that kind of consumer, you know, commercial market access retaliation against their brands should be a big wake-up call. And so that happened because government companies realized they couldn't stay silent. Yes, absolutely. Just uh, one, of, one of the things that, you know, due to the, the work that so many people have been doing, such as Luisa and, and others on uh, working with companies on due diligence, one of the things that we're seeing more and more, uh, as I mentioned, is, is the, the increase in auditing and increase of, of supply chain tracing and due diligence. Um, I think I was in Malaysia a few weeks ago, and um, it was held by an alliance that, uh, the Responsible Business Alliance, for instance, uh, which I'm not endorsing or just, but I was invited to speak for them. Um, they are taking on more roles on auditing. There are other associations and other companies out there that are taking a role in uh, auditing their supply chains, providing opportunities for their members. Uh, so that we're seeing a shift of that everywhere in the associations that we meet and the other groups that we meet with. Uh, and I think that that's in a direct um, reflection of a lot of the outreach that um, groups have been doing on this issue. So I just want to mention that. The next question asks, a 2023 Commerce Department report found that firms like Canadian Solar were circumventing the UFLPA by transshipping the solar supplies through Thailand. However, enforcement is not being conducted due to a 2022 Biden, Biden administration proclamation. How has this proclamation impacted customs and border patrol work? I assume 
Brian would be best placed to answer this question, but um, if anybody after him wants to chip in, they're welcome to. Sure. I, and I, um, I would say that the law is very specific under the UFLPA that any goods made with forced labor are prohibited from entry. Um, the, we are aware of the, of the um, uh, executive order on uh, solar panels, and we're also aware of the threat and the risk of transshipment, which we continually look at. Um, I think one of the areas that you can see where we find um, particular companies that are, let me put it this way, the, the, the companies are incredibly complex and the supply chains are complex. And if you look at our uh, statistics dashboard, you will, you will not just see China on the list, right? There's a number of other countries that are in, uh, on that list for the final product that is produced and sent to the United States. So whether it be a solar panel or a cotton product, um, they come from a number of different countries of origin, the final country of origin. And um, that shows that we are, I think it's a good representation that we are continually looking down the entire supply chain and finding where the risk may come from Xinjiang. So um, when it comes to things like transshipment, when it comes to things that are um, where people are trying to circumvent the law, we're actively looking at those areas and trying to find particular um, opportunities to leverage the authorities as long as they are made wholly or in part with, with materials that are from Xinjiang. And so um, the company that was mentioned, I can't speak about any company specifically, but I just, as an overall general statement, we are looking at every single um, pathway that could potentially be found in order to circumvent the law. I, I would just um, chime in that the term transshipment is thrown, thrown around a lot in the UFLPA context. Um, and transshipment in a trade context typically has a specific meaning, which is the movement of goods from one jurisdiction to a second jurisdiction uh, for the purpose of deliberately obscuring the country of origin um, so that upon importation, the second country is designated as the country of origin when really the goods came from the original country. Um, <clears throat> it's a known sort of phenomenon of trade cheats is to engage in transshipment schemes. But a lot of what the UFLPA is really primarily focused on is not transshipment per se, but on simply the nature of global supply chains, which is to say merchandise from Xinjiang and the wholly or in part nature of the supply chain uh, of, the, of the forced labor import ban, which is to say content from Xinjiang might go to a second jurisdiction and be further manufactured into something that then gets sold to a third country, that then gets sold to a fourth country, that gets sold to a fifth country, and then ultimately ends up making its way into the United States. That finished merchandise is prohibited under the law. That's not an example of transshipment, though. That is a phenomenon simply of the global supply chain. And one weakness, I think, of the UFLPA as currently drafted is that it doesn't delineate between the concept of proper transshipment, which is a trade sheet activity, and simply the nature of complex, opaque global supply chains. And you might think that in this trade law, as in many other trade laws, you would want to define the type of conduct that constitutes deliberate, intentional cheating. Uh, and in fact, you might want to create some penalties that are specifically focused. And you know, to, um, to Brian's point about customs imposing penalties related to forced labor, the challenge here is that, again, customs is left with a bit of a square peg and a round hole. It has, custom, it has a lot of penalty uh, authority. It has capability under different statutory mechanisms to penalize importers for uh, for um, uh, trade violations of, of one stripe or another. It is not exactly uh, an easy fit to map those particular statutes onto uh, the type of conduct that is governed and regulated by Section 307 and by the UFLPA. Um, again, you would want to identify, ideally, you know, what constitutes truly problematic content. And you'd want to circumscribe that, and you'd want to be able to penalize for that type of problematic content. Next question, should there be an amendment to the UFLPA as to not just block products, but to confiscate them altogether? Any panelist may respond. Feel free. <laughs> uh, certainly, um, in order to <laughs> have real leverage over the Chinese government decision makers and business decision makers and then the international market and trade partners of those Chinese entities, 
it has to be the case that you can't make a profit. Now, does that change the Chinese government's mind? As Adrian and many others have pointed out, the Chinese government wants to put Uyghurs in factory situations, take them away from their homes and their orchards where the government says you're idle because you're not drawing a wage. You might have a perfectly fine household economy or some of your family have a wage and you don't. Um, that intention is there from the beginning. But at very minimum, there should be an economic penalty for that. There should be no profits from that. And the consumers and American businesses who are trying to just supply their, their, their market needs should not be complicit in that program. And so it, the fact that something would be turned away at a port where our centers of excellence in the CBP have figured out this cannot be admitted, um, and simply to have it to go to Canada is really an outrage. So the re-export question really needs to be resolved, and I, have, I do not have a specific answer whether that requires an amendment to the law or another solution. Um, certainly once you have all jurisdictions in some future day, but at least the Europeans, and then Canada and Mexico as U.S. free trade partners, in fact, not allowing re-exports to those jurisdictions, at least that's a step forward so that we don't say, well, Americans can't be complicit, but let the French be complicit. That has to stop. Um, I actually wrote an article about this particular question um, about a year and a half ago um, about whether or not the U.S. government has legal authority to seize merchandise that is imported in violation of the UFLPA. Um, the U.S. government asserts that it does have this authority. It has detention authority, meaning it can stop the merchandise at the border. It has exclusion authority. It can send it back on its way to some other jurisdiction. Customs or the U.S. government, not customs specifically, but the U.S. government will say that that customs has seizure and forfeiture authority. Um, but if you actually go in and read the whole statute, it, all the different categories of merchandise that customs can seize and forfeit are itemized. And there is no category that governs prohibited merchandise generally or merchandise imported in violation of the forced labor import ban specifically. And I still remember the day that I realized this. I went and I looked it up and I read the statute. I said, holy smokes, there is no authority for the U.S. government to seize merchandise made with forced Uyghur labor. That struck me as a big deal. But it, what it ultimately is a symptom of is an incongruity between this marquee U.S. You know, human rights law and the existing sort of apparatus of U.S. trade law. And that has to do with the fact that this law wasn't written by the committees on Congress governing trade. It came out of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, right? It's a human rights law. It's not a part of Title 19, even though Customs is charged with enforcing it. Um, there are many incongruities between the forced labor import ban and uh, sort of the balance of U.S. trade laws, U.S. Customs laws. Um, and, you know, any number of those could be addressed in some sort of evolution. But the most important thing to keep in mind is how much of this process isn't governed by statute. And, you know, the point that I would make is that when everything is the focus, nothing is the focus. <clears throat> so on that, I, I'm not aware, I'll have to check with our, our lawyers, uh, that we have actually stated that we have seizure and forfeiture authority under UFLPA, but we do have seizure and forfeiture authority under uh, 1307, which is the law that UFLPA um, references and, and um, uh, applies to. The, um, in that case, where I mentioned earlier, where we do investigations uh, on allegations of forced labor, and then when we find, we have, we have two different um, decisions that we can make on that. One is a withhold release order if we find reasonable suspicion of forced labor, and then the other is a finding if we find probable cause. And in a finding, we can actually seize the goods, and they're not um, subject to export. So there are authorities related to forced labor where we do have seizure authority. Um, and it's, it's an interesting question, I think. Um, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's more of a legal question that we'd have to, we'd have to coordinate on. Thanks. Sounds like there's interesting scope for follow-on conversations and potential follow-up on this question. The next question. When an importer has successfully demonstrated that its supply chain does not touch, that word says, does not touch Xinjiang, uh, why do successive shipments of the same product from the same factory face detentions? And I assume that Brian would be best placed to answer that. Sure, thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, if um, it really comes down to managing risk. If the company in, is involved in 
uh, imports from a particular uh, entity or producer that has high risk of using Uyghur forced labor, um, that's where we will stop the shipment and um, request an applicability review of, of the documentation. If they clear that shipment, um, it, it is um, then released and there's no further update to Congress or any other um, um, reporting that's necessary. Uh, however, if they continue to use the same supply chain, they, um, their best uh, advocate for making sure that they can then continue to facilitate trade efficiently is to work with their center of excellence and they can um, help decide if there is um, things that we can do on our, on our end in order to help uh, move their shipments along more quickly or limit the number of, of detentions that they may receive. But it is um, ultimately about managing the risk involved with the entities that are in, in, involved in the shipment. I, I have to weigh in. It's a great question. When an importer proves that their supply chain is clean, why do you have subsequent detentions in the first place? And the answer is, well, Customs is still managing risk, as, as Brian put it, right? And there's still some risk, right? I mean, the inferential reasoning that led to the identification of that foreign producer as a target for enforcement um, is still valid, right? That foreign producer might have, you know, the documents might still show that that producer received a shipment from the Uyghur region, you know, going back a year and a half, and that might have been what justified getting them in that NGO report. <clears throat> Um, and I agree that customs will try to work with an importer to permit sort of expedited review of traceability documentation. But, you know, even expedited review of a 600-page packet uh, takes a bit of time, right? And without any legal standard governing the decision of when you sort of move to expedited review, when customs will move the enforcement storm onto a different foreign goods manufacturer, a different target, um, without any guidance regarding when, you know, a cleared shipment is regard should be regarded to have some sort of precedential effect, like, yeah, you cleared that shipment and we're now going to presume that, or we're going to infer that perhaps maybe the rest of these detentions sort of aren't, you know, worth the full, you know, intense treatment. Um, none of that's governed by law, right? Like, it's just, it's just subject to agency discretion. And, you know, at the very least, you know, what you expect in an administrative law context is the ability to have, like, an intermediate sort of decisional authority within the administrative structure, right? Like, customs officials have to make decisions. They've got to look at papers. They've got to make a call one way or another, left or right. Like, it, it is what it is. It's, by, it's yes, it's no, whatever. Um, that decision should be reviewable at least by one layer of review that is capable of issuing sort of a written public decision, <clears throat> you know, suitably anonymized, but let's say in three weeks' time, that says, here were the facts, here's how we applied it. Now, interestingly, this is something that Customs has done for years. For, for 40 years, Customs has been, and longer, Customs has been publishing rulings and decisions applying the law uh, that governs international trade to specific fact patterns. And it served to create an entire body of law around certain types of trade questions. We desperately need something like that, although it can't, you know, take 180 days or, <laughs> or 300 days to issue a decision. It's got to be on sort of a tight timeline. Uh, but creating some sort of at least administrative review public decision, we'll write it out and, and justify the decision made under the facts as we understand them, um, would do a tremendous amount to turning this into something that is governed by something that's predictable, i.e. the rule of law. Question to all panelists, to open to any of the panelists. Is there a case study that shows either how effective or ineffective the UFLPA plays out in the customs process? Um, I'd, I'd like to give um, a, a case study, um, which is the report about the red dates. Thank you for mentioning that uh, earlier. Um, so, again, Uyghur Americans, um, in particular UAA, worked in concert with researcher, a Uyghur researcher with UHRP, and literally took pictures of these Xinjiang production and construction corp, Bing Tuan products. The report title was sanctioned products on American grocery store shelves. And by sanctioning, we weren't actually referring to UFLPA, which does govern 
policing the ports, right? That's what CBP has to do. Things are not allowed in the port if they're not allowed in America. This was about Magnitsky sanctions, global Magnitsky sanctions, which is the modern tool for freezing the assets and refusing visas to perpetrators of serious international crimes. So the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, which is responsible for much of the cotton, much of the tomatoes, and in this case, the red dates, um, just because that happened, the reason they're labeled uh, all over Xinjiang and even Bingtuan is partly because that's a, that's cachet, right? Consumers of red dates, that make people make tea and so on, know that the Uyghur homeland, East Turkestan, is a, a land with beautiful sunshine and just the right conditions to make the best product. So it's a positive marketing tool to refer to Xinjiang in Chinese, of course, and sometimes in Latin letters. Um, finding these on the shelves is like a shot, just a, a slap in the face already more than a year, almost two years after they, these companies had been put on Magnitsky list um, by the Trump administration. So we wrote a whole report, traced, you know, traced out some of the suppliers, you know, trying to help out <laughs> with enforcement. CBP immediately responded, or let's say took a few months, and then finally did a story where they took a picture of their agents opening those boxes. And anyone who reads good Chinese can say, I can't believe that these are the exact same brands that we found in the grocery stores in March, April, May, Wired China did a whole story. They saw them on the grocery store shelves and said, hey, what's going on? So Customs was able to say, now that we have UFLPA, absolutely we are, what might be on a shelf, since it's a shelf-stable product, see how much we follow the rule of law? If it's a shelf-stable product, it's possible those products could have been sitting in that grocery store in Sacramento for 18 months, and therefore it wasn't at that time CBP's job to apply the rebuttable presumption to every Xinjiang product, because dates, unlike Xinjiang cotton, was not under a WRO at the time. So we were looking at the um, enforcement. So that photo, you know, we put a report out in August. In January, the CBP uh, employee newsletter put out a story. Um, and then now people can see, yes, indeed, you can see pictures of customs um, stopping these things, but we tried to get a meeting with Treasury, and I would like to invite anyone who's watching this, we would like to know why the Treasury Department is not imposing penalties on wherever that money changed hands. No sanctioned entity under the Magnitsky sanctions should be allowed to use our U.S. banking system. Their assets should be frozen. So how is it that these grocery distributors are able to somehow get, be paid, um, and, exchange, and pay for goods with a sanctioned entity. So there's like, there's, you know, more than one entity, more than one issue going on, and uh, there's a lack of enforcement on many actions, even when the American government has taken action, which is, you know, there are 117 U.S. sanctions and policy, written policies that are responding to the Uyghur genocide, including forced labor. Um, in all of the rest of the world, there are five Magnitsky sanctions. And then now this EU law is coming in. So I will agree with Adrian that the U.S. is by far the leader. <clears throat> I mentioned that I published a newsletter. Um, it's on Substack. It's forcedlabortrade.substack.com. I've been thinking of creating sort of a, um, a running sub-segment about sort of, uh, you know, days without a, a XPCC red date sighting in the wild. Um, I was in an um, Asian grocery store three weeks ago, and there was a big, you know, uh, crate full of um, Bing Tuan red dates for sale right by the checkout register here in the here in the DC metro area. Um, forced labor trade enforcement is hard. It is hard to spot even the lowest hanging fruit, literally, even if that fruit is red dates. It's hard. It's hard to do it. Um, you asked for a, a case study, a, an example. Um, um, We'll change the jurisdictions and anonymize and say, you know, we had a client that was importing goods from Thailand. Um, the producer in Thailand had been named in an NGO report for having had one prior uh, shipment um, um, in uh, the days preceding the, um, the UFLPA taking effect um, from Xinjiang to this location in Thailand. And uh, there were no ownership affiliations to the, to the Xinjiang region by this Thai producer or by the importer. Um, and um, we had auditors go into the Thai facility and look at all the documentation and the production records and confirm that, in fact, no shipments of Xinjiang origin merchandise had entered the facility um, since January of 2022, which was, um, you know, one month after the UFLPA uh, was signed, but before it had taken effect. 
um, there was no Xinjiang content, and we produced um, traceability packages that were, in my view, impeccable. Uh, we traced all the way to raw materials for PVC in multiple components. We traced all the way to raw materials for every other non-PVC component, and we turned in what I thought in 90 days was an incredible piece of work. Um, and the shipment was rejected. Uh, the, the petition was rejected. Um, and no reason was given. And I asked for a call and I asked for an explanation and the explanation was, well, some importers in their submissions have included blank papers. And I said, well, I didn't include blank papers in my submission. And they said, yeah, well, we're talking about other, you know, other folks. And, um, and I said, well, but what about my submission? They said, well, why don't you take another look at it and maybe you can see what we didn't like, what we didn't like in it. Um, and that was the that was the that was the end of that answer, right? That was the end of the answer. So you know, there's a first person sort of experience. I don't know if I call it a case study exactly, but um, forced labor trade enforcement is hard. It's a fascinating topic. It's a complicated topic. There are many different perspectives on it, which we were able to shed some light on in very limited time. But a highly interesting panel, and I'd really like to thank. Uh, all the panelists for coming and uh, a round of applause. Many thanks to every, excuse me? Is this on? Can you hear me? Very good. Thank you very much for your attention during that panel. The next panel will begin in five minutes. If you need to move around, please do so expeditiously. A uh, few questions I've had a lot of uh, come to me. There's water in the corner there. If you need restrooms, you need to go out where the sign-in is and walk around and down the hall. That's where the restrooms are. In four minutes, we'll begin our next panel. Thank you. If I may have your attention, please, the next panel begins in one minute. One minute. If you could make your way to your seats, the next panel will begin in one minute. Thank you. Keep them on their toes.
If I could ask everyone to uh, please take your seats, we're going to start the next panel. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're excited to start our second panel, particularly after such an engaging uh, and thoughtful first panel. Uh, now we will discuss the power and responsibility, how Beijing's human rights record is shaping diplomacy and impacting foreign policy around the world. As many of you know, the CCP is facing, fortunately, growing scrutiny of its coercive actions and human rights record, both by individual countries and across various international organizations. As we heard just in the last panel, we, we see the new enforcement of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, and now uh, increasingly close, the, the passage of the EU's uh, policy to ban forced labor. But what is happening uh, in, beyond just th those forced labor policies? What's happening internationally? Is meaningful progress being made, or are, are we risking failure at important points? Um, this is, these are some of the topics we will discuss, uh, so just briefing, briefly, I'll do uh, an introduction briefly of our uh, guests, our, our panelists, and I'll kind of give my thoughts on this topic and then introduce them more fully. Um, but we will hear about how Xi Jinping is using various mechanisms uh, to try to advance his framework for creating his uh, famed shared future of, hum of humanity for all mankind, both in the multilateral space and as it relates to changing and advancing their view towards normative frameworks. We will also discuss how protection of human rights and the CCP's sense of their approach to internal security are inherently in tension and completely incompatible, and discuss how that we've seen that take place in the sad examples, or I should say tragic examples of what we've seen take place in Hong Kong, and try to imagine what that would look like in Taiwan. We'll also examine how regional partnerships and bilateral cooperation, especially across the Indo-Pacific, are changing and developing in ways to address China's increased aggressiveness in the region as well as human rights abuses. Joining me on the panel are Jude Blanchett, Ambassador Kelly Curry, and Matthew Turpin, and I'll give a brief introduction for them in a moment. Um, I want to pick up on some of my opening comments at, at the top about my view of, as, as not just a moderator but a panelist, of the approach the CCP has taken in the multilateral space, I'll speak most specifically 
in the UN context, but I want folks to understand this is not just in the UN. This is in their bilateral relationships and in other multilateral settings. Over the last decade, the CCP has dramatically changed its approach to multilateralism and work in the UN setting from what you could have described before as maybe a snapping turtle to the more uh, common diplomatic phrase of wolf warrior, of, of an approach focused on purely kind of defensive approaches in the UN, kind of only kind of push back when poked, to actively working to advance their agenda and reshape the kind of norms of our Western tradition, not just in the human rights space, but across the international frameworks of the UN system. That's an important point to recognize, and we'll come back and focus on many of the human rights aspects, but across the UN system, the CCP has been much more aggressive in terms of pushing its way both in the Security Council and in many of the technical bodies across the UN. The International Telecommunications Union, where the former direct, uh, Secretary General, a Chinese national, pushed their own 5G agenda inappropriately, promoting Huawei across the global south. The leadership at the Food and Agricultural Organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and as we all saw, attempts to inappropriately influence, successfully unfortunately, at the World Health Organization, and their attempts to lead the World Intellectual Property Organization. Now I want to state in all of these spaces, when I'm critical of them, this is not critical of the country of China at seeking to advocate its own national interest in these international organizations. That is an appropriate role of every country. The U.S. and every country around the world wants to work cooperatively across these international organizations to seek greater international cooperation that benefits the world and their own country, and that's perfectly appropriate. What I'm talking about is the use by, of, of Beijing's leadership to undermine the structural and policy framework of these organizations um, particularly as it relates to human rights. And as we've seen across the UN space in the human rights setting, the CCP has been not just defensive but offensive, and we'll talk more about that as we go on, not just obstructing the work of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the many special rapporteurs who are established to examine the human rights abuses, but also trying to change the narrative and language around what are human rights to do everything they can to downplay the importance of individual human rights and to focus on collective rights. Um, I could complain at length about the previous uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, M Michelle Bachelet, and all her many failures. And we have more hope in the new High Commissioner, uh, High Commissioner Turk. Um, but we would make a mistake, a very serious mistake, if we thought any one individual or any bureaucracy within the UN was actually going to be a locus of change or power. The UN and, and all of these multilateral systems are member state organizations. It's the role and actions by governments, by countries, not individual bureaucrats that can do a, a better or worse job, that ultimately matter and drive any kind of change we want to see around the world. And I'll just briefly go through one example that many of us I'm sure are aware of just from this last year. Of course, about a year and a half ago when we released uh, through Dr. Zenz's incredible work, the Xinjiang police files, uh, this coincided quite coincidentally with uh, the former High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet's famed trip to China and to the Xinjiang region. This was a failure on her part to allow herself to be used as a puppet by the regime um, in going to Xinjiang. And upon, you know, right at the last minute of her departure of her tenure, fortunately, her office was able to release this important report by the Office of the High Commissioner on the human rights abuses taking place in Xinjiang. Uh, I thought it was extremely gratifying to see the evidence um, not only developed by Dr. Zenz, but scholars around the world, and the evidence presented in the Xinjiang police files prominently included in this report. I'll just add... That was a report that the U.S. and many countries had been demarching uh, her and her office to release for years. But um, that report came out, and that was a really important landmark that, again, you had under the U.N. banner factual um, evidence presented against China's human rights abuses and a condemnation of the you know, uh, atrocities taking place. And then we saw just over one year ago a vote to have a discussion 
of this report in the UN body, which makes perfect sense. And that vote failed. Well, I, I have and I would criticize uh, the effort made to actually win that vote. I'll at least, you know, and having been a former policymaker, maybe I'm too deferential sometimes, but, you know, I, I try not to Monday morning quarterback, you know, when people are in those jobs trying to do that work, it's hard, it's difficult. That, show, that vote shouldn't have failed. I don't believe it. I think the United States could have won that vote, but let's move beyond that point. At least they tried. At least we tried. And we've done nothing for a year. I assumed at the next session of the Human Rights Council in, in the spring that this come, would come up and we'd win the vote this time. But then maybe that wasn't the right time, so I thought, okay, maybe in the summer session they, they, would, they would hold the vote and win the vote this time. And having worked in, in the UN and Geneva, I know there's this kind of normal flow that a lot of the diplomats like to follow where you don't do things over and over again. You kind of wait for like the next year. Because the next year at that time is when you bring up a similar topic again. So of course, at the Human Rights Council session that just ended, it would be brought up and, and the vote would be cast this time. No, we did nothing. Now, I'm not saying the work of the United States or other countries to address human rights abuses around the world have been nothing. Obviously, we saw the expulsion and then the non-selection of Russia from the Human Rights Council. That is a meritorious action. Congratulations. You managed to do maybe what you describe as the most minimum necessary to not put a murderous regime, you know, engaged in an offensive war on the Human Rights Council. What about the evidence of the Chinese Communist Party? And of course, we've re-elected them to the Human Rights Council. Where was the effort to stop that? <laughs> I say this because in my introduction, I said hope is not a strategy. It takes real work, diplomatic action and efforts, educating the public and educating other countries about the threat posed by the CCP, but most importantly, the threat that it poses to undermining our Western democratic values in, across these multilateral UN settings. There's lots of discussion about the merits of these organizations across the UN, the Human Rights Council in particular, but a failure to use these mechanisms, particularly the Human Rights Council, but it can be the ILO or other uh, elements of the UN system, risks undermining any sense of legitimacy that they may have, especially when they are um, mute in the face of, of the worst human rights abuses we see today. Every day that goes by that the UN system, and really, I mean member states in that system, because we're the, we're the, our governments are the ones ultimately responsible, fail to act, we undermine the very nature of our support for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We put at risk a signature human rights accomplishment of the 20th century here in the 21st. So um, I want to stop with my kind of opening remarks and introduce our panelists who, who will uh, continue this conversation. I'd like to introduce Jude Blanchett, who is the Freeman Chair in China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Previously, he was an engagement director at the Conference Board's China Center. He has written <laughs> extensively on Chinese politics and foreign policy for publications including Foreign Affairs, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post. His book, China's New Red Guards, was published by Oxford University Press in, 19, uh, in 2019, and he holds an MA from the University of Oxford and serves on the board of the American Mandarin Society. Jude, thanks for joining us. Great, um, Ambassador Bremberg, thank you very much. Thanks to uh, Adrian and, and uh, for the invitation and, and Abraham as well for facilitating this. Um, I'll be brief because I'm sharing the stage with two other illustrious guests and speakers who I'm, I'm more interested in, in hearing, but let me make um, a few points, one of which may be obvious and banal, but nonetheless I think is important to reiterate and to continue to reiterate, and, and the second is a little bit, second and third points are a bit more speculative. But the, the first point is appreciating how fundamentally incompatible or, or I guess we could say in, in the most polite version, at tension and at odds are the types of institutions, rules, and enforcing bodies we would need to protect the dignity and rights of individuals and, and what the Communist Party sees as necessary for the maintenance of internal stability and, and what it needs to be able to project power globally. Those two things are, are um, 
you could say incompatible, or again, if you want to take the more polite end of the spectrum at, at, at odds. Um, we've seen not only what Ambassador Brem Bremberg was just mentioning, but we have seen that as basically the Xi administration came to appreciate what it believes was um, a, a, um, a state of the Communist Party that was on the verge of, of collapse or certainly was at the verge of instability, it had to reassert control. And with that has come a uh, necessary movement from the snapping turtle to the wolf warrior, from purely defensive to much more offensive position. And so even in the debate on China, we hear this at, at, the, at the sort of more benign end of, of the spectrum, people framing this as, well, look, the party is just doing what it needs to do to make the world safe for autocracy. Even if you're in that world of Beijing doing what it needs to do to make the, make the world safe for autocracy, that means necessarily an evisceration of, um, manipulation of, undermining of, destruction of what we think of as the, the types of multilateral institutions and bodies, but also it is, um, it is a threat to have these same institutions and protections and mechanisms like a free press existing in other sovereign states like the United States. I don't think the party sees boundaries at play here when it considers the threat that, say, you know, the free press plays in um, the United States or Canada or the UK or, or Europe. Those are also existential threats to the party as well, and it has an interest in uh, un undermining these. So we see, I, I completely agree that what we've seen the party feel is a necessary strategy of um, co-opting, redefining what the term human rights means to where, like China's attempt to redefine democracy into something that, you know, even if with your best interest to try to understand what the heck they're talking about, when you step away from it, you realize what's happening here is a complete rewriting of just the basic understanding of what it is to have a human right, what you need to protect a human right and what you need institutionally and legally to enforce those protections, as well as the types of civil society institutions that play a, a, a buttressing role, again, like the free press, like nonprofits. Um, those, those can have, there can be no space for those anymore in, uh, in, in Beijing, in China, but I think increasingly it sees that it needs to push out the offensive uh, into the external order as well. Which brings us to, I think, two of the more discrete issues I was going to discuss here today. One is an actual case study. We have a real-time case study of watching what happens when we move uh, from a world in which Beijing is having to negotiate as somewhat of an outside actor to actually uh, controlling and dominating the institutional arrangements. And this is thinking about the trajectory of, of Hong Kong since 1997, but certainly since 2019. And the other is then trying to imagine what a trajectory would be like if a, uh, a process of unification were to, be, were to be imposed on Taiwan under the rubric of one country, two systems. So first, you know, on Hong Kong, and I was there recently, um, what strikes me about it is, in, in some sense, we're focused purely on the national security law, right? So this physical, tactile, legal architecture, which is what the party imposed on Hong Kong uh, in, in, in the summer of 2020, um, after the social movement and protests broke out in 2019 over the extradition, proposed extradition law. But more importantly, it was a convening moment for, for residents across Hong Kong who had deep and wide grievances about the trajectory of the city and concerns about, um, concerns about its relationship with the mainland to come together and, and vent those frustrations. Beijing imposed this, this national security law, but, but what I think is arguably more important and, and much more nefarious is, it's not just what the law has done. It is, and this is often the case in, with dictatorships, it is a new sort of incentive structure that is imposed on a polity that, that at its very core has shifting and blurry boundaries about what is licit and what is illicit, such that citizens and residents have no sense of security over what is the island that they can stand on, and have rights and jurisdictions and sovereignty and an understanding with any predictability of what behavior is acceptable and what you have to constantly question and be concerned about. So it is, it is whether this is in North Korea or the Soviet Union, um, autocracies in many ways, the potency 
of those political systems is not in what you can see and touch and articulate. It's, it's precisely the opposite. It's the expansion of gray zones that make it nearly impossible for the citizen, for the journalist, for the policymaker, for the academic to say, I can write this because this is safe and I know that these are the, you know, these are essentially the, the, these are the outer bounds, this is the fence, this is the delineation, the demarcation. That all gets eviscerated. And I think that's what we're starting to see in, in Hong Kong. And so, you know, you, you could point to the national security law and see that technically you've had a, a near drop off of cases that they're bringing against the national security law. Therefore, it, that's not, you know, th there's no problem with the national security law. It was a surge of prosecutions. And that's why I think looking at that data misses the point, right? In the, in the Chinese, the proverb is you kill the chicken to scare the monkey, right? You set examples. You pick out a few quote unquote bad apples. You over punish them um, to try to essentially, to try to essentially create an ecosystem where there's self enforcement, where there's self censorship, right? Where there's, where there's ratting out family members or, or other academics. That's the real poison of what these political systems can do when they want to in, in, impose a will. So it, it is the formal structure. Um, it is the fact that, that they have built out in Hong Kong new bureaucracies coming out of the national security law with a role in enforcing national security law. But I think that's, that's about 40% of it. The rest of it is the, the insecurity and subjectivity of this new regime that, that is operating. Which now brings us to thinking about futures for Taiwan under a rubric of one country, two systems, which we know um, as articulated in the Taiwan white paper that Beijing put out uh, in August of last year is still their, their clearly articulated value proposition of how this is going to go forward. So they're saying still one country, two systems is it. This is what we're going to, we're, this is what we're going to bring to you. And what they are increasingly saying is, but here's your choice. Either we enforce one country, two system as we think fit um, if you don't play nice. If you do play nice, there's going to be room for discussion. And I think what all, everyone understands both in Taiwan, in this room, and around the global community is, first of all, that, that, that's a false choice. It will be what Beijing mandates. Um, and I think the second thing is we understand that as we're seeing in Hong Kong and as we see as the, the party – works to undermine legal and regulatory and multilateral regimes that have any, um, uh, have any enforceability that really um, rights when you're under the legal jurisdiction of the Communist Party are a matter of um, grace that the party decides to give to you. There's no enforceability of this. This is not something you have recourse to. And so in some way what we were hoping would be the case with in, in Hong Kong um, I think we're, we're starting to uh, appreciate how that was indeed hope um, and really required that the party um, was going to be willing to grant um, uh, with its own, you know, uh, benefaction a set of rights that it that is now decided um, it doesn't feel our opposite and it actually feels like we're becoming a security risk so it needs to undermine those. I think the more tragic reality of thinking about a scenario in Taiwan where you do see Beijing in a functional position to be able to define a relationship in a regime like one country, two systems, is that that would, have, would, would almost by definition come by force, given that we see that no one on Taiwan is looking to buy what, what Beijing is selling. And so what can we imagine in that very, very dark, unfortunate scenario? Um, this is one where you, the Communist Party will not be looking to play nice. Um, I think the idea that it would even have any sense of robustness for a two systems would, would survive a, a, a fingernail scratch of, of scrutiny. And, and all the security, um, all the security paranoias that we see growing in Beijing would be operating at amplitudes we've never seen before, right? Uh, Taiwan would become a penal colony. It would become a police state, which would make Hong Kong look uh, democratic by by comparison, and so I think unfortunately this is the this is the the Beijing that we now have to uh, deal with quite objectively and our eyes wide open. Uh, this is not the place to litigate previous u s policy on China. I think to the armchair quarterbacking comment I, I, certainly if I were in the room in one thousand nine hundred and ninety six 
I'm not sure I would, I would have thought at that moment, given the signs and signals we were getting, that, that it was realistic or, or even the right strategy then to sort of shut the door and try and close Beijing out. So I'm, I'm appreciative of what you would do with the information you had in the mid-1990s, but let's put that debate to rest. And now let's deal with the debate in 2023 is we have a political system which is, I, I, you know, the, the German foreign minister got in trouble for saying this, but I don't know how else you can look at the trajectory of the political system, the lack of any of the um, power constraining mechanisms or norms that imperfectly existed for some of the post-reform and opening period. Those are all gone. And so you have something which is a, or, or hurtling towards a dictatorship where there's an ideology. I'm less worried about the Marxism ideology. I'm more worried about the national security ideology, which has now infected the way that the Chinese state thinks about the world. External relations are becoming much more tense for Beijing, which in an ideal world you would hope would force a course correction towards more honey, but I think exactly the opposite. It will reaffirm for Xi Jinping all of his priors about what he has been doing to lock down the Chinese system, enforce discipline on the Communist Party, and make sure that they're cracking down on security risks any and, and, and everywhere. So there is a vicious spiral between Chinese behavior making its, its periphery and even the global community become more weary of China and therefore take corresponding actions to protect themselves, then simply teaches Xi Jinping, I was right to think that the world is nasty, brutish, and short, and therefore we need to continue to dig in our heels and build out the security apparatus. And therefore, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on this because I'm very politely having the end sign waved at me. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the space to try to work with China on these issues, which get to the very core of its vision for regime security, is, is becoming infinitesimally small. Not impossible, but I think infinitesimally small. Mm -hmm. So on that optimistic note, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you, Jude. I'll, yeah. Next, I'd like to go to Ambassador Curry. Uh, Ambassador Kelly Curry is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and founding partner of Kilo Alpha Strategies. She has specialized in human rights and political reform in the Indo-Pacific through her foreign policy career. Ambassador Curry served as the U.S. representative to the U.N. Economic and Social Council and later as ambassador at large for global women's issues. Prior to re-entering government, she was a senior fellow at Project 20. 49 Institute, focusing on security issues in Asia. Ambassador Curry holds a JD from Georgetown and a BA from the University of Georgia. I'm pleased to welcome my friend, Ambassador Kelly Curry. Thank you. Thank you, um, Andrew. And uh, I am really honored to be here and to be on this panel with, um, with folks who I have consumed their work to inform my own thinking about these issues, and so it's really, um, really fantastic to, to be with this, with this, um, on this great panel, and to be at this important forum again this year. Um, you've uh, continued to outdo yourself with the China Forum year after year and build on um, success here. Um, I, to pick up on some of the things that Jude has said, I think that it is really important for us to, and, and that Andrew said earlier, I think it's really important for us to understand the lattice work that, um, that Xi Jinping and the party state are building that they are relying on as they um, work their will within these international institutions that the international community relies on to, to deliver global public goods and how they think about this system beyond their kind of innate suspicion of it, but what they believe they need to do in terms of how to make it, um, their, their utilitarian approach to it, I guess I would say. Um, when we talk about things like the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative and the Global Civilizational Initiative, these are the three um, main documents and, and kind of the, the pillars, if you will, of what supports the shared future of humanity for all mankind. And so you've seen as these three um, initiatives have rolled out over the past five, six years, that Chinese scholars have been writing about them in earnest because that's what happens when the TIFA comes down from the top, the scholarship then blossoms around it and builds it out and makes it into to something more. But the fundamental um, 
message that comes through, even in the Global Civilization Initiative, is very clear about, A, the, about, first of all, first and foremost, the global ambition that, that underpins these things, and that this is not, I mean, there is a lot of, I think early on there was a lot of question about whether this is more about, you know, propagandizing inside China. There's always an element about that. I mean, I think that, you know, everything the party state does is about preserving the party state it's, and its right to continue ruling China. That's always the first and foremost priority of the party state is its self-preservation at the ruling heights. But this, the fact that Xi Jinping sees a need to go out, as, as Jude said, and, and work within these institutions and reshape them in ways that make them more conducive to China's success and to the party state's success specifically, um, is, is indicative of, of how, how they're thinking about this. And so I think that when you look at these, um, this global ambition and this lattice work that they're building that is both ideological and programmatic, it's not just you know, speeches and papers that they've written, but they're implementing it through on-the-ground activities, both inside the UN system and inside the multilateral system, as well as developing new multilateral institutions that we all are familiar with, whether it's BRICS or SCO or these other China-centric, um, the, the AIIB, the, their multilateral bank, um, the, the things that they're doing to build, not to not only infiltrate and rewire the, the global existence, system, but to build a parallel system that with China at its center and at its core is, you know, that they're doing both of these things at the same time, I think is very important for us to understand. And that the whole goal of all of this is, is to advantage the party state and its totalizing authoritarian system. Um, and and it's, it goes beyond just, you know, as, as, as Andrew and Jude both said, being defensive and rejecting the premise, but they are trying to rip out the existing wiring and inject new, you know, inject a different way of thinking about these issues, whether it's human rights or development. And I'll give some pretty specific examples. And I think, you know, when it comes to, for, for instance, development, which is a really important, they've tried to elevate the right to development as the most important human right. And then, and in doing that, they've also worked very assiduously within the UN system to conflate the Belt and Road Initiative with the, um, with the sustainable development goals that are the lifeblood of the UN and everything that the UN is supposed to be doing right now. And this effort goes to, you know, more than about 30 MOUs with UN agencies, funds, and programs that were secretly done between um, Chinese government agencies and, and institutions and UN bodies that have still never been disclosed to, um, to other member states. Um, special slush fund, um, slush funds that they set up to basically bribe the Secretary General um, through things like the UN Peace and Development Fund and their, their, the way that Chinese nationals who work in the UN system are, take the direction from the party state and not from the system itself as international civil servants, which is what they're supposed to do. And so you can see, you know, we, in, 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 the, in the U.S. policy context, we talked a lot about the three C's and, and, and also in, in the domestic policy space about how Chinese influence operations work that through co-optation, corruption, and coercion, the same thing happens in the U.N. system. They co-opt people and member states and they, and they corrupt people in member states, and if that doesn't work, then they turn to coercion. And they do this across the system. When it comes to the human rights um, pillar, which is, you know, a, this, a, the, what we've been talking about and what we're supposed to be focused on here, you see this with the, the replacement of the norms of human rights, the fundamental idea that human rights attach at the individual level, which is what the whole human rights projects since, um, primarily since the end of World War II and after the Holocaust, 
um, has been based around this idea that human rights attach at the individual level. They are not something that states give. They, they are, you know, they, they belong to you because you are a human, not because the state sees fit to give them to you. China has now decided that no, we reject that. And, well, they've always rejected that idea, let's be very clear, because of Marxist-Leninism, as did the Soviet Union at the time, but they were kind of pressured into going along with it because they were the outliers, and they got what they wanted with the inclusion of economic and social rights in the UN's, um, you know, penumbra of rights. But what China has done is say, we don't like this, so we're going to just fundamentally replace the whole concept with this idea that rights are something that states control, that states decide what your rights are, states give you your rights, states can take your rights away. And when we're talking in the international context about human rights, that um, it is not for civil society or the victims of human rights or the survivors of, of um, abuses to say what a human rights violation looks like or even experts to say what it looks like. It's for states. It's for governments to decide, and only for governments to negotiate among themselves and with each other about what the measures of accountability is. It's a very state-centric view. It's, a, it's an exclusively state-centric view of human rights. And you can see where that runs into, as, as Jude notes, that how this is diametrically opposed. I'm going to be very, very undiplomatic. This is diametrically opposed to the way that the United States, democratic countries, and the whole human rights project sees the idea of human rights. So it's, it's a huge problem, but they've been very successful because the, the, there's an appeal to this. Um, and I think we have to recognize that this does appeal to a broad swath of, of countries, um, governments in particular, especially authoritarian and want to be authoritarian governments. They, they don't need to be co-opted into this because they believe it. They, may, they don't have to be communists. They can be left wing. They can be right wing. Doesn't matter, but if they do want to be able to, you know, abuse their people with impunity, then they're going to buy into China's narrative about human rights. They're also going to buy into the, its state-centric, state-led model of development because that allows them to control public goods and 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 the means of being able to control the population. So there, there's a, a huge appeal out there, and often Beijing has numbers when it comes to votes in the UN because there there are a lot of authoritarian countries out there, and we're in a democratic recession that's been going on for now 18 years where we're where democracy is um, under stress and under attack around the world through coups and um, and there's no it's no coincidence that this has been escalating and happening at a time when China is pushing out this ideology together with partners like Russia and Iran so I think we do have to recognize that that this is what is happening and and be more alive to the, the nature of this threat. I think that, you know, one of the things that I will go back and, you know, give, give everybody a little bit of grief about from the 90s when I was working on the Hill doing human rights, and I don't know if Sophie Richardson's still here. I'm going to name check her, but, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. And I will say that from the beginning, that going back in the, 90, in the mid 90s, the human rights community saw very clearly what the Chinese Communist Party was all about and was always very concerned about this idea of change through trade and had real reservations about it. And, you know, I think that to understand that, I, but over the past, you know, my, my experience of nearly 30 years working on these issues in U.S. policy, the human rights community is routinely dismissed as a bunch of, you know, bad wedding activists who just, you know, are, are a bunch of, uh, you know, unrealistic people, when actually I feel like the human rights community since, tends to be the most realistic because they see what these regimes do. And I think it's really important for policymakers to center these, um, to, to listen more to human rights communities and human rights activists and to communities that are being threatened by these regimes in order to really see more clearly what these regimes are all about. And and, and so I think that that's really got to be an important part of how we address this. The other thing that I think that we need to do is really accept the fact that we have some fundamental asymmetries when we're operating inside the international system here. China is willing to throw whatever resources it needs to things like the Human Rights Council and um, other bodies in order to work their will and achieve their goals. Whereas we often, as, as Andrew very pointedly noted, do not do that. And there are so many nodes and places within the, hum within the international system that they can find these you know, technical bodies and all of these 
you know, obscure entities within the UN that otherwise we don't care very much about. But China goes into these um, bodies and, and is able to co-opt them and take them over just because they show up and are active and throw resources at them. We can't duplicate that, but we've got to be smarter about how we engage these systems, figure out what our priorities are, where we do need to put resources. And if we're going to actually do things like call a vote and put forward a resolution, we've got to be serious about it. We've got to put in at least a, you know, a similar level, if not you know, the same level. When Xi Jinping was calling around countries on the Human Rights Council resolution, you know, we couldn't even get an assistant secretary of state to call people. And we didn't, it, it was pathetic. So, you know, of course we're not going to win that vote. And half, I, I know for a fact that some countries weren't even called that were gettable. And, and, and so it, we've got to do better on that stuff. And we've got to take it more seriously. And, and, and then when China does violate the norms of behavior in the international system, there have to actually be consequences. We have to stop exceptionalizing China when it comes to these things. They get away with stuff in the UN that nobody else would, um, bribing people for and, and requiring them to take pictures of secret ballots and send them back in order to collect their bribe, all kinds of things like this that there's no consequences in the UN system for them. They need to, you know, you need to have diplomats reject, you know, de, you know, kicked out. You need to have them not be allowed to run candidates. You need to actually have consequences if they're going to violate the rules blatantly the way that they do. And that's got to be, you know, something that we all have to, and we've got to find ways to communicate with countries outside of our little bubble of the U.S., the EU, Japan, and, and, and get them to understand that this damages them in ways that they don't, you know, they don't see because they're getting something up front from the Chinese, but they need to understand that how this damages them, that if these institutions don't work, that they're the ones that suffer for it. And I'll end with that. <laughs> well said. Now I'd like to introduce Matt Turpin, who is the Hoover Institution Visiting Fellow specializing in U.S.-China relations and China Program Chairman for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He pre previously served in key China policy roles in the National Security Council as an advisor to the Secretary of Commerce. He has served over 22 years in the U.S. Army, including advising the Joint Chiefs of Staff on China. He assisted the Deputy Secretary of Defense on Innovation Policy and was the Chief of Crisis Planning at Pacific Command. Matthew Turpin is a grad, has graduate degrees from UNC Chapel Hill and West Point. Thank you, Matthew. Well, Ambassador Bremberg, thank you um, for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be at, a, at an institution and an organization that's been doing some, I mean, really important work for the years. and particularly honored to be with my, my two friends on the stage here today. Um, I wanted to, um, I, well, one, I'd, I'd say I doubt that you're going to see much disagreement uh, between the four of us. Um, so I'm going to kind of bat clean up here um, and kind of bring home some of, the, I think, the regional implications of how um, human rights issues are playing out within certain countries um, the way that's playing within a broader policy framework um, and, and some implications that that has, I think, for us in, into the future. Um, so as a, as, a, as a former policymaker, um, I think you know, I've always sort of viewed the job of thinking about China policy across three primary buckets, right? There is one bucket of sort of our broad sort of economic relationship. There is a, a bucket of, of, of national security and military um, issues, and there's, a, there's an entire bucket of sort of human rights issues. And in many cases, those, those three remain in tension um, in policymaking, not only in the United States, but, yeah, I mean, this is not news to anyone in this room, but it, it, it remains in tension across, you know, governments across the world as they, they balance their various interests um, and have to think through what they're, what they're going to do and what they're going to push for. Um, and so I, I wanted to sort of lay out what I think is sort of playing out not only across the Indo-Pacific region, but, but, but also sort of other regions. Um, and I see this as both sort of an, a, a, a glass half empty and a glass half full uh, perspective. So from the glass half empty perspective, um, you know, I think we should be very clear with ourselves that, that 
the consideration of human rights issues still does not play a major role in the way in which countries uh, think about their relationship with the PRC, um, you know, not only in the United States, but, but, but certainly in the region, uh, as we watch this play out um, for, our, for our friends in Europe, um, and certainly for, for countries across what we, would, what we would broadly call the Global South, um, is, that, is that our expectations of, of a desire to stand for a broad uh, rules-based international order built around a concept that the individual has inherent rights. Um, we have not seen sort of the governmental uh, willingness to, 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 to pay uh, particularly high costs to defend that. Um, I think in many cases there's an assumption that that system will maintain uh, itself, right, that that it is self-evident that it will simply maintain itself, um, and, and that that's been, and we've seen a real deficit of efforts to be able to sort of make, uh, uh, make efforts to maintain it. Um, and for many countries, um, I think you know, the idea that, that their economic uh, interests outweigh those things, those are simply uh, you know, uh, trade-offs that they have to make uh, in order to weigh on that. And for many, they had, they had assumed that there were not particularly national security uh, 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 interests that, that had at play. Obviously, the behavior of the PRC over the last few years has begun to change that equation for a number of countries. Um, but, but we are still sort of moving along that spectrum. And so that's, that's my glass half empty perspective on this. My glass half full is that, that of course, Beijing's actions have created a, a degree of pushback and a willingness to start to consider what those things are. Um, so obviously in, in Beijing's immediate region, um, you have a number of countries in which uh, taking actions that, that had been sort of unimaginable years before, um, you certainly have them beginning to speak out. And, and I, you know, I would look at, at Japan, where you know, 40 years there had been an unwillingness to sort of speak out loud about what uh, Beijing was doing from a human rights perspective, and we have started to see some actions by, by the Japanese ruling party to begin to bring those things forward uh, and begin to take action. Um, certainly, you know, following what happened in Hong Kong, um, I think you know, Taiwan has been much more pronounced uh, in differentiating itself um, and, 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 and making sure that it is sort of uh, uh, you know, accentuating you know, what it does in terms of human rights and democracy and differentiating itself in a much more clear way. And as we look at, at civil society movements like the Milk Tea Alliance and things that had risen you know, over the last decade uh, from, a, uh, from across sort of South and Southeast Asia, you can certainly see some inklings of that. And, and, uh, and obviously Beijing's actions around Hong Kong fed into that, that whole narrative um, and so you're starting to see that build. Um, we see a little bit of this ac across Europe. I mean, obviously, we have a long history of, of, a, of a strong European human rights uh, movement, but in, but in many ways that is starting to erode at, at, at the economic interests that, that some had felt uh, fondled, der uh change through trade was, was the, way, the way to approach this. That is beginning to erode. Um, and so we, we, should, we should view that there is some, some, some sort of hope uh, to be seen there. So, so I, I, think, I think there is a reason for us to be somewhat optimistic of the kinds of things that could be done into the future. And so I'll close on um, kind of what I think is likely to happen into the future um, and how the role of human rights will play in policymaking as it goes forward. I think you know, one of the lessons I would sort of draw from this is um, it is unlikely that efforts in the human rights domain is going to have a direct impact in changing Beijing's behavior. I think we should be very clear that, that we are unlikely to play that kind of direct role in, in convincing the Chinese Communist Party that its most deeply seated and deeply held uh, beliefs about how it should rule and how it should operate, that they would question that and reverse that based upon our persuasion, right? I think we should be very clear that's unlikely to happen. Um, you know, particularly when they don't see that there are costs in those other realms, right? So as, as long as there aren't costs in those other realms, it's unlikely to change their behavior. Um, but we should be optimistic that, that 
our efforts within our own domestic political systems can have, can have effects on creating those kinds of costs, right? And so obviously the, the panel that preceded us around, you know, around the weaker force labor uh, prevention act uh, is kind of one example is that, is that the, the, the job of that kind of community that, that is, that is pointing to the kinds of very real abuses that are happening um, has an impact upon our own systems and the actions we might take and that those create real effects. Um, and, and that's the area that I think we should be sort of most focused on, and it's, and it's how we should maybe approach this. And, of course, the cumulative effects of Beijing's actions continue to build, and it makes it extremely difficult to hold on to the vision that folks might have uh, of, of, of a convergence and a softening of the party. And I, I agree with Jude that, that um, I am not particularly worried about the sort of the Marxist economic system that, that, that the party brings forward. I am particularly worried about the Leninist sort of system that, that, that the party is, is, is reinvigorating. And that, I think, we, you know, by, by identifying that sort of real political effort to reorganize and then to essentially remake the world in the image of being able to sort of protect that Leninist system uh, is the thing that we should be most concerned about and that we can build a, be a degree of consensus around that. And we are early days on that, but, but it is something I think we should be somewhat optimistic about. So I'll, I'll stop there. All right. Um, I'm, at this time, we're going to go around again and invite uh, participants from the audience. If you raise your hand, we can give you a note card to submit questions. But in the meantime, I'm going to take my moderator prerogative to ask questions of my of, of our panelists today. And I'm going to be honest at the outset. I'm going to look for really specific tactical answers. And I'm not joking. I'm not letting you off the hook, okay? All of us have had opportunities to serve in public policy or observe how policy is made. So I've got a different question for each of you, but just know I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a real point here. And this is all time stamped. This is not policy answers from three years ago. And this is not policy answers that might be the answer three years from now. But, but you know, this is 2023. Where are we? What's going on? So, Jude, um, one, I just wanted to say, I'd never heard anyone say the idea that if you imagine what happens in Taiwan after seeing what happened in Hong Kong, it would actually be worse. I hadn't heard that articulated, and that really hit me. So, um, you know, when we watched the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong, obviously I think that was a deep policy issue that the CCP has driven towards for years. My personal belief is that the timing of it may have had something to do with the global pandemic and the world being very distracted to limit you know, criticism. But my belief is that we saw a failure of an opportunity by, I'd say, the United States and much of the international community to actively respond that there would be consequences for a violation of their you know, Sino-UK agreement of one country, two systems, and that the consequences were not real or not substantive. So um, you're going to get an opportunity to answer this one of two ways. So, so either if you want to Monday morning quarterback and look back <laughs> at so what happened after 2020 on the national security law, what should or could the United States or in partnership with other countries we should have done, or um, my more interesting one is what do you think is something we could or should do today to actually send a response signal that the lessons they may have learned from that they shouldn't apply in their thinking about Taiwan going forward, that you know, any approach they take to that is going to actually meet with something. So what, what's something you would have done or think we should do now to correct that framing? This is why I don't like very specific questions, because I, I don't have as much room to, to fudge. Uh, um, let me uh, – door number three is I'm going to sort of combine the first two, because um, – uh, these are just sort of my observations rather than a grand theory of the case. So number one is, you know, we had heard data points from um, companies operating in Hong Kong in the lead up to the announcement of the national security law by the MPC Standing uh, Committee that they were getting um, some pings from Beijing and local Hong Kong officials basically saying, by the way, something's coming. Don't worry, it's not about you. 
It's for the rabble rousers. We want you to stay. We're, ju- we're going to hold your hand through this whole process. I take a few things away from that. Number one is I sometimes think we do ourselves a, a disservice and, and overestimate the, where we can impose costs by sometimes just saying, like, look, Beijing doesn't care what the world thinks about these things, right? Or they don't care. They're just going to do what they're going to do. I understand why we're saying that, and there's a, there is a, an element of Beijing fundamentally when it feels like its security is at risk, yes, then it, it, it is less concerned about global reaction. But in this instance, I, I think those little anecdotes indicate to you that actually Beijing's calculation was we might not actually pay much of a cost for this, right? And that's, those are two very different theories of the case because I, I feel like we have more room and space to impose costs, whether those are reputational, financial, economic, political, um, if we do understand that I think Beijing does care about what, what the world thinks of it. Not totally, not everywhere, not maximally. Um, I don't think, again, on some of these key issues that even if we get a global sort of coalition, we're going to be able to shape some of the core uh, calculus that, that Beijing makes. But I, but I do think it means we have more room and agency than we give, our, give ourselves credit to. Um, so, you know, that's just sort of observation number one. Observation number two is, and, and this is a, 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 a fluid thought because we're currently writing a report based on some fact-finding trip there in, in Hong Kong to try to get a sense of how bad, thing, how bad are things. Is this one country, one system? Is this one country, 1.3? Is this 1.8? And what are our options now? And, and so I'm in the process of working on that. I will just say something which, which folks may or may, may not agree with. Um, I'm not sure it is helpful for Hong Kong, or put it, flip it around, I think it may actually be more beneficial to Xi Jinping if we continue to maintain uh, a narrative here that Hong Kong is just another mainland city. I do understand why we're doing that. We're basically trying to say, look, you, you can't have it both ways. Um, so we're going to deny you the fiction that Hong Kong is some sort of separate entity because it does still have special privileges. Um, but, but I think after spending a week there, if Hong Kong is sort of stuffed away in a quiet corner where we're not thinking about it here, that actually works to Xi Jinping's benefit because, number one, it still is an offshore dollar clearing market and financial services firms are more than happy to be there. Some of them are worried at the margin about personnel safety. You know, some of them have moved to Singapore, Tokyo, but you're still going to find a lot of these offices op- operating there. Um, so, so Beijing sort of still gets a lot of the benefits of Hong Kong, but Xi Jinping feels like he has a dark corner where he can continue to con- salami slice where he can continue to expand his national security vision. The, the security authorities are building a, a building in Kowloon that's supposed to have a staff of 900 working in the national security space, um, which, which will be very much uh, Perry Link's proverbial sort of anaconda in, in the chandelier, the mere site of that building. So I think I'm not getting a specific answer as you, you would like, partly because I don't have it yet, but I am beginning to reevaluate um, the idea that it is helpful for us or Hong Kong to, to say it is just another mainland city, um, I think that's probably a, a we've, Xi Jinping's probably in a nice sweet spot where you still get some of the tangible benefits of Hong Kong without the U.S. government really focusing on it day in and day out and finding areas where we can we can continue to put pressure by observation and scrutiny. And I think the final thing is, and this is more of a general comment. I'll shut up after this. Um, If you think about Hong Kong, but you also think about the mainland China, this is a rare historic opportunity for the United States and the West to take advantage of a brain drain that is being driven by growing frustration on the mainland, whether these are from Chinese entrepreneurs, genuine entrepreneurs, you know, who bought into a value proposition that this was going to be a country where you got wide latitude to start a company, scale it quickly, move it out. These are not all people getting industrial, you know, uh, policy subsidies, a lot of these are, are what we would purely think are market actors who cannot exist in the Chinese ecosystem and also understand that, that now being a Chinese company is a liability in the global market because, because of Xi Jinping, we can't make any clear delineation between what is private and, and what is a state-backed actor. That's not our fault. That's their fault for basically creating a blurred ecosystem where those articulations are impossible. So I think you, you, you're, there's a moment now, like we saw, you know, uh, as a result of, of the Nazi regime, where we had a lot of, you know, Jewish scientists, Jewish entrepreneurs who were looking to leave 
uh, and come to the United States. We have something similar there. And you hear a lot of that. A lot of people are leaving Hong Kong. They would love to have a better path to entry here to the United States or the U.K., Unfortunately, that gets caught up in our immigration debate, which is a whole other kettle of fish. But I think it is worth continuing to articulate the opportunity the United States and the West has more broadly to take advantage of very smart, capable individuals who are looking to leave an increasingly autocratic political system and come to a place where they can thrive. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions that have come, so I'm going to try to ask uh, <laughs> Ambassador Curry and Matt to answer my questions, because I really like my questions, too, uh, really <laughs> concisely. So, uh, I will try. Kelly, so when, when I met with the Chinese when I was in, at, at the UN, we talked about human rights, and they were very clear. They said, well, we went along with your whole Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the way you all defined it when you were powerful and in charge. So. We're very confused. You're being very rude. Now that we're trying to reshape it, now that we're, you know, powerful, like, why are you being so rude? It was shocking to me because like, I thought, no, we, we, we discussed this. This wasn't an imposition. This is what we believe to be true. And that, that was just obviously very foreign. So, but what, give me one thing. You're, 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 you can pick any job you want, wherever you are in government, right? But what, what's the one thing you do to say, how, we, what is one tactical approach the U.S. could take or lead to push back on this approach to redefinition of human rights exactly how you laid out what they're doing, what's one thing the U.S. could do, you know, to try to push back? You know, these aren't silver bullets that solve all the problems, but a discrete action we could take to try to push back. Well, I think it starts with us being willing to defend the ideas in the first place and do that robustly, because I don't feel like that's something that we are always willing to do, um, whether it's in the UN spaces or here in our own domestic political um, space. And so I think that that's where it's got to start, is with a, a kind of recommitment of, of our own to these ideas and stop temporizing them and stop, you know. One of the things that, that used to frustrate me, and, you know, I'm a human human rights lawyer. I've been working on human rights for nearly three decades now. And I, w one thing that frustrates me about the human rights movement is the, for, for years there was this lack of awareness that the citadel of human rights, the fundamentals, this you know, basic idea that these rights are in, inherent and attached at the individual level has been under attack from the Chinese Communist Party. And instead of recognizing that, and, and rallying to defend against that, that very existential threat, the human rights community has been splintering into ever more, you know, spe specific and, and more targeted. And you know, there have never been more people working on human rights in the world than there are at this moment and doing a, just pardon me, his poor job of actually defending them. I mean, you have so many human rights organizations that are so narrowly focused on their narrow little issue that they're missing the forest for the trees. And this is a huge, huge problem within the human rights movement. So I would actually tell the human rights movement and, and civil society, and I saw this over and over in Geneva, and I'm sure you did too, and in New York, where these organizations are so, you know, they're, they're focused on these particularist things that they're working on, and, and they're, but they're not, like, dealing with this, you know, huge threat that's looming over them. And it's a very kind of frustrating situation to find yourself in as, as someone who believes in, in, this, in, these, in this project and wants it to succeed, to see the very people who are supposed to be at the vanguard of it, you know, out, you know, like, I, I'm going to date myself with, like, Monty Python references. They're out there galumping with their coconuts, <laughs> you know, conquering new lands when the citadel is under attack. I'm like, what are you doing? So I would say that. Like, that's where we've got to, like, regroup in a sense and kind of pull ourselves back to, to basics. And we talked a lot about getting back to basics on human rights when I was in the UN, working at the US mission to the UN, and, and then subsequently at the State Department. But it's really difficult when the, the whole system is working in the other direction. And, and most of our closest allies are also kind of working in that direction as well. Thank you. Matt. So 
I, I agree with you. You've got me convinced. We will not convince the CCP <laughs> of, of, the, of their mistakes in understanding human rights and the rightness of the universal understanding of human rights approach. But as you said, but we can take actions in other spheres and spaces to have impact and influence. So, so give me one. Right? So, so what, what is an action you think we could take that, at least in their minds, we could do to, to connect? To their you know, violations in human rights, yep. and try to get you know behavior modification is the kind of <laughs> phrase I, li I like to use sometimes. Well, um, I'll start with. I mean, Jude did have a specific suggestion, which I think is an excellent one, which is and and that and it's it's not as if the the it's too late, um, but take advantage of of the brain drain, right? Um, I mean, we have on average about. 40 to 50,000 Chinese become naturalized U.S. citizens every year. Um, we could probably increase that by three to four fold. Um, let them let them come. Let's let's show that that the Chinese people actually vote with their feet. That they actually would like to be here, not there. Um, they'd like to build businesses in their lives and everything else here, not there. And let's. Let's show the world that, that that's that's where it, it actually can work. Um, you know, I, I think you know another one that I'll sort of build off of of of, of Kelly's remarks is you know fundamentally, um, I, I think it's important for for sort of the human rights community not to put their faith in organizations that cannot achieve those goals because they're member they're based on member consensus. Right? I think we should be very clear about what, what we built the United Nations to do. We built the United Nations to be a meeting ground for various countries to be able to come together and, and maintain peace and stability. We've added a bunch of other things onto it, but, but fundamentally that's what it's built around. Um, and so we shouldn't expect it to do things that are governmental, the things that require sovereignty and the passing of laws and various other things. I think we should be very, we should be mindful about what it can do, right? It, it can achieve a place, to be a place, a meeting ground for various voices to come together and to talk and to figure out and negotiate what you might do to resolve really difficult and thorny problems. But it cannot take the place of the sovereignty that those various nations have that, that come to it. The idea that, that somehow they're going to surrender those sovereignties to that body is unrealistic. And so we shouldn't put our faith in that. We should probably look at using governmental power to impose cost on things that we find to be deeply, deeply problematic. And that's, that's the action to take. And I, I mean, to be honest, that we, we have started to do that, yeah. and we should continue to make that happen. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. So we have lots of questions. Let me let's see where we go through them, and uh, I might try to send one to anyone individually if I don't get a volunteer. So, um, <laughs> where does human rights sit in the current U.S. administration's priority list? Where should it sit on that list? Softball. Oh, gosh. Um, so, they talk a lot about human rights being at the center of their foreign at the center. policy. <laughs> but um, the reality is is quite quite different from that. Um, and, and, look, I... I I'm not a child, and I have worked in, in policy positions in the United States government, and, and I'm, I know that, that there are trade-offs to be made here. But my general view, to the, to the extent that I have a you know, theory of everything, is that when we're making, you know, when you're at the State Department or the NSC and you're trying to work through a policy problem, you, you do, it's not like there's some immaculate choice out there that allows everything to work out sunshine and bunnies. That's never, never the reality. You're usually choosing between one bad choice and, a, you know, another bad choice, bad choice. And you're trying to figure out which is the least bad choice. And when we're doing that, my, my tendency was always, well, which one of these bad choices does the least violence to our values? And let's try to go with that one, shall we? And, you know, it, it's not a high bar, you would think. To, to do the least amount of violence to our the values that we as a country espouse both domestically and and when we're standing on the international stage but it can be shockingly hard and it is actually not usually the outcome that we end up with um, and so I would 
I, I try to be realistic about, but I, I would just like to see them actually try not to sublimate human rights and human values and human dignity to things that they think are, are giant existential threats that maybe are 50 years around the corner down the line instead of things that are like right in front of us. And I'm speaking of, of like climate change and how, you know, climate change has, for instance, been elevated to the most important national security, human rights, economic issue of our time. And I'm like, okay, I mean, sure, I, it's not that I don't believe that it's a problem, but I think that it, it does create a lot of tensions that are unnecessary when it comes to the already difficult struggle of trying to integrate human rights um, concerns and thinking about human dignity and, and how you address these issues into complex policy problems if you layer that on top of it and make that, that everything also has to be the most, you know, has to have some climate change impact on top of all of that stuff. It just, it really makes it too hard by a factor. No one else wants to jump in. I'll go to the next question. <laughs> Given Beijing's leverage across BRI countries and global institutions, how does Washington increase its leverage in, in, f with those countries and in global institutions, and how long will that take? Hmm. Why don't you start, oh. you, I'll, <laughs> um, and I'll jump in. So, you know, one thing is, uh, and although it, you know, we have have right now the, the BRI forum in Beijing, and, and you know, they've cajoled uh, a large number of countries to come. I think one first point is um, the conversation on BRI in China as an investor is shifting. Um, and, cert and, and a lot of this is a little bit of nudging from, you know, the West to try to bring more transparency and the media doing a lot of reporting. Matt and I were talking about this earlier today. A lot of this is local journalists in Africa and Sri Lanka, who just by, with very little resources, are, are trying to tell stories to educate and, and, and shape the discussion there. Um, this is also because China can't help itself and always gets greedy and, and so has become its own worst, worst enemy. Now, that being said, I think the, 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 you don't continue that thought, therefore, to say, well, then therefore, no problem. As we saw you know, from Xi Jinping's speech yesterday, at the BRI forum, it's now about smaller and smarter, right? Strategic investments, right? Really starting to now shrink the pool so Wanda won't be buying bowling alleys, you know, in Canada with BRI money, but it will be making sure BRI money is more at, more attunely behind strategic imperatives and objectives that Beijing has. So you might expect more focused BRI money in Africa, you know, helping to support relationships where, you know, access to critical minerals, rare earths are, are important, right? Supporting extraction industries. Um, you might also see it, use it as diplomatic, you know, financing to create diplomatic leverage in key relationships across Southeast Asia. I think our problem is, again, to reference a conversation Matt and I were having this morning, where um, y you'll, you'll, the administration um, will say, on the one hand, like we saw in Secretary of State Blinken's speech, that China is this massive, critical, the most uh, um, important challenge for the United States. But, you know, we don't really have a trade strategy, and we can't because, you know, domestic politics. If you do think this is a heaven and earth challenge, then expending political capital to be able to lead and articulate the case for why a functioning, you know, put your shoulder in trade and investment strategy uh, around in China's neighborhood, that's an imperative. That has to be done. I think the second thing is we start things like, you know, build back better world, and then we don't really, we're, we're kind of, it's the kid with the shiny object, you know, and then it's IPEF, and now we've seen this new overland corridor that the administration has, has announced, which I haven't heard anything since that. I don't even remember the name of it. Yeah. I don't even remember that. We have the Blue Dot G Network. GPII, I think. And, and there's yeah. a war in the middle of it now. So, you, know, you know, you had the Blue Dot Network, <laughs> which again came out. There yep. was a, a, some press release. So part of this is also just picking a strategy and reinforcing it and staying behind it. If it's IPEF, fine. It's IPEF. That's all we're going to get for now. I could understand that. Um, but then let's make that the strategy and let's continue to build on IPEF, make that our sole point of focus and do what we can, given the constraints on with domestic politics here, to find ways to buttress it. But it's 
you get this surge of activity and then they back off and now we have a litany of five or six of these initiatives. So I think a common theme here, at least I'm hearing, is it, it's not that we're putting our best foot forward and losing. And that actually is a reason for optimism. China wins where we don't show up. More often than not, it's where we don't show up with our A game. And that to me is the glass half full of this is not done if we start to take this seriously politically and strategically, if we start to use all the tools we, we have now, if we start to forge the tools that we'll, we will need over the next several decades, I'm very confident that we're in a much better position. We have a much healthier, healthier political and institutional system. We have a much healthier set of alliances and partnerships. We're just using them at about 32% efficiency. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's yeah, obviously we, we have just sort of different systems, uh, very difficult for us. Um, you know, most of our, our, our infrastructure investment and that kind of stuff is a, are, are private decisions. Um, you know, we want to use government dollars to enable, to guarantee loans. We want it to do those sorts of, sorts of things. Um, and we want to ensure that it's not used for corrupt purposes. And I think you know, if, if Beijing's main priorities as it becomes focused and strategic is to ensure that certain political leaders remain inside their orbit, that's what's going to, that's, that's going to become much more critical to what Beijing is doing. Um, you know, we're not going to build sports stadiums in the finance minister's home district, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're just, that's not what we're going to build. And if, so if that's the measure, then, then, then we're, we're not going to we're not going to win that that argument. We should be thinking about what is the other way in which we we're able to do this. Um, you know, so pressure on 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 Beijing's you know, absolute refusal to join the Paris Club and to be transparent about debt and those sorts of things. I think that's something we should continue to press upon um, and be as public about as possible. Uh, that rep responsible powers, responsible world powers, you know act in ways in which they are very open and transparent about the debts that are out there and they figure out how to be able to do this within the rule of law rather than negotiate secret contracts uh, with government leaders and then and then hide what, what all that is at. I think like that's that's an area we should be pressing upon. You know, create institutional costs or reputational costs around what that is, because we're we're not going to we shouldn't get in the business of of, of how we can outride people. Yeah, I mean, we don't win a race to the bottom. I think that, that's, that that's been made very clear and that we can only win a race to the top. And that, that why, that's why we've got to lean into where we have a strategic advantage, which is on high standard things and, and setting both setting and living up to our own standards around things, whether it's infrastructure projects, how our companies treat people that work for them in countries around the world. I mean, we've got to hold our companies accountable for how they treat their local employees and how they take care of the environment in the places where they work. We want to be the, you know, the, the partner of choice. And right now, you know, it, we're not. I think that we've also got to look at organizations like the World Bank, for instance, where it takes an average <coughs> of 27 months to get a project approved at the World Bank. Two years and three months to get a project approved at the World Bank. And they still can't meet environmental safeguards and social safeguards, even after that. And so we've got to like look at the institutions we rely on as that we think of as our first multipliers, whether it's the, the World Bank, which we you know have a majority share in, or some of these other institutions that we have outsourced a lot of our um, development assistance and a lot of our development work to and, and say, what's the value proposition for us? Are we really getting what, you know, what we expect out of these organizations? Are they, or have they, in the case of a lot of the international financial institutions, become subsidizers of the Belt and Road, where, you know, they're going out and, and providing, doing these projects after 27 months, and Chinese companies are winning all the bids. And, you know, and then and having all kinds of issues around that. And that's U.S. taxpayer dollars paying for the Belt and Road. I mean, it's really quite a quite a thing that, that the Chinese have figured out. It's quite a racket they've, they've managed to, to establish. But talking to countries, talking to our partners about what, you know, one of the 
simplest, smartest things we ever did was sending lawyers to countries that were negotiating Belt and Road contracts so that they would be able to do a better job of negotiating their contracts with the Chinese. Like we did this in Burma and it had a huge impact. And like these company, these countries often, they don't have the capability internally to get themselves in a better position to use their own leverage. They have, and I think that's the other thing is that we have to recognize and they have to recognize, these developing countries have to recognize they have leverage. It's not a one-way street with China just dangling money in front of them. They have things that the Chinese want, and they need to understand that they have leverage and use it and push back on adhesion contracts and bad deals. Thank you. I just want to add to this point that Kelly and Judy raised at the beginning, of, you know, the expenditure of political capital, diplomatic capital, you know, the example of the lawyers. I mean, we have a great foreign service. We have thousands of lawyers who work for the gov federal government. Let's put them to work advancing <laughs> U.S. interests and combating China. That's a great example of it. Across Instead of the sitting in embassies writing cables it, nobody reads. Exactly. Across our diplomatic space, we've had huge opportunities where I always said we could tax the Chinese um, a aggressive approach in other countries just by standing up and just speaking, helping advise in the, in the multilateral space, doing, I mean, the simplest things of side events, resolutions, letters, Are you votes. saying we should outlawyer them? Absolutely. We Absolutely. Outlawyer and outwork them. them. Every time we did any event, they spent 10 times the political capital yeah. twisting arms of their, you know, partners, which aren't, you know, close friends, to basically exhort them to sign up to their side. So even if the letter we, we did had fewer signatures than them, they expended 10 times the political capital we did to do it. We Raise need to do that costs. every day, every week, across the space, both bilaterally with other countries and multilaterally. Sorry, I had to jump in on that point. <laughs> um, another question. So could we comment on China's penetration of Latin America, particularly its bilateral relationships with the autocracies like Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, in addition to their BRI um, initiatives in the region. You know, what, what, and how should the, what should the U.S. do to respond to this as a growing national security threat? Well, I mean, obviously, Beijing has a global footprint, um, and so, um, I mean, unfortunately, the picture in Latin America matches the picture we have across Southeast Asia, and, and um, so um, I'm, you know, I'm. I'm you know, at least, at least we know where they are, and we can now kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of everywhere. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure I, I can add much more to, um, you know, a specific Latin America angle. Um, we have a number of countries that are more than happy uh, to welcome a sponsor uh, to help them push back against the United States. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I don't think we've done a a particularly good job of laying out uh, why that's not a good idea for them, and so um, we're 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 a bit challenged. Um, I, I still think that that probably our best um, approach is to play to our advantages. That that in fact you you know, how do you set up an international system where an individual country gets to make its own decisions um, and can maintain its own sovereignty. Um, but, but early on, Beijing is making it seem as if there are no strings attached to these, to this, to this new relationship, and it's it's obviously pitched in a in a in a narrative in which it's allowing those countries to push back against U.S. influence. Um, you know, I think I think over time we'll see that there are in fact significant strings, um, and but 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 it's going to be difficult for us to sort of. Uh, make that case until it actually manifests. And this is the similar to my, my to the to the sort of the earlier question you had around and sort of Hong Kong of what what would what should we have done? The reality is is that until the destruction of Hong Kong's autonomy happened, it's difficult to imagine how you would put together the people who would stand up for doing something about the destruction of Hong Kong's autonomy, right? And so. Unfortunately, we, the, in many ways, you kind of have to let th these things will have to play out to build the political consensus to be able to take action to defend it. I would add, though, that 
you know, in Latin America and the Caribbean in particular, I think we, you know, as we see where they're going to be more, you know, smarter and more strategic, it's going to be continuing to focus on countries that have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. And we need to do everything we can. You know, we know those countries are targets. We know very well, but whether in the Pacific Islands or in Latin America or, or Africa, those, those 13, it's now 13, right? Those 13 countries are the frontline states on a lot of this stuff. And not because they have critical minerals, but because they have relationships with, they have a diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. And so we have not, we, we can foresee what that looks like. We do know what their playbook is in those countries. Those are countries where we can be a little bit more on the offense and not just being reactive and defensive, but really like working with Taiwan, working with, with civil society in those countries, and, and really like using our whole diplomatic toolkit and, and all, of what, all of the things that we have at our disposal, not just do it 30 percent, but maybe these should be the places where we should be saying, okay, can we get above 50 percent and actually like deter some, some bad things from happening? Because at the end of the day, yes, we can't, you're right, Matt, but we need to think more about deterrence and how we deter them from even trying to do certain things by making sure that we've got our ducks in a row in key places where we know they're coming. Like, it's not a secret. We know this is where they're coming. And we should be able to get our, our business in order here in these, in these small number. It's not a huge number of places also. Uh, I want to get to a question that was directed at Jude, but if someone wants to jump in. Uh, I had previously mentioned the No Limits partnership between R Russia and China now, and this question is, what is the likelihood of an enduring and stable cooperative relationship between China and Russia? It seems the potential areas for disagreement and distrust are great. That's quite an quite a understatement, but yes, so what, what's your perspective? Yeah, I welcome the thoughts of others. I, I, I guess I, I – this is one of those interesting Rorschach tests where <laughs> – I think everyone in the city around this town looks at it and sees something different. When I look at, I don't know if you saw the footage of Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin walking out into the hall yesterday, the two of them together and about 15 feet of dip space between them and, and the rest of the leaders, um, I, I think I, we um, are focused on the, the liability side of the China-Russia equation. I think we should be much more focused on the asset side. Um, you can go a long way in a strategic relationship when at its core it is defined by a sense of aggrievement and shared purpose that the – I don't like using the word Western order. I, 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 I'd like to find the, the liberal international order is a fundamental threat, um, and, and that will gas the car for a very, very, very long time. Also, I think it's important to remember that this relationship has been going better um, for longer than the Sino-Soviet split lasted. Since 1989, the Russia-China relationship has been steadily improving as they've been able to solve border issues, right, sign a treaty in 2001. You get the extra dollop of frosting that is Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin having a, a very, very strong personal relationship. But even before those, Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, this was a relationship that was seeing shared interests in solving problems and beginning to think about how they could strategically align. The fact that, you know, we, we look at this no limits partnership and say, well, that's ridiculous. Obviously, there are limits. Sure. The fact that they're willing in, in, a, in a big diplomatic statement to say that there are no limits is more important to me than the fact if there are actually no limits. They're sending a strong signal to everybody, including people within their own system, to say, that we have a, a strong shared strategic rationale to coexist and to find ways to play a more active role. As Xi Jinping said to Putin when he was in Moscow, comrade, there, there are profound changes unseen in, in a century going on right now, and we're going to be the ones to drive them. And, 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 of course, both Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have read their history. They understand that if they allow themselves to be divided – that really bad things happen to both of them. Yeah, I mean, we're like, like openly like, yeah. talking here about whether we can split them as if they can't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> or that they haven't, like... Or they don't like, know like, what that they, looks like. They don't like. understand, yeah. like, what yeah. happens yeah. when yeah. that happens. I mean, so it just seems to me that we are, we are not thinking through... What we're, we're being very wishful about yes. what we would like to see happen. Yeah. We would love to see them divided. But, of course, they know that yeah. and will do whatever they need to do to paper over those sorts of things uh, to, to, to come to some sort of a consensus. 
to look at what they both view as the principal adversary. Yeah. A marriage of convenience and, can last a very long time. And yes. I would add they've got a couple, you know, deeply problematic junior partners that they can, you know, keep spinning up to cause us problems and tie us down in Iran and North Korea, not to mention our, our little friendly neighbors down here in Latin America. And so they've got a lot being being spoilers, being, you know, being pains in the butt, they can do a lot to to really screw with us. And and we need to like recognize in a lot of cases that's what is happening, that they are spinning up problems like, you know, treating us like Gulliver and just trying to tie us down and, and create and benefiting from us being tied down. Now I'm not gonna go all bridge Colby here and say we need to pull back and only focus on China, but Sorry, that was not a very nice thing to say about my friend Bridge. But I think that we do need to understand what's going on and have a strategy that, that accounts for this and is not a blinkered kind of wishful, wish casting approach that thinks, oh, well, you know, they'll, they'll break up eventually and this can't go on, so it won't. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's not, that's, that's more faith based foreign policy and hope being their strategy. It's not real. I know we're, we're almost right at the edge of time. There are a couple questions that just pointed to the ideological framework for like for one minute. Does anyone want to jump in on the ideological aspect, both in terms of how they're using it internally within their country, how they're trying, attempting to export that in terms of what we see in terms of inside the United States? Any aspect just on how there's this idea? People have talked about the, the nationalist, the Marxist or Leninist components of it, but does anyone want to? Well, I'm when, more afraid of the Stalinist components of yeah, it, frankly. That, that, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a deeply anti-liberal, yes. right? This, this deeply anti-liberal uh, manifestation of ideology. Um, obviously, there are there are aspects of that that touch our own domestic societies, um, but they are representing that there is a challenge to what is presumed to be a broadly liberal-based world. Meaning, and I, I mean this by limited government, that individuals have rights, that they're sovereign, that their governments serve them. A rejection of that ideology of something that looks anti-liberal, right? And of course, we've seen anti-liberal ideologies in our past. Um, and we should be very, very concerned about that. Um, but, but, so I, I would see it in, in that sort of light. Um, you know, not in, you know, this isn't a, uh, you know, there isn't essentially a pulling out of, of, a, of a Marxist playbook that is the thing that they're following. Um, it's much more basic. Yeah. Yeah, they're not left wing or right wing in their preference of partners, I will say that. Like, right. I, I think that there's a tendency to believe that they would prefer to partner with left wing authoritarians. I think that they are, in that sense, equal neutral. Opportunity. They're equal opportunity. As long as you're a dictatorship, and you are on board with the, the basic, you know, idea that popular sovereignty is overrated, then you're, you can be part of their coalition of, you know, authoritarian, anonymous, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> well said. Please join me in thanking our panelists and concluding this panel. Thank you all for your incredible attention this morning. Attention this morning. We now have lunch served uh, over in this corner here, so please enjoy. Bathrooms again are around and through the hall down this way. Thank you.
finished the luncheon, and we're going to begin our next panel. So if you could please finish up. You can leave your uh, plates at your tables and come to the chairs. Others will, others will clean. We'll start in five minutes. Thank you.
Thank you all very much for your diligence in getting to your seats for the next panel. That will begin imminently. If the speakers could please come to the table to begin the next panel. My second one. Yeah, okay. I read a panel in the before times. Oh, okay. The before times. Yes. Do you want me to start with you? Yeah, I'll, just, I'll do a quick intro, like, you know, right. we're here on the second day of BRI, trying to say everything's great. Is that true? You know? So and then, not true. Yeah. And then you guys would have, what would we say, like five? No, I didn't know it was my, I didn't know I was supposed to be watching. Oh. 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 Okay. 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 Are you are you introducing me to, or am I just cold opening? Okay. Sure, sure. She gotta be around here somewhere. I don't know what he looks like actually. There he is. They were just looking for you. Professor James Feinerman, if you're in the room, you are needed at the oh. I apologize. Welcome. I'd now like to introduce the moderator, Josh Rogan, a well-known com columnist at the Washington Post. I think his name precedes him. I'll turn it over to him to moderate the panel. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So nice for me to be back here at the China Forum uh, in person uh, with all of you. Um, I know you guys are all following the news, and I don't know if you have the same TikTok algorithm as I do, but mine is all about the BRI summit in Beijing. Uh, it's the second day of the summit, and according to all of the official uh, announcements and pronouncements, uh, BRI is going great. That's what the Chinese uh, government says. Uh, apparently, China is open for business, something that I've heard a lot on my social media and in my official uh, uh, statements. Uh, is that true? Is that really the case? You know, I, I, I think we should unpack that a bit. I think we should take the next hour or so and just kick the tires on this idea that, uh, you know, everything's fine with regards to the Chinese economy and the business environment inside of China and the investment climate inside of China and the relationship between our financial institutions, our banking institutions, our uh, business institutions and our government institutions and how they interact with the Chinese Communist Party, the Chinese government, and the Chinese private sector, which are increasingly all uh, becoming intertwined. And, uh, you know, what, maybe there's some evidence that maybe the official statements don't actually match the facts on the ground. I mean, again, I'm not the expert, we have a great panel, but just for my cursory sort of amateur look at the uh, news coming out of China. I noticed a couple of things. Um, the foreign minister disappeared. The defense minister disappeared. The <laughs> top bankers are disappearing. The top tech executives are disappearing. Um, the economic data is disappearing. Um, foreign businesses are being raided. Foreign executives are being arrested. The State Department, again, just sort of coming through my inbox, I noticed this, issued a level three travel advisory for the entire country of China, which encourages Americans to reconsider even going there for any reason because of the threat of unlawful uh, arrest. 
hoarding of commodities, uh, manipulation of data, the economic numbers, the unemployment numbers. I don't know. Again, I'm not the expert. But even I can sort of see that maybe there's another side of this story. Perhaps we should, as a community and as a country and as a sort of uh, society, think about what it means if it's not true. What if the BRI is not the rousing developmental success that they claim? What if the Chinese economy is not as stable as they assert? And what if the business environment inside of China is not as ri riskless as American institutions and executives in Wall Street firms seem to want to say it is? So we have the perfect panel to talk about that today. And I'll, we're going to start with a an expert on BRI, Elaine Dzinski, a senior director at the Center on Economic and Financial Power at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Uh, we also have with us Jim Feinerman, a professor of Asian legal studies and faculty director at the Georgetown Center for Asian Law. And, of course, Mary Kissel, the executive vice president and senior policy advisor of Stevens, Inc., and the vice chairman of RxO and a, a former senior government official. Uh, Elaine, let me start with you. Based on what I said, is, do you think we might want to take a look at this whole BRI thing? And uh, you know, what does your the data show you? Tell us what you what what you see ten years in. Thank you so much. Oh, thank thank you. That's the, like the per the perfect entree. We, <laughs> we have a a, a report uh, coming out in the next couple of weeks on BRI at ten years. Um, that. We'll go into these issues in a lot more detail, so we'll have that up on our FDD uh, website. I would encourage you to have a look at it. Uh, I've been following the BRI for more than three years now. Uh, it started in uh, 2019 when I was doing a lot of work on the anti-corruption agenda and realized that BRI was uh, using corruption as a component of its model of coercion, of extension of Chinese influence, and undermining Western rules and norms, particularly in the development space, at an alarming pace. Um, and unfortunately, I think that has continued, despite some rhetoric from uh, Beijing uh, to the contrary. Uh, the BRI is anything but what Xi Jinping has, has described it and how he uh, set this out uh, 10 years ago, which was uh, an infrastructure development program that was going to be clean, green, and transparent. Uh, it's really none of that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a debt-inducing mechanism to extend Chinese influence around the world. Uh, and it's happening through different vectors. Infrastructure is a very good way to extend influence because it involves uh, a number of things. Um, first and foremost, uh, providing, ostensibly providing infrastructure that many countries uh, need uh, and need urgently. Um, secondly, it's an opportunity for uh, Beijing to export the, um, uh, uh, the uh, implements of construction uh, from steel to Chinese labor to technology that can be used not only to support these projects but also to build um, surveillance capabilities in other countries uh, and turn uh, uh, civilian infrastructure into dual-use infrastructure. So uh, it's very crafty <laughs> in terms of a strategy and an approach. But if, if we're going to hold uh, the program to account based on the aspirations of the program, uh, as, as she put them out, um, it hasn't really met any of those objectives. Uh, to be clean, green, and transparent. What it has been is a huge um, success for Beijing in terms of wielding political coercion and, to some extent, economic coercion. Uh, COVID put a bit of a, uh, a dent in that strategy in the sense that uh, Chinese debt added to uh, uh, balance sheets all over the world that were already uh, in peril, and now we have a situation where many BRI countries are facing levels of debt that are untenable. What's interesting is that Beijing seems to have some really good ideas about how to get to the front of the line to get repaid um, or to renegotiate terms to their, in their favor, meaning uh, they may be uh, able to renegotiate a deal with country X, may be willing to do that, but they'll probably do it at a higher interest rate. So there's a real level of extraction 
to all of this. And I think, uh, you know, we could talk about this for a long time, but uh, what, I would, uh, what I would say we have to really focus on is calling out the coercion, the extraction, uh, and the corruption. Uh, because these are the elements that should not sit well with uh, citizens, no matter where, uh, no matter where, where they are. Uh, have we done a good job of, of engaging in that narrative, discussing that narrative uh, from the U.S.? I'm not sure it's where it needs to be. And I know in the last um, panel there was some discussion about some of the initiatives that have moved forward in the last couple of years, whether that's the launch of the Global Partnership for Infrastructure Investment, the Blue Dot Network, some other things. These are all moving in the right direction, but we really need to put our offer on steroids, whatever that offer needs to be. And I, I don't think it's matching one-to-one -one in terms of China's uh, infrastructure investment. First of all, we probably don't have the money to do that. But secondly, it's not necessary. What we need to think about is strategic engagement and how to do this better to deliver, uh, frankly, what China can't deliver, which is high-quality uh, infrastructure that leads to more economic development and more stability and ultimately a more peaceful environment. Uh, so uh, what we've heard over the last couple of days is quite interesting. Everyone expected that at this um, Belt and Road Forum at the 10th anniversary, the acronym BARF um, <laughs> <laughs> probably didn't get um, reviewed by a uh, native English speaker. But uh, <laughs> there are, 100 and, I think, 110 countries who are present and some 20 world leaders. I mean, it's a significant uh, event. Uh, the dates were held close uh, until I think they were announced officially sometime last week. And of course, Putin has been there uh, uh, and kind of is the shining, the shining star. But uh, but they've they've shifted the narrative a bit. Uh, so uh, they've they've said that um, the CCP um, she has said, okay, we're going to continue to fund BRI. Uh, they're opening up a 350 billion dollar uh, uh, RMB, excuse me, uh, financing window. Uh, they will also inject another 80 billion into the Silk Road Fund. So. They're continuing to write checks, and I think that's important. We shouldn't uh, overanalyze the fact that 110 countries showed up. Um, it may not be because they like the new um, aspiration of global order, uh, global development, uh, you know, other uh, conversations that are happening. Uh, as long as the checks are being written and there's an opportunity to continue that, that, um, uh, that uh, negotiation, people will come because there is a huge need for infrastructure, uh, even more so uh, post-COVID. So I think we have to just be a little bit careful and circumspect around uh, the attendance. And then, of course, from whatever's coming out of this, the narrative can shift quite easily. BRI, I mean, part of the reason it's worked so well is because it's been so uh, uh, poorly defined. So uh, it can kind of be anything that anybody wants it to be. It's an infrastructure project uh, for some. For others, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a political or geopolitical uh, engagement. Um, for others, it means something different. So we should expect that this narrative is going to change, shift. I totally agree with a comment from the last panel that, uh, that uh, China will, will move towards conflating BRI with the Sustainable Development Goals, linking into that broader global discussion. By the way, if you look at BRI from the context of meeting SDGs, there's absolutely no connectivity between the two. Mm. So it really is a conflation of that uh, narrative. There's really not much behind that. Uh, there's also now um, more conversation, or at least coming out in the last day, around creating uh, a system of compliance around BRI projects, uh, ostensibly to build integrity. We haven't seen much of that over the last 10 years. I don't know how that will shift. Um, but as, as, as Beijing looks to push the BRI into a space where it's more broadly owned, uh, potentially by the UN, uh, other countries coming forward, the problems within BRI become everybody's problems. And maybe that's part of the strategy that it's not just China's corruption. It becomes everybody's problem. Uh, so those would be my initial thoughts and reactions uh, from, uh, from what I've seen. Well, thank you. I'm not sure if that's scary or reassuring or both. <laughs> uh, but let me, before I move on, uh, follow up on one thing that you said. You said that we should put our offer on steroids. You know, I've covered it a little bit. It's called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. 
you know, when I travel to Asia, and I have four or five times in the last year, they, they're not that enthusiastic about I find a lot of, like, hmm, you know. And what do you think? What do you, what's your take on it? Is it a an alibi for a real economic investment strategy? Is it a small step in the right direction? Is it the beginning of something? Does it hold any value that you can detect? Um, I, I do think it holds some value. I think we have to start somewhere. Um, it's it's going to be a multi-pronged strategy, and it's not just a, a response to BRI. It's really a response to a shift in terms of a global rewiring of trade, uh, of uh, alliances, uh, the role of democratic rules and norms. All of these things need to be considered. It's not just about responding to um, to infrastructure. So. Uh, I think there there is some potential. Um, I, we need to look at these trade um, engagements and alliances in different ways. Uh, I've done a lot of writing on this concept of ally shoring. Uh, so bringing democratic rules and norms along with um, an, uh, a rethinking of um, supply chains, moving out of authoritarian regimes for critical uh, uh, capacities and moving elsewhere. Um, it can be somewhat painful. It depends on what sector and what technologies we're talking about. But um, being able to rely on other partners in other regions, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, um, will become that much more important. Excellent. We'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in a little bit. And I do want to say that we're going to leave some time for questions. So start percolating your questions now. And so they'll be good ones. Uh, let me skip over you, Jim, and go to Mary next, because I think uh, this segues really well into sort of the. Sorry, Jim. I thought yeah. that was the order. Yeah. <laughs> so don't worry, we'll have plenty of time for all of you. So uh, the US China economic relationship, this is something that you worked on under Secretary Pompeo, and now you're working on the business community. My recollection from the last administration was that uh, the Wall Street firms in the chamber and mm. the bulk of the tech industry uh, was dead set against, you know, uh, sort of increasing its uh, attention to the what seems to be the rising risk of doing business inside China and doing business with Chinese firms. Now that you're on the other side, tell us what you have seen from your interactions with the U.S. business community, what you're telling them and what, you, what your analysis is of the uh, investment and economic climate inside mainland China right small, now. Small questions. Yeah. Uh, great. Well, I, I, before I do, I just want to say thank you uh, to VOC um, and to the staff for the invitation. It's the first time I've spoken at um, a VOC Memorial Foundation event, and I'm just really honored um, to be here and to, to sit alongside Wayne and, and Jim, who are really true experts um, in their fields. Um, I'm here, if you're wondering, uh, because it doesn't seem to make much sense. Uh, I'm here, as Josh said, as someone who's had a lot of practical experience, um, uh, especially with China, um, as an editorialist like Josh, as an observer, um, as a policy um, maker behind the scenes, and now back where I started in the uh, investment community. Um, and I just want to follow up really quickly on what Elaine said, because there was an enormous amount there that was fascinating. Um, but, you know, for us uh, in the administration, we, we saw BRI as a the beginning of the alternate economic system that China was attempting to build. And one of the things that we really struggled with was, you know, what is the right response that plays to America's strengths? And we didn't want to become China. And in fact, American private investment vastly outstrips um, the total BRI investment around the world, which you know, we never really talk about, but that's true. So the question was, okay, um, how do you properly align incentives so that the business community will be incentivized to come in and build those bridges and roads? And it was very frustrating to us because we'd, we'd go to places like, for instance, we went to stopped in Ethiopia and Senegal, and they had these just trash Chinese projects. I mean, really terrible. No one liked them. They broke down. Awful. But they said to us there were no American companies that came in to bid. So we didn't really have any choice. We needed to build the road. We have domestic political incentives. And so that's something that, Elaine, I think you're absolutely right, that we haven't really grappled with. The Blue Dot Network is not going to solve this problem, and we don't actually want government to solve this problem. Anybody who's worked in government knows that's never going to work. And anybody who's worked at the State Department knows that the economic part of the State Department is probably, well, that's not going to work either. So just as we've done in the past, I think when we confront these complex problems, 
um, as a democracy, we work through them in stages, like we did with the Patriot Act. Everybody thought that the world was ending, and then Obama came in and he tweaked it, and then we never heard about it again because we had a bipartisan consensus on how to attack it. And we just haven't gotten there yet, I think, with, with the BRI. Jim, you're nodding. That's a good sign. <laughs> um, it, but I think, you know, we will. The question is, do we have enough time to do that? Now, Josh, I, I'll just say this briefly. I don't want to talk for too long. So you asked me, um, you know, how does the business community view investment in China? And, in fact, the title of the, of the panel is The Price of Profits. I just want to say really quickly, I'm very pro-profit. Like very pro-profit. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I might even get a clap in the audience. Um, I'm just not pro-profit um, with enemy states. So that's really the core of our problem here. And the United States government has not deemed China an enemy. We have a ridiculous nonsense of a policy, which is compete, cooperate, cooperate, compete, and confront. Well, what the heck does that mean? Which one is it? What day of the week is it? How do I feel? What's the situation? I don't know what that policy is. Well, neither does the U.S. business community and neither do U.S. investors, and they've never been asked to think about politics of China or the nature of the regime, and that's what they're struggling with. So they know there's a problem, um, but there are different types of investment in China. There's hot money that goes into the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, perfectly legal still, to, to, to buy on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And for many investors, if you're investing $150 you know, billion and you put a percent of your portfolio into the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, who cares? That's diversification. That's fine. But you can pull that money immediately. Much, much harder for Apple to rip out you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of plants. You know, and what about everything in between the Fortune 100 company? and the button maker who has to be in China because it's such a low-margin business. Those are the businesses that get it. Those are the companies that are asking, how do we get out? When? How are we going to find an alternative? Where do we go? What's the U.S. government policy and instruction? So it's a very complicated, very difficult issue. Again, very pro-profit. But I think most of the American C-suites and boards understand there's an issue. They're just... They're grappling with the how and the when. I hope that answers your question. Sure. No, it's a great uh, beginning. Before I get, move to Jim, let me uh, zero in a little bit on w to get your opinion on the Biden administration's approach to this. Because when you were in government, uh, there was a lot of activity uh, on um, um, Huawei. There was a lot of activity on capital markets. There was a lot of there were tariffs. They were controversial. There was a phase one trade deal. I'm not going to yeah. relitigate the whole. Right. Trump saga, but what surprised me about the Biden administration's economic approach to China is that they didn't get rid of any of the tariffs, and in fact they didn't, uh, you know, seek to really undo any of this, the vast majority of the things that you guys put in place. At the same time, their actual activities have been pretty limited. I think mm. we've got the tech uh, 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 restrictions, outbound investment restrictions on AI, supercomputing, quantum compu computing. Uh, we've got the small yard high fence. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, outbound uh, investment restrictions. And we've got, I mean, not the semiconductor restrictions. That's basically it. What do you think of how they're doing? What do you think of where we are? And uh, how do you process that, having put in place some of these things when you were in government? Yeah. Well, actually, not, not widely known, but there was a small group of us who had all lived and worked together in China and Hong Kong, um, uh, never really got talked about, but Kelly, who was just on the last panel, and I were at State, and I had known Kelly for 20 years from living in Hong Kong. Randy was at DOD. I had known Matt from Beijing. Um, I was on the editorial side. He was on the, the, uh, the news side. So there was a, just an unusual group um, that just so happened to come together at that time when you had a president who was really concerned about the uneven even playing field and we had cabinet officials who, um, like Bill Barr, who speaks Mandarin, um, had worked for Verizon, so we actually understood the tech of 5G. So, um, yes, I mean, it, it, this was a transitional period, but the, I think we did wake up the country and the world to the threat, and that's, you know, the first stage of, you know, admitting that you have a problem. Um, but we were never going to, to have the grand strategy. That would have been unrealistic. I think the Biden team came in, from what I understand, 
And, you know, there were many people who uh, worked for places like state um, or uh, were defense attaches in China or naval attaches, and they knew exactly what was going on. So sort of, you know, the middle to the younger generation in the U.S. government gets it. They were followed around. They were roughed up. They didn't like being surveilled. They hated that they couldn't just go out on the street and talk to people. They saw what the nature of the regime actually is. And so what I think happened is that the Biden team came in and said, we want to try a different approach. And then I think the staff said, um, have you seen uh, how they've responded to us when we've tried to do outreach? And so to their great credit, they did AUKUS. They have continued the uh, efforts with the Quad. They've done quite, quite a lot that I think is really excellent in the region. But we also have partners that are completely freaked out. That's the technical term that are begging us uh, to do more. Um, so I think their instinct to, to talk is very strong. But ultimately, I think the tidal wave of capital that has left China and is going to India, and the fact that Taiwan has invested more outside China than in it, um, you know, those shift in capital flows and people, eventually, uh, you know, the U.S. government will, will wake up, or God forbid there's a conflict, and then we all wake up. Um, and their approach changes. But, you know, it's fascinating to see the U.S. government push for more engagement while, you know, the people that I'm talking to and working with are trying to get the heck out. Right, right. Well, that's a perfect segue into a talk about the capital uh, markets, and that, which is Jim's specialty. Uh, I, just a very quick comment. I, I, I largely agree with you. I think that there were a lot of people who uh, wanted a continuation of a transition to a more competitive uh, China strategy inside the Biden administration, but in my reporting, it seems like in the past six months, those people have uh, lost the initiative and uh, that the people who want to return to engagement strategy have the ball. And that's for a variety of reasons we could get into, but a lot of them have to do with the elections and the president. But uh, maybe that's another panel for another day. Jim, uh, on, when it comes, this is kind of a perfect segue, actually, because when I started talking to the Biden administration, China officials, about the capital markets problem. They said, what are you talking about? They didn't know about it. They weren't, in other words, they didn't read my book, you know, <laughs> and I sent it to them. And it's in there, all of it, even Mary's in there. Right? And they didn't look at it or get the audible or anything. So, and then sure enough, now we have like, you know, the CCP committee led by uh, Congressman Gallagher and Congressman Raja, and, and they're doing this work and they're sort of unearthing it again and bringing it to the fore. Well, it's been three years. Hmm. Three years of lost time, three years of lost opportunity. But to be honest, what I find when discussing this is it's really important to set a baseline of what we're talking about. And I was wondering if you could just start with your basic brief on what is this thing called the capital markets problem with China? How did we get to this point and why is it so important and why is it such an important thing to talk about? Well, I guess there are two ways of looking at it. One is... Um, we saw China, and this is going way back uh, to the late 1970s when China first opened up, uh, as this you know potential you know wonderland of, of future foreign investment and uh, and also economic development that was going to enrich not just the Chinese people, but the rest of the world that was going to be able to invest in it. Uh, and there was a Chinese proverb at the time. Actually, uh, Mike Lampton at uh, at SAIS wrote a book about this called "Sleeping in the Same Bed and Dreaming Different Dreams." Uh, and so uh, we were almost perfectly at odds with each other in what we were expecting to get. You know, the, the Chinese were hoping to get an infusion of Western capital, uh, a lot of technology, uh, and uh, immediate access to Western markets. And, you know, from the Western perspective, our I ideas were exactly the reverse. You know, we, we wanted to have access to the Chinese market. Uh, we wanted to be able to, you know, cycle um, not late stage technology, but you know, previous generations of technology, which would still seem modern in China, into the Chinese market, uh, and uh, you know, everybody would be happy. The Chinese would get mo modern uh, economic development, and we'd make huge profits. And obviously, from the start, you know, we we just had totally different ideas about what we were going to do, in terms of uh, not just capital markets, but the overall po policy for foreign uh, direct investment uh, in, in China. And, you know, the, the, the idea that today there may be actually more foreign direct investment from China in the United States and other Western countries uh, than there is going into China uh, seems like a real turning of the tables. It was not what we expected at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, somehow uh, over the last four and a half decades, uh, this economic behemoth was created. Uh, and we can't really account for it uh, because on the one hand, it looks like, well, China 
opened up somewhat, uh, but they didn't really open up uh, where things mattered. And, and I think back, for example, to the uh, accession protocol uh, for the WTO accession of China. And there were all these things supposed to happen. There was a working party agreement. You know, China was going to open up its markets. Uh, and in the next five years, they grudgingly, you know, from 2001 to 2006, opened up capital markets somewhat. They opened up, but, you know, in, in the rest of Asia, you know, just across the board in Hong Kong, uh, you know, every major uh, money center bank in the world had branches. That doesn't happen in China. Uh, you know, when, when I've been there successively for, you know, periods to live, it started in 79 when I went with the first group of foreign students. Uh, and the only way you could bank was with the People's Bank of China in a couple of branches in Beijing and other major cities. Uh, and then I went back in uh, 82, 83, and things had changed markedly, and there was beginning to be foreign investment. And then I went back with my family uh, on a Fulbright in the spring of 2006, and you know, China was building up for the, uh, the 2008 Olympics. Uh, and uh, there was a Citibank branch in my wife's law firm's building in, in, in Beijing. But you still couldn't do most of what was genuine banking business uh, in, in, uh, in China as, as a foreigner or as a Chinese citizen who wanted to get access to global capital markets. Uh, and then they built up a parallel economy which says, well, we can create our own you know, entry to global markets. We can create through the People's Bank of China and these entities that we've created. You know, four of the 10 biggest banks in the world are all Chinese banks. Uh, and they've done that just in the last 25 years or so. Uh, and it's, it's astounding to see, you know, how little uh, notice was taken of that while it was happening. Uh, and then all of a sudden it was, well, what, why did we create this behemoth? Why, why, did, why didn't we sort of see this coming? Why didn't we do something that was going to, you know, at least level the playing field a bit more? Because the whole idea of leveling the play, playing field, uh, in my experience, uh, with uh, Chinese counterparts is often very lopsided. Uh, the playing field's never really level, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, it's also a, a question of uh, PRC laws and regulations. Uh, one of the very first laws, uh, actually the very first law that uh, China passed in the reform era began was the joint venture law. It's a 15-article joint venture law, and it basically said, we want foreigners to come and invest in China. It was shocking in some of its provisions, for example, uh, it didn't require uh, more than 50% Chinese ownership of a joint venture. There just had to be a minimum of 25%, uh, maximum uh, minimum of 25% investment. Uh, and, you know, it looked like China was going great guns because they, you know, then passed a wholly foreign owned uh, enterprise law. They passed another uh, cooperative joint venture law when the original equity joint venture law wasn't very popular. Uh, and it looked like, you know, they were taking steps to try and address the concerns that were expressed by both Western investors, but they're also their, their own economic commentators who realized that this was not going to get them to where they need to be. And then I think they made a, a pivot and decided to leapfrog. Uh, they, they decided that, you know, they were going to make the rules for their own capital markets, um, but also, you know, try and push when they could on, uh, on Western regulation uh, wherever it occurred. Um, there was a series of cases starting uh, in the mid-2000s uh, after Sarbanes-Oxley was passed in the United States uh, because you had to, uh, as a foreign company registered in the United States, comply with foreign uh, investment rules that were in Sarbanes-Oxley and the general Sarbanes-Oxley rules uh, about financial statements and things like that. And they said, you know, year after year, uh, you know, please keep us in, but we still can't do this. We're not allowed to do this. And this went on from 2002 to 2013 when the SEC finally brought a couple of cases that got a, a very grudging compliance, uh, which still isn't complete today. Uh, and, and, and the idea that, you know, we're giving them access to our capital markets uh, pretty freely. Uh, we don't have access to their capital markets. Um, you know, they can uh, take deposits from American and other foreign depositors, but we can't take deposits from Chinese uh, families that would far prefer to get the investment uh, opportunities that we have in the United States than what they have in China. Meanwhile, uh, the fact that they're captives of the Chinese banking system means that China has trillions of dollars to invest in all the projects that it does uh, because Chinese uh, ordinary citizens have nowhere else to go. And they've got a 44% savings rate. Uh, so that's a lot of capital, uh, especially with the economic development that's occurred in China. Uh, and let me just mention two other things. You know, one. Uh, 
the uh, human rights abuses that have gone hand in hand with this uh, are, are really quite extraordinary. I know other people have talked about this in previous panels and will later today. Uh, but the abuses uh, that I think are really particularly related to this include things like confiscating property, taking people's uh, you know, belongings, uh, basically you know, evicting them from their houses and making it possible for them to, to, to live uh, in, in Chinese society. Uh, and that, I, I don't think, has been remarked on enough. I mean, there's lots to go around with, you know, with the, the, the uh, previous gulag that China had and you know, the current abuses that, agree, that occur in the Chinese criminal justice system. Uh, and also the utter uh, lawlessness of the COVID era, uh, the idea that you know, they, they, they were willing to uh, essentially lock down uh, the entire country uh, and in a really draconian fashion, uh, and then almost without explanation as to what they were doing, completely ease up uh, when the pressure got too great. Uh, and what did that do to you know, their own domestic economy? What did it do to the rest of the world? Um, obviously, you know, there's books that will be written going into the distant future about how much China knew about what was happening in Wuhan. And I wrote one. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I, I read all the intel. <laughs> and, did I get it right? Uh, it was from a lab. Huh. I guess yeah. I got it now, right. You're never going to be 100%, but based on all the evidence that we have, 99%. Make, makes sense to but, me. But this, this was, you know, uh, I think emblematic of the lawlessness uh, that made it possible for that to happen in a lab that wasn't governed by a any kind of, you know, usual precautionary legislation. Uh, and then covered up uh, as you know, the cases multiplied and a pandemic spread around the world. Great. Well, we just broke some uh, Wuhan origin news. Uh, didn't <laughs> no, expect yeah, that. That's, that's uh, thank you, Mary. Um, for, on the record confirmation, you heard it here. But, Jim, let me focus on uh, you know, the, the, the actions, some would say misactions, of Wall Street firms, the indexes, the banks, the private equity, the venture capital firms. Uh, that are facilitating the, the, the abuse of the U.S. capital market by uh, Chinese state-controlled companies, including comp for co Chinese companies that build the concentration camps, that build the missiles, that build the cameras that sit atop the concentration camp walls, that build the cyber warriors, that, build, that are essentially threats to our national security yet are supported in a various number of ways by MSCI, FTSE Russell, Bloomberg, Barclays. Explain for our crowd here exactly how that scheme works and why is it allowed to survive? Well, I think it works because it makes money for the people who... They explain uh, how. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it gives them access to uh, Chinese markets and Chinese capital, and it also allows China to leverage uh, what the access is that's provided by these you know, foreign entities, which China can ally uh, in the things that it does. I mean, one of the things, this is maybe a, a footnote to all of this, but very interestingly, in 2012-2013, uh, Stephen Schwartzman, who runs Blackstone, uh, got this great idea that he was going to create Schwartzman College at Tsinghua University. Schwartzman Scholars Program, I believe yes. it's called, yeah. Yep. And so uh, they, the Schwartzman Scholars are chosen, it's supposed to be a parallel to the Rhodes Scholars, the Gates Scholars, uh, you know, at Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, so this was choosing people from a bunch of countries around the world, not just from the United States, um, who would study together in this new college that would be established on the campus of Tsinghua, which is arguably China's leading university, although as an alumnus of Beida, I'm not supposed to say that. Um, <laughs> and and uh, the idea was that you know, this was going to you know, build mutual understanding. This was going to, it, it may have done that, uh, and it may still be doing that, uh, despite the you know, pause for COVID. Uh, but it was obviously in Stephen Schwartzman's corporate interest to, you know, get this kind of publicity, and you know, that's something that everyone who's active in the Ch Chinese market is trying to do, and, and do it in a way that both ingratiates them with uh, the Chinese leadership, but also doesn't poison them uh, in terms of public relations in the rest of the world. Right, but I'm not just talking about your regular old payola schemes. I'm talking about American investments being passively invested in problematic Chinese companies. Well, but there, there's a, an argument that, you know, people who do this uh, essentially claim that because of these, you know, passive investments, they're not actually investing directly in these things. Mm -hmm. That they're, you know, they're not taking a, a chunk of the stock of a Chinese company. 
they're investing in a fund which invests in those things because that's where the investment opportunities lie in China. Right. And what's your opinion on that kind of argument? Well, uh, you know, it, it's it's problematic on two counts. One is I don't think that uh, you can, given the fact that we have you know similar kinds of pooled investments in this country, say that anyone who is in any way involved in uh, you know a, a bad investment that's in a pool of larger investments that they're making an investment in is responsible for that and you know shouldn't do it. Um, it's sometimes difficult to get transparency about exactly what the pool of investments is. And China has no interest in saying, oh, yeah, we have this, um, you know, gulag uh, builder that they're part of our investment portfolio. Or um, we have this, uh, this uh, company that's building uh, concentration camps for Uyghurs uh, in, in Xinjiang. But uh, ignore the fact because we're making 17 percent return. Uh, and a as long as the, the attitude is, well, we really don't know about how the Chinese organize their domestic economy and what they put together in these pooled investments. So we're just trying to get the maximum bang for the buck for our investors. Uh, and China seems like a lucrative opportunity, so we're going to keep on doing it. Mayor, you seem like you have something you want to say? Well, Elaine's writing a lot of notes, so I'm, right, well, I'm, cu I'm well, curious yeah. as to what she's, she's well, writing, writing down. Well, I, think it's I think it's important to say, though, why we're talking about this. We're talking about this because... China is building a military to dominate ours. They have a global civilizational security and development initiatives that rhetorically explain their goals. And so Xi Jinping is building a military to dominate us. As he's built it, he's become more aggressive, and he's telling us how he's going to use it in the future. And that's why we care about the price of profits in China, because capital flowing there is flowing to a party state. There's no real private sector. It's not a capitalist economy. And these uh, savings uh, that Jim you know, mentioned, these captive savings, are being put toward funding this military and Xi Jinping's goals. So it's, I think it's really important um, to, to say that. And I don't think that we should underestimate um, Beijing's intent here. It's not just about getting capital to build industry. They're very aware um, of the incentives of our system. And they know that there are Stephen Schwartzmans out there who are – um, suckers for profit and um, p potentially, you know, don't really care that much about U.S. national security. One more thing before I give it to Elaine and all of her notes um, is that I also think it's important to say that there are some firms that never went into China. Stevens went, never went into China. We didn't follow J.P. Morgan and Bank of America because we knew they didn't have a rule of law. Other companies like Motorola got out 10 years ago because they saw the writing on the wall. And, and good for them and for Greg, um, their CEO. Um, so I think we spend a lot of time focusing on the Fortune 100, but, you know, it's not really a complete picture. Um, and I think, you know, to Jim's point about the indices, um, you know, if the U.S. Congress said, or if we finally had clarity in that China policy and Congress legislated and said, hey, MSCI, get China out of our, our indices because this is really bad for U.S. national security, well, guess what? Whatever was left of American investment capital would be stampeding out the next day. Excellent. So you don't think they'll do it on their own without the pushing? I think that you're already seeing – look at the run-up in the Indian stock market this year. A lot of that capital is going, going somewhere else, at least the, the, the hot Singapore? Money. Yeah. Elaine, thoughts on all of the above? Uh, yeah. So I uh, – one of the things that I wanted to touch on was the you know, the legal environment within uh, China, and I think it relates to exactly what we've just heard, which is uh, this increasing difficulty of, of operating according to um, normal market principles, rules, norms, being able to conduct due diligence uh, to understand whether you want to get into a merger, a deal in China. All of this is becoming much more challenging. Uh, and the way that I would describe it is um, a trio. It's going to be driven by a trio of laws, the counter-espionage law, mm -hmm. the national security law, and the national intelligence law. And these laws are somewhat related. They all do something slightly different. But 
The counter-espionage law makes it difficult for companies to gather data and to share it. Um, so to conduct basic due diligence is now becoming very difficult for, um, for U.S. or Western companies, most companies uh, in China. Uh, so that's a real question. Uh, how do you operate if you can't gather data and conduct the basic risk assessment associated with operating in a, in a, in a market, in an environment? So that's the first one. The second one, the national intelligence law, um, requires Chinese companies and citizens to pass on information to the Chinese government if it's deemed of national security importance or of a national interest. So that effectively deputizes Chinese uh, companies, uh, potentially Chinese individuals uh, here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. to share information. So we know a little bit more about that in terms of a response to Huawei, TikTok, um, but you know, there's a lot more coming in this space if we think about what's happening around advanced uh, technologies and automation and AI and quantum. And we're not talking about restricting outbound investment flows. We're talking about, uh, le you know, legitimate companies operating in the U.S. who have access to information that may then be compelled um, to, to share that with the Chinese government. And then there's the national security law, which is kind of an overarching framework um, that um, uh, basically underscores that um, national security dominates over commercial interests. And this will, I think, become increasingly clear in terms of enforcement actions uh, against uh, companies, Western companies in particular, and creating a, an environment that's hostile. So I think there's been some... Um, uh, reaction to all of this, and uh, the Chinese government has taken some steps to respond to this kind of deterioration in the business environment, but it's kind of a strange response. One of the most recent things to occur was guidance coming from, uh, from uh, the Chinese Supreme Court on um, uh, basically anti-disparagement, so cracking down on what can be said um, against um, businesses, against um, private sector entities. It's basically a restriction of free speech as a way to improve the business environment. I don't know how that's going to get um, managed in terms of a risk assessment, but probably not the way that they think it will. Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so these are the kinds of things that are happening that are just making it really difficult to operate an environment. But then again, what do we do? against a set of Chinese laws and regulations uh, like that. What do we do? Yeah. So I think before we figure out what we do, we have to figure out what we agree on is the reality of the state of play of the Chinese economy. And I've seen every analysis. I've seen that, uh, you know, it's gonna, everything's fine. If you turn on CNBC, they're like, oh, yeah, it's a great time to reinvest. It's just a little bump in the road. Uh, I've seen... <laughs> Uh, the sky is falling, you know, sell, 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 it's going down, the Chinese Communist Party is going to collapse. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but I'd, I'd actually like to hear from each of you because I think this is sort of a fundal, fundamental question. Uh, what is going on with the Chinese economy? We see the employment numbers that they still let out, uh, but we see growth. It's not as much growth as Western analysts predicted, but it's still more growth than we have. And uh, we see tr demographic trends. Uh, we see the housing crisis and the real estate crisis and the crackdowns on the gaming industry and the education industry and the, all of these things put together. Where, what is your core sense of wh what, how the Chinese economy is doing and how does that inform what you think the Xi Jinping strategy is going forward? And uh, let me start with you, Elaine, and we'll just go right down the the line. And then get ready with your questions. We're coming to you, all of you next. Yeah. Um, so lots of, I'm sure there are a lot of um, opposing views on this. My sense is that it's a, a, an environment of deteriorating um, uh, market um, uh, principles and um, in, a, an environment that is going to be um, more and more risky, particularly for foreign investment. Uh, in terms of what's happening domestically, you touched on a few of the um, core drivers, but it's a confluence of post-COVID um, risks for China in terms of slowing exports, uh, slow, uh, slow domestic growth, the inability to get uh, consumers to spend, high youth unemployment, the um, major weaknesses in the property market. All of this is uh, kind of combining into a pretty volatile mix. Um, maybe we can't count out that China may take the steps that it needs to uh, to address some of these major policy issues. But so far, they're kind of 
moving along quite quite um, slowly, um, kind of tinkering at the margins as opposed to taking major reforms, major steps around um, uh, economic reform. So I find this interesting. I, I don't know where that leaves them, um, although they may just be able to rely on some level of growth, even if it's not at the levels that they've achieved in the past. Uh, but I, again, I think for, um, for U.S., for Western interests in uh, China, it's going to be a, a rough time. Thank you. Jim? Well, um, just before I came here uh, for this panel this afternoon, I was attending a talk at uh, Georgetown's main campus from Andy Walder, who's a China economist at Stanford. Uh, and interestingly, he uh, was talking, this is research for a new, new book that he's still working on, essentially about the concentration of power in SOEs in mm -hmm. China, which seems to go counter to everything that you know people have predicted for decades was going to be the marketization uh, and you know, uh, increasing privatization of the Chinese economy. And one of the things that uh, he was uh, definitely marshalling the evidence for was that the biggest SOEs have grown bigger and plan to continue to grow bigger. They're consolidating. And they start from the state-owned enterprises that were national taking up their, uh, their competitors and rivals. Uh, but then also consolidation at the provincial and local levels uh, where, again, competitors in a single province are being merged and not necessarily uh, by, by, by their own uh, choice to do this. Uh, and even at the, you know, the local level in municipalities and counties in China. Uh, and so if the idea was that China was gradually, maybe haltingly moving towards greater liberalization, that seems to be belied by what's actually happening. Uh, and then the two other things that I, I think are, are potentially uh, quite interesting, you know, China has been the largest source of foreign students in the United States for over a decade. Just this year, India surpassed China. Uh, and that could reflect a number of things, uh, increasing liberalization of the Indian economy, closer relations between India and the United States. Um, but also, I think, uh, for many of the Chinese students, who are coming still in such great numbers because of the 20% youth unemployment. You know, you graduate from even uh, Tsinghua or Beida, and you're not guaranteed a, a job, and so you put it off by taking an LLM at Georgetown or a, a, an MPP uh, at Hopkins and uh, you know, hope that there's going to be something that materializes in between. But likely this is going to be a powder keg uh, going forward when you have that large a group of people who First of all, I have high expectations that have been focused on them. You know, they're the single child of six adults. You know, two sets of grandparents and their parents. All their hopes and dreams are invested in them. And if they can't find something to do in the Chinese economy, that's just a, uh, I think, a powder keg. Uh, and, and finally, I think that they, they, they still are, you know, whistling past the graveyard uh, with regard to uh, just how uh, dynamic the rest of the world's, you know maybe tardy response is going to be uh, to what's seen now as an increasing th threat from China. Um, I, I, I was not personally a fan of uh, Donald Trump or the Trump administration, but the single greatest thing that they did, uh, in my own personal view, was to focus the attention on the threat that China posed. I think that, you know, uh, from uh, the Clinton administration on, uh, with, you know, the high hopes of getting China into the WTO and uh, making China a team player in the global economy, uh, I think, you know, maybe not initially, but by the second or third year of the Trump administration, there was a pretty clear view, uh, which now I, I would say is filtered into the uh, democratic uh, China establishment as well. Uh, there are still you know, a few happy warriors who believe that you know, things will inevitably get better uh, and you should still pin your hopes on China, but I don't believe that that's uh, the majority view, even among people who were previously uh, quite sanguine about the future development of China. Yeah, I think, I think I largely agree with you, although I would take issue with you starting your blame at the Clinton administration. I think you're letting the George H.W. Bush administration off the hook a little bit. But anyway, that's not really that important right now. Mayor? Well, I, th I think Elaine you know, laid out kind of the domestic economic environment very, very ably. I agree with everything that, that she said. And I also think that um, Jim alluded to a truth that we, we don't speak about enough, which is that um, actually, um, you see the Chinese people who are wonderful, dynamic, and just fantastic people. Um, you see them protest in numbers nationally regularly. 1979 Democracy Wall Movement, 1989 Tiananmen protests, which were nationwide, the 2000 
and eight, Charter Eight movement. Um, you saw the bridge protests. These are only the things that we can see. I mean, our foreign correspondents can't wander around China talking to people. Think of all of the protests that we don't see and the fact that their security apparatus is so immensely large, larger than the PLA, it stands to reason that the Chinese people are actually reasonably and logically quite unhappy with the corruption and the economic prospects that Elaine laid out. And I, to, to Jim's point, you know, we may wake up tomorrow and things may be very different. It could be that the, the, the pot boils over, to use a well-worn phrase. But you're never going to see that through the Chinese propaganda outlets because, as my old editor used to tell me, you know, when you read headlines in, in democracies, everything is bad. But when you read headlines in communist societies, everything is good. And so it also stands to reason that the more they proclaim everything is fine and the more data they obscure from us, the worse it, it actually is. Um, I, I personally see the Europeans getting suckered in as we exit, and that's fine. Um, if Volkswagen wants to bet on Xinjiang and they think their political connections are going to protect them from the risk environment that Elaine outlined, uh, good luck to them. I don't want our clients or American companies doing that, and I don't, I don't think that they will. Um, because I think that the corporate structures that we have here in the United States and the scrutiny on our companies, our public companies in particular, I sit on a board and I'll tell you, it's a lot. You have a lot of people asking you questions about what you're doing and why and rating you and examining you and voting on you or voting you out. Um, so there are a lot of forces here in the United States that are going to force a real stringent examination of that risk profile, which I agree with Elaine, I think is only getting worse over time. On that cheery note, let's go to your questions. I would ask you to please tell us who you are, uh, if you have an affiliation, and if you intend to make a long comment, please put it in the form of a question. And I saw your hand first, sir, right over here. Please wait for the microphone, I'm assuming. No cards. Oh, okay. My mistake. Okay. <laughs> no cards. All right. Pass up the no cards. We'll, we'll do it that way because I would hate to waste all of the no cards that have already been filed. And uh, while she's collecting them, uh, let me ask you one last follow-up question to each of the panelists. We'll have the no cards soon. Don't worry. We've got plenty of time, so we'll get to your questions. Uh, I have to know, right now we're, we're looking at the APEC summit coming up. Uh, Economic engagement is high on the list. We had five cabinet-level members of the Biden administration travel to China. Uh, it really seems like the Biden administration thinks that they're going to make some sort of progress. What, what do you think is going to happen in November at when, if and when Xi Jinping comes to town? How do you think that affects our economic competition and our economic approach to China? What do you think the Biden administration is up to? And we'll go in the reverse order this time. Mary. Thank you. Oh, I mean, I'm not in the administration. But you can keep these short because we're going to have that. I, I mean, I don't work in politics, but I'll tell you that. Um, Someone bring me the cards? I don't think a single meeting is going to change the behavior of C suites and boards across mm. America. I don't think it matters. I think everybody's pretty much woken up except for a very few. I saw Tim Cook was in China, uh, I think, overnight. Um, probably distraught at his earnings and the stock reaction. Too bad. Poor Tim. Um, but, you know, m most of uh, corporate America is just returning to fundamental investment principles, which is, do we have a rule of law, or is our supply chain diversified? What's our currency exposure? Um, can we predict uh, accurately, um, you know, what our revenue is going to be? I mean, these are basic things, and I think we, these basic principles of investing were just thrown out the window. And now we're returning to them. And I don't think a meeting changes that. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think also this may uh, solidify and at the same time uh, provide more public scrutiny of the issues that have already been raised with regard to you know, China's uh, performance and the conditions under which, especially for an organization that's about economic cooperation, <laughs> is going to see how much economic cooperation there is and is possible uh, with China in the current environment. Yeah, I, I generally agree as well. I think it would be uh, useful for the administration to signal clearly uh, a couple of things. 
Uh, one is the um, kind of broader economic strategy of the U.S. relying on other partners, democratic partners. We need to put some pressure on Beijing, a little bit more pressure. Would be a good opportunity to do that. I doubt that there will be much more than an airing of maybe some, some grievances. But what's interesting is that, you know, the government really hasn't, the U.S. government hasn't taken that much action over the last couple of years, but the markets have shifted markedly because that's what markets do. Um, so the most interesting thing will be to see exactly what the market response is um, coming out of this meeting. It's, uh, I think, less about what the communique says and more about, as Mary um, had said, uh, how, w how that messaging gets integrated into the risk assessment for, for companies doing business in China. Excellent. All right. Well, we've got a lot of great questions here. I see we have some uh, doctors in the audience based on the handwriting. Um, but I'll do, the I'll do the best I can. Uh, just, just to get this one out of the way, Mary, because we had a follow-up question. I wanted to know more about your knowledge on the origin of the COVID-19 virus in Wuhan. Uh, what more detail a, can you I give mean, us? That's, I mean, everything that I've said is public. I mean, What's we're not never public? going – well uh, – It's okay now. It's been I, I enough get, time. Yeah. Uh, you're never going to get an 100 percent answer because to have that, you'd need a defector. We're never going to get that. Weren't there a couple defectors? You're never going to get that. Is that a no comment on whether or not there were defectors? You're never going to get that. Okay. <laughs> all right. We gave it a shot. We uh, gave it a shot. But, yeah. but with all of the uh, evidence that has been collected and declassified, um, it's my, my concern isn't just that there have been no consequences, but that it is reasonable to assume that the same behavior is continuing and accelerating. And that means that the risk remains to the world, and that's why we should care about it. And I'm, I'm personally very concerned about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, this is, a, I think, a really interesting way of phrasing it. What level of engagement with China is acceptable for U.S. companies? Mm. Uh, I'll throw that out to whoever would like to take it. Jim, I'm looking in your direction. Okay. Um, well, I think that you know, U.S. companies are sort of They're torn between their uh, profit motive and the fact that, you know, uh, as um, Englishman of the 19th century said, if I can get John Chinaman to lengthen his shirt tail one inch, you know, all the uh, cotton mills in Lancashire will turn for centuries. Uh, and, and so there's always been that aspect of it with regard to business investment in China. Uh, but at the same time, if there's a political risk or a reputational risk that comes from being involved in China or, or particularly having factories or individuals in China, who become cause celeb for the uh, human rights community, mm -hmm. that's not beneficial and that may actually influence some of the determinations they make. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to especially put the burden on American business. I think uh, we, we have uh, other ways in which we uh, may profit or not from our relationships with China. Our universities, for example, depend on full tuition paying Chinese students mm -hmm. uh, to keep the classrooms full. Uh, but at the same time, um, we may not have to make the same trade-offs that businesses will have to do to operate in China. It's interesting because I, we talk a lot about de-risking, but nobody really knows what that means. Are there some de-risking sort of principles that you, that you think can – I mean, let's be uh, constructive. We don't want to decouple with China. We don't want to live in two different worlds. We have to have trade and, and, and cooperation where, where it's – uh, safe to do so. So what are some guidelines for de-risking that ch companies might want to think about that might actually help them to do business in modern China? Alina? Sure. I mean, I think one issue is, is around resilience. Uh, so just kind of protecting the business against uh, the next global shock, whether that's another pandemic or something else, having resilience in supply chains, I think, matters a lot. Um, so this idea of having a China plus one strategy, maybe you're not pulling your supply chains out, but you have some viable alternatives. Um, that's one way to look at it. I, I think generally on the question of what's, what's an acceptable level of engagement, it would be really hard to have one answer for that. Mm. I think it depends on the sector, to be honest. If you're in a business where you're dealing in advanced technology and innovation, anything that is highly linked into um, the U.S. defense industrial base, um, technologies that are going to drive new markets, jobs, et cetera, this, this, is, the, this is sort of the, the, the focus, right? If we look at the outbound investment uh, executive order that came out not long ago, it's really that narrow kind of band of um, of, of technologies that we're concerned about. So 
if you're in those kinds of businesses, I think the risks look very different. If you're in the importing of lawn chairs business, it probably doesn't look that much different at all, and it, and it shouldn't. Um, where it gets tricky is the gray zone, um, dual-use technologies. Um, you know, there's a big kind of gray area out there, so I think the risk profile is going to look very different, and it's hard to answer that question definitively. Josh, can I just add sure. to those comments, which I could completely 100 percent endorse? Um, there, I think there are basic operational issues that boards and CEOs are dealing with, which is we have a China operation. Um, does anybody sitting in China have access to our mainframe in, you know, Schenectady, New York? Um, and, you know, so that is, that, that is, I mean, look at what Sequoia just did. They just gave their China business to their partners, and I think you'll see, um, I think you'll see much, much, much more of that. The, the, the fact that Sequoia split their U.S. and China businesses into two companies solve the problem, or does it just, have, now they just got, you know, a China business and a U.S. business doing the same? Yeah dirt that they were doing before. It's, it's a great question. I mean, speaking of entanglement, which is in the uh, title here of our um, panel, um, let's also not forget that um, there are large U.S. companies that have seen more IP and trade secrets stolen within the United States by um, Chinese nationals or Americans who have been turned by the MSS than they have in mainland China because their guard isn't as high. I mean, look at that lady in Tennessee who was prosecuted for trying to steal the formula for the inside of Coke bottle cans. 57-year-old, you know, nice elderly lady. Well, not elderly. Not nice, <laughs> yeah. Getting close to that. But what's the answer to the, well, what's the, answer to the question? It's Sequoia's gambit here, which is to say, okay, well, we have a China business. Now that's your, your own business now. Uh, does that actually fix anything, or does that just depends on save? How, it depends on how they're operationally structured and hmm. what's the exchange between the businesses and then their people coming back and forth. I mean, there are lots of things. And, you know, what really trips up businesses are the really simple – it's the really simple stuff. Like, do we have a third-party um, operator or contractor whose password is password? Hmm. Those are usually the Russian cyber attackers, right? They're it could be a guy sitting in an India call center. We, we right. don't know. I mean, that, but it's the simple stuff that can really get you. Gotcha. Thank you. So this is a really good question. What, what was the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? What does the response, what can the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine teach us about the potential economic disentangling from China? And if I could just rephrase that, you know, we, we, uh, we've spent a lot of time sanctioning Russia, finding out what works, what doesn't work, but China spent a lot of time finding out what works and doesn't work, and they're not going to be nearly as sanctionable should they decide to go ahead and do something crazy like, I don't know, attack Taiwan. Um, what do we do in that situation? I, I, I think I want to, again, start with Jim maybe on this one. Yeah, uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, on the one hand, uh, if China does attack Taiwan, this is going to be seen, I think, by the international community as far worse, not that it wasn't bad, what, Russia did in Ukraine. Uh, but, uh, you know, they have a contiguous land border. Um, there was a Soviet Union that Ukraine was part of uh, with Russia. Uh, you know, Taiwan has not been controlled by anyone from the mainland since 1895, uh, when the Japanese took possession as a spoil of war. Uh, and so the, the idea that China would launch, uh, you know, mi necessarily military naval invasion uh, to try to take Taiwan, I think, will meet with a much more immediate condemnation and, I hope, a uh, stronger reaction uh, in the Western world. Having said that, uh, it's unfortunate that, as a practical matter, the Western world and, you know, China's neighbors in Asia are probably powerless to prevent it if China decides to do it, uh, even with the uh, military advantages that Japan and South Korea have uh, and that we have with the Seventh Fleet and, you know, our uh, long experience in that region. Uh, if, if China wants to do it, it has the, the manpower, the person power in the Chinese PLA and the PLAN to, to, to do that and has to calculate exactly how much are we risking. You know, when you hear the various estimates, someone says, well, they're definitely going to do it by 2025. And someone says, no, no, it's 2027. Uh, and so he says, no, no, they can put it off until the 2030s. But, you know, it's inevitable. It has to happen. Uh, and you say, well, you know, it's been having to happen for quite a long time. Uh, and somehow it didn't. I remember when I was a student in China in the summer of 1980, I was traveling in a very remote part of Xinjiang uh, in, in a town called Gaocheng mm -hmm. that was hours away from uh, Urumqi and other large cities in, in, in uh, Xinjiang. 
And there was a faded motto on a wall where my traveling companion and I, who's another foreign student at Beda, had to uh, wait for a bus for almost three hours. And so a crowd developed. Uh, and this elderly man came up to us and you know, started saying in, in very uh, broken Mandarin, you know, where are you from? And as soon as we said we were from the United States, he went over and dusted off this wall. And the motto on it was, Woman eating out Jefang Taiwan. You know, we will certainly liberate Taiwan. And I'm like, it, really, here in Xinjiang, you, know, you don't even know where Taiwan is, probably. You know, you're you're 3,000 miles away. But it, you know, it was an article of faith. Got it. Uh, this question is from Chris Orr, senior defense editor for 1945. Regarding the military modernization portion of this panel's title, I guess, yeah, you're right, yeah. it's, it's in there. Um, to what extent is Western business inadvertently funding China's nuclear weapons program and stealth technology? Thanks. Um, Elaine, you want to take a crack at that one? I'm not sure I have a, a credible answer um, for that. I think that's a very good question. Um, I mean, generally, I think we're a little more entangled on uh, some of these uh, technologies than we should be, um, but maybe somebody has a better answer than that. I, I, I really can't say. I mean, one of the things that China was anxious to get uh, early on in the, by the 1980s uh, was nuclear uh, technology for power plants. And I believe that some American companies were providers of some of the technology that went into those plants. Uh, but that was with the idea, of course, they'd be totally for peaceful purposes and that uh, we didn't put the restrictions in that we put in, for example, with uh, Iran about uh, the uh, possible uh, enrichment of uranium that would you know, result from those plants. Uh, but that was a time when you know, we believed that you know, the, the Chinese were peaceful people who had only economic development and modernization uh, on their minds. Yeah, I suppose we are culpable in that we educated many of their nuclear scientists. And um, I will say that one of the great obstacles to a more realistic vision of, you mentioned the pandemic earlier, is the fact that um, you know, we have a great tradition of open science that we've benefited from tremendously. Um, but, you know, I recall asking some of these virologists that we had on a call, have you been to every corner of the Wuhan lab? And they said, oh, yes, yes, I've seen everything. I said, really? Could you testify under oath that you've been to every closet, bathroom, and corner of the Wuhan lab? And they said, oh, no, no, no. But, but we know those people. They would mm -hmm. never do anything bad. And that's the kind of, of, of thinking that we, you know, most of corporate America and the investment class is starting to get past. But there are large portions of academia and the scientific community that have not yet uh, woken up, unfortunately. I think the motto is, uh, to paraphrase a former U.S. president, don't trust but verify. <laughs> uh, please give our panel a big round of applause. <laughs> The next item in the program, starting in five minutes, will be an interview of Tsai Shia, the editor-in-chief of Yibao magazine. The interview will be done by Dr. Adrian Zenz, senior research fellow and China director at VOC, in five minutes.
I'm gonna do her bio. Exactly. Good. Good. Okay. Greetings, everyone. We are now moving to the next item on the agenda. As announced, uh, I will be interviewing uh, Zeicher, and um, I understand that this is an exciting opportunity for conversation uh, and catching up. However, I do ask you to please sit down, and uh, if you need to talk, please keep it to a whisper, because uh, this room carries really well. So my apologies for interrupting the conversation and the socializing, but uh, please do sit down, and we're, gonna, we're very excited to have our next guest here, our exclusive guest. All right. It is changing seats. It's uh, our privilege here today to welcome uh, Tsai Xia. Tsai Xia is a Chinese dissident and scholar of political theory. She was a member of the People's Liberation Army between 1969 and 1978 and a member of the Chinese Communist Party between 82 and 2020. She was a professor at the Central Party School of the Chinese Communist Party from 98 to 2012 where she taught high-ranking members and officials of the CCP, including leading provincial and uh, municipal administrators. During her time in academia, she was often in the Chinese news. In the 2000s, she started to become disillusioned with the CCP and began writing criticisms of certain state actions. In 2020, her criticism of the party and of Xi Jinping led to her expulsion from the CCP. And she has since moved to the United States of America, which is probably a much safer place for her than China at the moment. She has written for Radio Free Asia on foreign affairs and has been interviewed by many media outlets. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have, I'm going to ask her a question, and we're going to have then my question translated into Chinese, and then her response, uh, her response will be translated uh, from Chinese to English. So I just ask you to be a little patient. As you listen to the Chinese, there will be English translation provided. And please do keep it quiet, because with foreign language translation, it's always a bit more tricky to hear clearly what's being said. All right. So I know Zeicher already has a very detailed response, a very interesting response to this question, the seemingly innocuous question. But here it is. So you can look forward to what's coming. My question is. Since the beginning of this year, China suddenly has lifted COVID restrictions. The leadership in Beijing hoped that things would simply return to normal. But such a return to normality seems to elude China, be it economic, be it political. 
From what you have seen and heard about China this year, what are some of the new developments you are seeing in China? Thank you. 好，我们接下来要问的，您的第一个问题呢，就是从今年年初的时候，中国开始突然把这个呃。呃，政呃就是疫情的这个相关的一些限制给取消了。同时呢，北京政府这里的一些领导显然就希望在呃这些疫情的政策取消之后，立刻就可以回归常态。但是呢，这样子的愿望好像没有办法实现。您呃到今年已经听说并且看到了一些中国什么样的一些变化？同时呢，还看到一些哪些新的一些进展？呃，请您从政治跟经济两方面来进行阐述。好，首先感谢大会主持者给我这个讨论问题的机会，谢谢大家，谢谢大家一起来跟我共同讨论。好，这个问题啊，我想首先说，中国的经济和社会情情况，从二零二三年开始，它是全面的恶化，而不是好转。First of all, I would like to thank the forum for inviting me to have this、uh, opportunity to discuss with everyone about topics relating to China.、Uh, first of all,、uh, in concerning the economic and social situation of China in 2023, we have seen deterioration instead of improvement. We this year's GDP growth r a t 对外宣布的是上升了百分之五点四，就增长了百分之五点四。实际上，在民间根据内部就官方内部数据的统计分析 ，GDP 总量是下降了百分之五。Uh, looking at the official statistics、uh, for the GDP growth、uh, of Q1 and Q2 of 2023,、uh, it shows an increase of 5.4 percent. However, if you look at uh,、um, internal uh, sources, the reality is the reduction of GDP、uh, by 5 percent. China's economy, we think, is a three-wheel drive. 就是投资、外贸和消费这三个方面，今年的一月份到六月份是大幅度的下降。呃、uh, ，China's economy has always been、uh, driven by three prongs: uh, its relative, uh, respectively, investment, foreign trade, and consumption. So,、uh, however, for the first six months this year, we've seen dramatic decrease in those three areas. 呃，其中外贸、外贸的贸易顺差，呃，实际上是官方那个公布的是，呃，贸易外贸的顺差的外汇是增长了百分之六，但实际上的数据是下降了百分之十点三。Uh, if you look at the foreign trade surplus, according to the national statistics,、uh, it is a surplus、uh, increase by six percent. In reality, this number should have been a decrease of ten point three percent. 一到六月份，就是中国的投资总额下降了百分之十点四，其中民间投资下降了百分之十六。这表明中国国内就民众他对中国的经济没有信心。If you look at the investment,、uh, the investment was decreased in reality by 10.4 percent,、uh, whereas private investment decreased by 16 percent.、Uh, all these numbers have demonstrated the loss of confidence、uh, among、uh, Chinese people. So. 投资和外贸这两大项加起来，今年上半年是下降了百分之九点八。Therefore, combining the numbers of the decrease in investment and foreign trade, the number will be a, de- a reduction of nine point eight percent. 而消费这一头。在住宅、在那住宿、酒店、餐饮业，小幅增长了百分之五点一。
if you look at the domestic consumption, so uh, strictly looking at uh, housing, hotels, uh, and dining, uh, it was uh, an increase of 5.1 percent. 汽车销售量就是我们讲的那个汽汽油汽车和电动汽车的销售量，今年上半年小幅增长了百分之两点八。In auto sales,、uh, being driven predominantly by EV sales,、uh, it saw an increase of 2.8 percent. 而商用车就是我们讲的挖掘机，它的销售量今年下降，与同期相比下降了百分之四十四。If you look at commercial vehicles such as、uh, tractors and excavators,、uh, It was a reduction in the first half of this year, 44 percent. 挖掘机的大幅度下降，从另一个角度证明了中国的投资在大幅度下降，因为它没有那么多的基建开工建设。Uh, so this number of,、uh, in terms of a、uh, reduction in the sales of、uh, excavators, is、uh, an indication of how much infrastructure projects are、uh, going on in China. That、uh, shows that there was a big drop in the、uh, infrastructure infrastructure investment. 因此，根据就是三项，就是投资、进出口贸易和消费。三项合并计算，今年一月到六月份的这个 GDP 总量，实质上是下降了百分之五，而不是上升了百分之五点四。呃 ，That's why by looking at all these、uh, detailed numbers for investment, foreign trade, and、uh, consumptions uh, combined, uh, the actual GDP in China. Saw a reduction of five percent instead of an increase of five point four percent. 而中国七月份以后的情况也很糟糕，所以我们估。And things after July are nothing more promising. 呃，到今年年底，全年的 GDP 下降可能会达到百分之十左右。That's why we expect、uh, by the end of this year the total reduction of GDP would be 10 percent. So we say the economy is very bad. Income, the government of China has been experiencing a budget crisis. So on the economic front,、uh, it was not very promising. Now let's take a look at the fiscal side. They definitely have seen a crisis there. 2022年底。全中国的地方财政收入只有三个省、三个市是有盈利的，其他的都是地方财政是亏空。所以，中国的整体上讲，地方财政危机缺口很大。Uh, if you look at the number by the end of 2022, only three provinces and three municipalities.、Uh, Experienced a surplus in their、uh, finances,、um, and that's why a big problem is about to、uh, incur for a lot of local、uh, governments in terms of their fiscal numbers. 今年上半年，全国省一级的经济啊、呃、财政危机主要出现在云南和贵州。Uh, by province, the、uh, most、uh, Important or eminent、uh, crisis, fiscal crisis, occurred in Yunnan Province and Guizhou Province. 而中国的上海市、苏州市、广州，这是中国最好的经济最好的三个城市，里边的公务员的收入现在已经是下降了百分之二十到二十五。If you look at、um, the, uh. Salary、um, for、uh, government workers or employees、uh, in three of the most、uh, developed and prosperous cities, such as Shanghai, Suzhou, and Guangzhou,、um, they saw already a decrease somewhere between 20 to 25 percent. 还有些地方就是已经连续几个月不发工资，这种情况在中国内部也是发生了。
it has already happened for some local government officials、uh, not to receive their salaries for months. China's economic crisis and economic crisis a t And that's why we saw double crises、uh, in the economic front as well as the financial sector. Like these, like these situations, uh, everyone can go to. 这个优管上的中文节目当中可以去寻找到。我在时间箱那个时候，我就不能再接着讲了。大概情况是这样，就经济很糟糕。So basically, the economic situation is very bad. A lot of details can be found in a lot of Chinese programs、uh, on YouTube. 可以吧？第一个问题我就。So should I continue、uh, with the political side? You also talk about the change in the economy. Okay. Okay. So you have to talk about it. Okay. 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 没有经验，同时他们过去的专业教育知识也缺乏现代社会的，呃，复杂经济运行的相关的知识，所以中国当局到现在拿不出解决经济困境的办法。And against that kind of economic backdrop, um, we can look at the current, uh. A lineup、uh, from the CPC、uh, to deal with the economic、uh, crisis. If you look at the premier and vice premier, neither of them had、uh, relevant experiences and knowledge and expertise in dealing with economic、uh, situations and problems.、Uh, and that is also why we have not seen valid solutions coming out of the CPC and the central government. 按照中国共产党的惯例。今年应该召开二十届三中全会。中国共产党的惯例是，每一届的三中全会都是为中国的经济做出呃那个决策，但到现在还没有就是披露三中全会究竟什么时候开。所以按惯例来讲，他的三中全会应该在是九月、十月、十一月。应该召开，但到现在为止没有消息，这就说明关于这些问题到现在还没有一个明确的一个，呃，怎么讲啊？就是没有明确的思路，或者没有一个成熟的、有把握的决策，所以他就不能开会。And traditionally,、uh, this time of the year is the time when、uh, CPC host its third plenary session. Of its parliament,、uh, and that's. But we have not heard any news about this third plenary session of the year,、um, and that is a good indication that currently CPC、uh, Central Committee does not have enough、uh, confidence in coming up with uh, uh, relevant policies、uh, to deal with the economic problems、uh, China is facing right now. Otherwise,、uh, normally. Uh, between September and November, this is when the discussions and solutions are being surfaced uh, for uh, economic uh, 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 problems in the nation. 好，我第一个问题回答了，是吧 ？That's what I have for the, your first question. The second question is. Second question. We're going to limit this to just a couple of minutes. In 2022, you wrote in Foreign Affairs magazine that, as Xi's rules becomes more extreme, the backlash against him will only grow stronger. Last month, some admittedly speculative news reports suggested that Xi was facing internal criticism. What have you heard recently? Is there internal pushback against Xi Jinping? 好，那么在二零二二年的时候，您在呃《外交事务》的杂志上面曾经提到了，就是呃习的一些这些做法，自越走极端的时候，他就会呃触动了一些内斗，还有呃更强大的一些仇恨。呃，那么
呃，上个月的时候，我们已经看到有些新闻，好像说明了习正在面临严重的内部呃批评。呃，您最近有些什么听闻？呃，是不是有内部对于习近平的一些呃抵抗势力？二十大之前和二十大以后的中国共产党，实质上是两个不同的组织了。呃，嗯。We have to look at uh, uh, CPC uh, by the uh, watershed of 20th uh, CPC Central Committee. Uh, the CPC before and after are completely different. 二十大之前的中国共产党，它内部还有不同的这种所谓大家讲的派系力量的存在。二十大以后。基本上在中央高层就不存在这个所谓原来的派系了，呃，大家讲的江派、团派这些其实是不存在的。那么因此呢，他二十大以后，中共共产党党内不满的情绪依然是大量存在，但是有组织的反对活动是不存在的。Um. Before the 20th session, before the 20th uh, uh, CPC uh, Central Committee, um, there were uh, different factions, so for example, from Jiang, from different uh, uh, past leaders. However, uh, after the 20th, uh, there hasn't been any factions uh, in that regard. Uh, it is impossible to imagine uh, any organized uh, Uh, resentment or factions. 党内很多人都明白，按照习近平现在这样的治理，这个国家最终是走向灾难。但是人们没有办法去阻拦，所以大家都采取中国人的说法，就是躺平，静静的等着灾难的来临。So everyone uh, understand that we have uh, a disaster in the making um, in the horizon. However, well, under Xi's leadership, however, there is nothing uh, we can do uh, much about it, and that's why people tend to apply the modern sentiment of so-called lay flat um, strategy by doing nothing, basically. 所以在党内看不到，就是明显的有这种有组织的反对活动，呃，哪怕就婉转的表达自己的一些想法，都是遭到禁止和被严厉惩罚的。呃 ，and that's why it is impossible for you to see any opposition currently within the CCP. Uh, Let alone any very moderate uh, suggestion or different opinions,、uh, those would invite、uh, punishment and penalties. 只要习近平在台上，中国共产党就没有自我纠错的这个机会，也没有了自我纠错的能力。As long as Xi Jinping is still in office,、uh, um, CCP would. Be completely losing its ability to self-correct. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you realize this, but the person next to me is the only source where you can get insider information like this on the Chinese economy and what's going on in China. So I hope you have realized the truly unique privilege we have to hear from such. Uh, a professional inside source, and from from such、uh, an insider, an expert on the Chinese、uh, Party State. So let's give a big round of applause for Tsai Xia. Thank you. 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 We are going to have a short coffee break, roughly ten minutes, and then we're going to have our fourth panel on accountability.